Good morning, everybody. And if you left the tab open from last night, you're probably really confused right now. Hopefully, uh, I'm not talking to you and waking you up. But either way, how's everybody doing? Uh, yeah, it's early. It is early, dudes, but it's going to be a good day. That'll be a good day. So, guys, I'm still eating my breakfast. I went to Dunkin', got some food. That's why I'm a little bit, a little bit on the later side. But I've I've been up for a good while. <laughs> I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> so I'm gonna tune into the NASA feed. I'm gonna mute for a second, and we'll uh, we'll see what's good. First attempt on Monday. Uh, currently, the ocean is Seriously, a bit I'm just lit up food. I'll be right with back. showers, even a few storms. Got a little bit of lightning over warmer waters of the Gulf Stream, but uh, it's not holding together that well. The LWO says that it will push closer to us, could get some showers, but the chance of lightning is low. Of course, they will be monitoring that closely. Overall, 10% chance of lightning within five nautical miles of the pad. That is the constraint to tanking, and we are below that. The constraint, sorry, is 20%, and we are currently at 10% chance of lightning, and that's the big constraint. So that's good news. The modeling uh, that the weather officer is looking at shows a lot of showers to the north of us around the Jacksonville area. He said he expects the... Um, Right around 11 a.m., the sea breeze to start organizing, and it'll fire up some storms right over Kennedy as well, but expects as we get towards the time to launch, closer to 2 p.m., those storms should get nudged west starting about um, late morning, early afternoon. And then right at 2 p.m., we should have some storms to the west of Kennedy, um, forced to the west by the sea breeze. And that's good news, because once they form, if that uh, onshore flow keeps pushing, it uh, should push it over and uh, cause storms over in the Orlando and Tampa area, which is well to our west. The concerns and the constraints officially from the LWO are flight through precipitation, cumulus cloud rules. Those are the two ones that we are watching today when it comes to launch uh, time, the T0 at 2.17 p.m. Eastern Time. So for that window, we've got a two-hour window to launch that runs to 4.17 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, the probability of go is 60% in the early part of the window and then improves to 80% in the second hour of the window. Nine five, bro. Why are you live at six a.m.? Tanking, dude. The backup day is on Monday. The probability of violation is thirty percent, meaning seventy percent go. And then Tuesday, if the team doesn't get started with tanking and there's a weather delay, should it come to Tuesday, it would be a uh, fifty to sixty percent go with a concern about cumulus electric field, anvil cloud for both, and this is because of the later T0 time for both of those. Winds are not a factor, just about 8 to 12 knots, well below the constraint for today, and winds aloft, fairly weak as well, which is expected for this time of year according to the LWO. Let's review what happened since our last launch attempt five days ago on August 29th. Launch teams have updated procedures, practice operations, and refined their timelines. Exploration ground systems technicians fixed a leak on the tail service mast umbilical by replacing a flex hose and a loose pressure sensor line, which is likely the source of the leak. They also tighten bolts surrounding the enclosure to ensure a tight seal so that when super cold propellants run through the lines, they hold that seal. And you're looking at the, the engine section of the Space Launch System, the four RS-25s in the center, the two solid rocket boosters to either side. 
The launch team will use different procedures to chill down the RS-25 engines that you're looking at today. Part of that is the kickstart bleed test, which they will test earlier in the countdown during the liquid hydrogen fast fill phase for the core stage that's expected to be around 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern. And of course, we'll track that for you. This will allow additional time to cool the engines to the appropriate temperatures for launch. It will use more propellant, but the launch director says she has enough margin to get through today's two-hour window. This is the first integrated test of NASA's Space Launch System and Orion. Shot right there, that is the inner tank umbilical, which carries the liquid hydrogen vent line and the gaseous nitrogen supply, which that is important and is in use right now, pumping into the, vi into the vehicle, clearing out any cavities prior to cryo-loading. The Space Launch System in Orion at the top is the first human-rated spacecraft to go beyond the moon in 50 years. And we're excited to get started. And so we'll track tanking. You'll hear me come on when uh, mission milestones are reached or if there's any problem, we'll talk you through it. Previously, there's been a fair amount of work for the team getting ready for this moment. Launch controllers have powered on the different rocket systems and spacecraft systems. And that's a lot because as you can see here, this is one big rocket. 322 feet tall. This is the Block 1B Space Launch System. The mobile launch tower then rises another 20 feet or so beyond that. The total height from the ground, including um, the mobile launch tower, the rocket, the launch tower itself, 370 feet tall total height, well above the Statue of Liberty in New York City. You see across the bottom, we have four major milestones to tanking. The preparation, core stage LOX loading, core stage LH2 loading, and ICPS tanking. Um, fellas, that's actually incorrectly labeled. This is not a Block 1B spacecraft. That's the Block 1 version of SLS. Um, the Block 1B has a much bigger upper stage. Um, just not trying to be a jerk. That's that's not a Block 1B. That's a Block 1 spacecraft. This is the first SLS. You don't start with one. You don't start with the B variant on the first attempt or the first test, right? At various times, it's the like playing the B side of a, of a cassette tape first. Various, uh, and I looking just at dated myself again. And I may pause to uh, I'm gonna catch finish my sandwich. some of that uh, discussion and then pass it right along. So let's get started. We're currently at T minus six hours, 40 minutes and holding. This is Artemis Launch Control. I'll go, the 1B is not actually more efficient. It's much bigger. Well, actually relatively similar efficiency, but with a much bigger stage. The Block 1B variant has the exploration upper stage, which is being worked on right now. NASA will roll it out probably after a couple of launches of this thing. received a go for core stage loading operations. Okay. Again, we are go for core stage cryo loading operations. No, NASA has plan holds built into their count schooners. So uh, actually they're, they're yeah, it's, it's at six, minus 640. Um, that counter should actually tick down. It should start ticking down. Two hours for fueling. You have to fuel liquid hydrogen slow. Guys, y yeah, you have to. Um, it'll leak if you try to flow it too fast, too quickly.
If you think about it, it's more efficient because for the same number of rockets, one, you get more performance. Uh, the, I, I suppose someone, but when, when somebody asks me if is, is an upper stage more efficient, I'm basically determining the impulse. I go by impulse. So specifically, uh, the specific impulse of the engines. This upper stage has an RL-10B2 uh, expander cycle engine on the ICPS, which is a Delta IV derived upper stage. Uh, and the EUS also has RL-10s, but they are RL-10C11s. Uh, or RL-10CXs. I'm not exactly sure the variant just yet, because uh, it hasn't been made yet. Um, RL-10Cs can make very pretty much the same efficiency as an RL-10B2. Talking about 460 second specific impulse. So you're actually, like on paper, the efficiency is very similar. Because they use the same engine. The bigger stage just uses more of them. Next step in the timeline is the core stage locks transfer line chill down at 6.02 a.m. Eastern. Countdown resumes at 7.07 a.m. per the timeline. They figure out what was wrong, guys. Yeah, the, um, hang on, hang on I need coffee. I'm good, Iron. I need coffee. <laughs> So, when they went to launch on Monday, um, there was a off nominal reading. So, a slightly off nominal reading from one of the sensors that is used to um, what NASA calls bleed the engines. Now, what, what is bleeding an engine? What does that mean? Well, the propellants that NASA is dealing with here, liquid oxygen, which is pretty standard. That's pretty industry standard for an orbital class rocket. And... But, but NASA's using liquid hydrogen with it, uh, similar to the space shuttle. Space shuttle use similar propellants. Um, that liquid hydrogen is very uh, annoying to deal with. Um, you have to be very careful. Liquid oxygen transfer line is now in chill down. Okay. The liquid oxygen locks transfer line. Transfer line. We should start to see ice accumulating down. around the two locks down comers right here. Actually, not, not just yet. It should be around the tail service mast umbilical, but basically they're filling up the fuel lines to be able to fill up the, fill up the rocket with propellants. Um, liquid oxygen chill down is not that big of a deal. Liquid oxygen is fairly easy to we deal with are for a cryogenic. To with core stage loading operations. This is not a test, Sesh. No, this is not a test. This one's going to the moon, man. It's an uncrewed flight test. Go there's, for liquid oxygen core stage operations. Again, there's nobody aboard. Go for liquid oxygen loading. But she's going the to the stage. moon. Oh yeah, dude, this is this is not a test. I mean, it it is a it, it is a test to be fair. It's a test flight. This is the final exam for this rocket to make sure that we could put people on this thing to get them out to the moon. This one is going to the moon, but this this. This test is on par with like the early Apollo missions. It is it is a ballsy test. That's a lot of stuff. That rocket's pretty damn complicated. It's a lot of stuff to test. But anyway, I was talking about hydrogen propellants. Hydrogen is a pain in the butt to deal with. The reason why it's a pain in the butt to deal with is because it's small. It's very very small. Hydrogen atoms are tiny. They're very small. Look at the look at the periodic table. Hydrogen's way up at the top. It is a very 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 small atom and it's very simple. It's not, it's not a lot of electrons, protons, and neutrons in there, to be very simple. So hydrogen will be fine if it's a liquid. But if there's any inkling of that liquid wanting to become a gas, then you got a problem. Hydrogen really likes to evaporate. It really likes to evaporate. Now, why does it like to evaporate so much? What? What, what, do, what, do, what do you mean? Uh... Hydrogen exists as a liquid down here on the surface. I mean, hydrogen. when you think hydrogen, you think gas, mostly. But hydrogen can be a liquid. It even could be solid. But <laughs> the gap where hydrogen exists as a liquid is maybe 5 to 15 Kelvin. Um, now, that probably didn't mean a lot to anybody. Uh, minus 271C. Yeah. Or, or minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. It, it is really really freaking cold <laughs> like really cold um and if you're trying to put it through a pipe even in florida down in florida where it's even in the middle of the night it's like 20 25 c 
right? So we're talking about a 271 to 25C differential here. That is a huge, that's a, that's, it's a 250 degree diff difference right there. Or if you're, if for the Fahrenheit viewers, that's a 400 degree difference. <laughs> Cause it's like 70 degrees in Florida minus 420 degrees. So it's actually more than that. So it's like, it's like 450 degree difference. We're talking a big deal. Uh, Kelvin, it's like a 500 Kelvin difference. So if you're trying to flow that liquid hydrogen through these pipes, not those ones, that that's a hydrogen, that's a gaseous hydrogen vent line with a nitrogen commodity line on top of it. But that's another story. Um, if you're trying to flow hydrogen through the pipes, right? The, the, the pipes are warm and the hydrogen will evaporate. And when it evaporates, it'll leak. And when it leaks, well, if anybody's, I mean, to be very, very candid, if anybody's familiar with the Hindenburg, yeah, you don't want this thing to Hindenburg itself. So you got to be very careful with these propellants. This is why I'm here at six in the morning. And this thing isn't launching for another, for another eight hours. I'm here at six in the morning because I want to track every bit of this thing. This is a big deal. This is a big launch. In the, in the history books, this is on par with Apollo 4, Apollo 6, and Apollo 8. It's like if they flew Apollo 4 on Apollo 8's trajectory with no crew aboard. This is a big, big mission. It's a 37-day flight, and it's inside of that fairing right there. There's an Orion capsule, which is basically like Apollo capsule version 2. It, th this, is, this is nuts. We're going back to the moon. They're going to moonshot today. You know, God willing, we're going to moonshot today. That's a big deal. It's noon, you know that. Screw you and your fake time zones. I've never been to Europe, so it doesn't count. That's how that works, right? Why? It's not 37 hours, Mark. It's 37 days. It's going to be up there for a month and a half. The reason why is they're going to... This capsule... The Orion capsule is designed for deep space travel. It is designed to stay up there. What I like to tell people is that Orion is a satellite that people can be on board it's half satellite, half capsule. Now the Apollo capsule had fuel cells on board. So the Apollo capsule could go up there and it could, it could sustain life for, Discovery. I don't know, like maybe three weeks. Actually, probably less than that. It's three days out, three days on the moon, three days back, maybe a week and a half, something like that. The fuel cells didn't last very long. Orion has solar panels on its, on its service module. So Orion can stay up there for a much longer period of time. The Orion capsule is literally, it, it's a deep space capsule. It's designed to operate outside of low Earth orbit. That's really where it's supposed to go. Um, hey, Thrawn, 46 months. Basically like the ISS or Space Lab, but orbiting the moon. Yeah, it's, the, Orion is a little bit smaller than the ISS, but that's the idea. Uh, Orion is like, okay, all right. I'll use my truck analogy because everybody, everybody knows trucks, I think, to an extent. So the space shuttle, right? Shuttle is a space semi truck, okay? So the space shuttle is akin to like a semi truck, lorry, ute, whatever you want to call it. You know, 18 wheeler, like big rig, right? That's what the space shuttle is. If the space shuttle is a semi truck, in Europe, you guys, I think you'd call it a caravan. Uh, but that's what the Orion capsule is supposed to do. It is basically a longer distance capsule. And, you know, NASA describes Dragon and Starliner, the two capsules, the commercial crew capsules that go to the ISS, those are taxis. If those are taxis and the space shuttle is a semi truck, that's what this is. It's a camper van or a caravan if, if you're in Europe. Because, yeah, you guys call everything differently. Now, nah, I'm not trying to start that. I'm just, just, just. Just being a little funny. It's a little early for me, okay? You're going to have to excuse me. Can they hurry up so I can go to bed? We're eight hours out, Harvest. Get some sleep, dude. That's a camper, a caravan you tow. Oh, so you guys actually call it something normal for a change. I'm just, kid I'm just, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm in a good mood because we're going to the moon today, okay? Just kidding. Kidding. You are not excused. Well, screw you and your stupid names then. <laughs> What are we waiting for? They gotta fuel it up, Heinrich. Yep. Mm -hmm. Lock slow fill per timeline in 50 minutes. Sweet. It's it's early. It's early over here. Hey, yo, that's a host from Sim. 
What's up, dude? Hey, uh, how we looking uh, with the front? How we looking, man? I bet you can't get any sleep, dude. So if something bad happens on the launch pad and the rocket goes boom, how screwed would the area around it be? Um, Quack, there is around pad 39... And I actually have to explain what happened with the with the sensors. They had an off nominal sensor reading on one of the engines, but it's a developmental sensor, so it's not that big of a deal. Engine three was not being a pain, pain in the butt. <clears throat> it was a sensor on engine three that's not usually supposed to be there. But okay, so this is Complex Thirty Nine, Launch Complex Thirty Nine or LC Thirty Nine has two pads: Thirty Nine A, which SpaceX is using right now, and Thirty Nine B. You see these big kind of mounds that are around that? Like, they basically planed out a huge area around the pad, and they cut all the underbrush out when during the Apollo program. Let me put it to you like this. That's called the Blast Detonation Area, or BDA. Um, there's a good reason why that's called the Blast Detonation Area. It would... It w yeah, it would... Ooh. Anyway, Sim, how you doing, buddy? Thank you for the host, man. We're just teeing up for a moon launch here. We're, we're about eight hours out, but I don't want to miss any part of it. So yeah, blast detonation area. Whack. Yeah. Big boom. Uh, if it... If something goes wrong in that unlikely scenario, you're going to see something pop, like, on the scale of, like, a low-yield nuclear blast. This, these rockets carry a ton of energy. Um, especially ones to go to the moon. You need a lot of energy to do that. We're talking, like, atomic blast levels of energy. Um, it's, it's a lot. Will the Artemis rocket be used to launch the successor to James Webb? Louvor? Vorpal? It could, yeah. No labor yet, we're still in hurry up and wait mode per labor doldrums. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Sim, good luck, man. Godspeed. I'm, I'm serious about that. It's serious business. Good for you, though, man. Thank you very much for the host. Loads of Delta V. Yes, Loco, exactly. Mm -hmm. Change in velocity. But keep in mind, there's energy expended, and then there's Delta V. Those are not correlated. I mean, they're, they're correlative, but they're not the same thing. Okay? So you need a certain amount of energy to get to the moon. But depending on how you get there and your transfer time, you could use a lower energy burn. And that lower energy burn can, doesn't cost as much Delta V. But at the end of the at the end of the day, your total change of velocity if you go out to the moon will always be a certain number. It depends on how you get there. And if you use a lower energy transfer or transfer, right? This is orbital mechanics now. If I'm if I'm speaking Japanese, just tell me. Uh, if you use a lower energy transfer to get out to the moon, you're using less delta v. But that doesn't mean your total change of velocity is different because you still wind up at the moon. You still need to go a certain speed to get to the moon. Some rockets will use the sun to pull them out to the moon. Like we watched Falcon 9 a little earlier this this month launching the KPLO mission, the Korean Polar Lunar Orbiter. Uh, and the KPLO lander doesn't have enough Delta V to like get out to the moon on a high energy transfer and circularize. So what they did was SpaceX shot that lander literally into the sun. It, not into the sun, it didn't go near it. They shot it out past the moon, like way past the moon, and the sun's pulling it, the sun is pulling it towards the moon. It, and then when the moon kind of rotates around into the right spot, you know, if they shot it towards the sun, the moon's going to rotate around and then the moon will pull it back in. That's a low energy transfer. It doesn't take a lot of Delta V to do that, but you still wind up at the moon. Pretty crazy, right? You're talking Klingon? Kiplach! Also, Ohio, gozaimasu! That Daryl Nail dude sounds just like EJ. <laughs> Someone had the bad taste to compare the energy potential of the rocket if it exploded to a low-yield nuclear blast. It's true. You're speaking Martian? Yeah, probably. Is Bill Shatner on this flight? No. <laughs> Daryl Nail is NASA's, um, is Kennedy Space Center's uh, public, he's a Kennedy Space Center public affairs officer. He's, he's pretty good, man. He's pretty good. And he looks like Clark Kent. So, public affairs officer, reporter. Pretty sure the guy's Superman. 
I was there to watch the launch of the Korean move probe and learn the trajectory mechanic. It's pretty crazy, Loco, right? It's pretty crazy. <laughs> Creeper, what's going on? When I almost broke a few windows in my house, I don't want to... Eh, Gully, it would be one heck of a blast, but I'd prefer... Like, okay. Alright, fellas. Let's reduce this to its base element here for a second. Here's my, th here's my theory about rockets. Anybody can look at a rocket and tell it's going wrong. You know why? Like, it's really easy to spot. Because when a rocket isn't going... The mission isn't going correctly. You're, you're gonna get an explosion, right? Now, don't get me wrong. When the mission's going right, you also get an explosion. The difference between a good mission and a bad mission is the explosion going in one direction. If the explosion is going down and the rocket's going up, you're good. You're good. Everything's fine. If the rocket is exploding in more than one direction, so up, down, left, right, then you got a big problem. Usually. Usually you got a big problem. Unless you intended it to do that. I really don't want that to do this today. I would really like one explosion going downwards because that's all rocket engines do. I like to call rocket engines explosion factories. That's all they do. They combust a fuel and an oxidizer, somewhat analogous to a car engine in a combustion chamber, but instead of using that explosion to push a piston down like on a car motor, they just shoot the gases out of Venturi, the nozzle in the throat. It's called a convergent divergent design, that hourglass thing that you see down at the bottom of the rocket like the four engines and the two SRBs. All it is is an explosion. It's forcing an explosion through a funnel. That's it. That's all it is. Now, I say that's all it is, like rocket science is some easy thing, easy thing, right? The thing about rocket science is that rocket science is really easy to understand. It's really easy to understand. I can teach rocket science to anybody. I've, I've been doing it here for years. The thing about rocket science is that it's hard to do. It's really easy to understand, though. It's really not too bad. Uh, like, take it from me. Look at me. I'm an idiot. I understood it. It kind of depends on the expansion ratio of the engine, too. If it's really underexpanded, the explosion will go a bit sideways. Get out of here. External combustion engine? It's not an external combustion engine, Tipsy. Rockets are internal combustion engines, but, like, uh, but that's on a technicality. I wouldn't call a rocket an, like... If I was explaining it to people, I wouldn't call it an internal combustion engine. But rockets have a combustion chamber, just like a car does. Only we don't have valves like a car does. There's just a fuel injector and an oxidizer injector, and that's it. It's, it's, it's like a car engine, but way simpler. But also, it's way more complicated. Because trying to control an explosion with the kind of energy that you need to get like up into space is a little bit more complicated than shooting air and air and gasoline at a piston and making it go up and down it's a directional combustion chamber bingo <laughs> yeah RC there you go it's cool to watch you during the day for once right on so when are we going to LS swap SLS <laughs> forget LS swapping SLS I, I, I would take the space shuttles high pressure fuel turbo pumps and put that on a car can we use that? We'll use that. That that would be much. That's much more powerful than than an LS engine. RD zero one twenty swap SLS. I don't think they're powerful enough, Thomas. To be honest with you, it's a jet engine without the intake and compression section after the combustion section. Yep, yep. It's basically just the combustor, no turbine. <laughs> Raptor swap it. Now we're talking. Raptor two swap SLS. Okay, guys. A wankle engine swap it? That would be the best noise ever for it, pal. Wang, 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 wang. <laughs> now, okay. Fellas, here, how about we do this? How about we take something like SN5? SN5, shorten it up a little bit, one vector upper stage, and put that on SLS instead. Got a nine meter, nine meter upper stage. Does, doesn't need to be SN5 big, right? Doesn't need to be that big. You can make it a little bit smaller. You probably half that. Like, think like uh, Tank 7.1, if you're familiar with Starship. The test tanks. The small, small one. Take one of those, put a Vactor on it, put a Vacuum Raptor 2 on it, and then put that on top of this thing. And then put the fairing on top of that. And then put a 9 meter, put a 9 meter fairing on top of that. Then we got a hangry launch vehicle, you know what I'm saying? We got a hangry launch vehicle. It'd be hangry. It wants to, it wants to eat the moon. 
What's the T minus? Uh, we're in a planned six six hour forty minute hold here. They are chilling down the fuel lines to the vehicle now. Yeah, Devlin, that would that, that would be freaking sweet. What's the stupidest possible thing you would launch into space if you had this rocket? School bus. School bus. Have you heard of liquid piston engines? Those things are insanely cool. I actually haven't someone. I, I've heard of the concept, but I'm not too familiar with it. Yeah, why would we waste a good launch on that guy, Spider? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. School bus. Think, think, it, it, dude, the magic school bus in space. Think, think, think of that. You know, the Tesla Roadster in space was cool. That was hilarious. That made, that really made me laugh. That was awesome. But also, Magic School Bus. Or a space ball. Yeah, Eagle 5. Yep, I'd, I'd take that also, Devlin. Yep, yep. Guys, the launch is scheduled for about two... It's 2... Seven, not about. It is... It is inst, Well, not an instantaneous. They're targeting 2.17 p.m. Eastern Time. That is... That's eight hours from right now, literally. Eight hours from now, that thing is going to light. You know, best case scenario. I go for SN5 on top with an SLS core and four Falcon 9s instead of the SRBs. Yeah. W, that's, that's good, right? But if you put four Falcon 9s on the side of this core here, you're changing the launch pad now. And we all know, we all know how fun that is. Good idea. It'd be cool to see four Falcon 9s separate and then come back down and land four, four fold next to each other. I'm not going to say that I don't want that. That would be really sweet. A DeLorean? Even better. The stainless steel construction is great for flex dispersal. You think it'll go past 88 miles an hour? I think, I think, it'll, I think it'll go past 88 miles an hour. I think we'll be good. What's the weather odds? We're at 20% probability of violation, Forlorn. Um, a warm front is moving across the northern bit of Florida right now. Um, and it is ex that warm front is expanding. And it's creating a trough over central Florida. And that trough is pulling in air from the ocean. And some of that, some of the air that's coming in from the ocean does have some scattered thunderstorms. That, I mean, it's Florida. It's Florida in late summer. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. You, 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 can, you can think it's not going to rain, but it'll rain. But the thing is, is that anybody that lives in Florida knows it doesn't rain until like 2, 3 o'clock. Or not, it's actually more like 3, 4 o'clock, maybe in, even into 5 o'clock, depending on where you are. The launch window is 217. The, or the, the window is targeting 2, the, the, the launch is targeting 217 p.m. So that's literally before the afternoon showers that Florida gets all the time in the summertime. I lived in Florida for two, for two years. In Portland, I know you know this, but I lived in Florida for two years. I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> maybe when I have a, maybe when I'm a little more awake, Saltiva. <laughs> Oh, the level of operational complexity with four Falcon cores at the same time. Devlin, I, I, I've, like, I've entertained the idea in my head before of, like, what it would take to take four, put four Falcon 9 cores on this thing instead of two SRBs. And let me tell you, the mechanics of that gets really, really, really complicated, like you said, really, really fast. First of all, they wouldn't be Falcon Heavy side boosters. You couldn't do it. They're not, the Falcon Heavy side boosters can't hold the load. They would have to be Falcon Heavy center cores. You would need ha you would need to have four center cores because they're uprated, because those Falcon Heavy center cores are designed to have those two boosters on the side, so they're designed to carry load. You you you'd need four Falcon Heavy center cores to hold SLS's tanks up. Uh, at, yeah, or else you, you, it won't it won't stand. The SLS core stage when you fill it would crush a Falcon Nine side booster, like like hydraulic press style. It's not it's not strong enough. See last for very brief description of a liquid piston engine. Oh, that thing. Yeah, I've seen that thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The kidney bean that moves around. The mechanics on Falcon Heavy are insane alone. Yeah, Devlin. Yeah, I have to tell people about those compression bridges on the launch, on the, um, the um, reaction frame. And how Falcon Heavy basically destroys those things every time it launches. <laughs> what is the Eastern Standard Time launch window? Well, gee, we're in daylight time over here in the U.S. right now. So it's 2.17 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 
We are about seven hours and fifty seven hours and fifty eight minutes. Or no. Yeah, seven hours, uh, no, not 58. It'd be seven hour, 55 minutes from right now. So eight hours from right now, basically. No, Jeb's in, Jeb's in OPF 3W with the Starliner capsule. 217 to 417 Eastern is the launch today. Yep, yep. Why does the timer stop? So Tander, they are in a planned hold right now. What is a planned hold? Well, it's rocket science. It's complicated. No, sometimes... Sometimes you're, sometimes you're going to run into steps that might take longer. So, for instance, um, on Monday when they went to fuel this bad boy up, they, uh, there was a thunderstorm that came through real quick and they delayed fueling operations by an hour. NASA leaves built-in blocks of time, of nominal time in the countdown, and that's why we have planned holds, just in case something like that happens. It's basically, it's basically just a contingency. It's a contingency thing, because sometimes steps take longer than usual. Like, uh, like fueling, for instance. They delayed fueling by an hour, but SLS was still able to target the 8.33 launch time on Monday. It just ended up not doing it, because they had a bad sensor... On the on engine number three, serial number two zero two zero five eight, they had a bad developmental sensor on that engine, uh, and it was giving them a bad reading. And they had a slight differential reading on chill down of the rocket engines when they went to bleed them. Basically, get that get all the gaseous hydrogen and gaseous oxygen out of the engines. Basically, it, it, bleeding an engine is basically priming it. Anybody if anybody's ever operated a lawnmower before, you know, you have to prime the you have to prime the carburetor bowls. You have to hit that little button on the side. You got to push the little yellow button to load it. it. That that's what engine bleed is. Uh, they basically had a bad sensor reading on the chill down procedure for one of the engines for engine number 3. Uh, and they determined they determined with the telemetry with the basically the computers on the SLS basically dump into a log file uh, and they determined by going and combing through that log file that the sensor was actually junk actually you, to be honest with you this is just a gut thing I don't think the sensor is bad at all I think the connection to the sensor is bad um, because the sensor was giving them a good reading until they got to about like minus 200 C and then it the reading started to fall off that sounds like it's not plugged in all the way <laughs> that's just a that's just a theory though. I can't prove that. That's just it that's what that sounds like. But it could be anything. Sensor could be in could sensor could be calibrated improperly, but NASA basically proved that the sensor is bad. They know with the numbers, not beyond a reasonable doubt, they know. They know that the sensor is not giving them the right reading. So it's important to understand that behavior and take it into account. Now, little word on that sensor on engine three. It's what's called a DFI sensor, a developmental flight instrumentation sensor. Long story short, that sensor won't be there on operational SLS missions. It won't be there. Uh, that is, that sensor is a test flight sensor. That's what DFI means. Developmental flight instrumentation basically means it's a test flight sensor. It's only going to be there for. It's only there for this mission. Um, they have the OFI sensor basically kind of right next to it, and the OFI sensor is an operational flight instrumentation sensor. Those are, those are the ones that are going to be on future SLS cores. The OFI sensors, two things on DFI versus OFI. The DFI sensor is not connected into the main avionics. It's not connected into the flight computers for the rocket. It is connected to basically the black box of the vehicle, which it's, it's connected to a flight data recorder. Uh, um, actually, it might not even be it not, might not even be attached to a flight data recorder. It could be attached to an antenna on the vehicle. And rockets actually downlink an insane amount of data in the eight-minute ascent and then subsequent mission after that. Uh, they Think about, like, okay, so for networking guys, think about the bandwidth. They're, they're offloading terabytes of data, of telemetry, of numbers, of how all these, all these sensor readings over time, they're offloading terabytes of data in the eight-minute ascent profile. It is, it's, it's ridiculous. There's an insane amount of data that gets downloaded in that time. Uh, either that or it's going to a, a basically a, a flight recorder on the Orion capsule, with a black box. 
So the DFI sensor is not actually connected into the engine avionics. It's not, it's not connected to it. You don't need the DFI sensor to fly. The OFI sensor is the one that is connected into the flight avionics. And that one, during Monday's launch attempt, was reading correctly. It's the DFI sensor that was not reading correctly. So NASA basically used other means to prove that that sensor is not reading correctly. But whenever you get an off nominal reading like that, you don't say, hmm, maybe the sensor's bad, let's launch it. They've tried that in the past, usually ends poorly. You don't just send it with a rocket like this. You, re you really wanna make sure that you don't do that. That's called go fever. And it, 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 you lose rockets and potentially people if you're not careful. Um, so NASA determined with the telemetry that that DFI, the DFI sensor is no good. And that is observed behavior. They understand the behavior. They understand what the vehicle is doing. And they understand that all four engines were able to be primed successfully, even in Monday's test. They could have launched. They could have launched on Monday. It would have worked. It, the engines would have worked just fine. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have had to worry about hard starting the engine. It would have worked just fine. But they didn't know that at the time. <laughs> and this is, the, this is the pesky thing about rocket science. It seems very simple in hindsight. But once you proved that that sensor was bad, now you know. Now you know it's bad. It's the sensor on this back engine that's behind this one right here. Serial number 2058. Flew on the shuttle six times, which is pretty cool. Uh, hey, back alley. Good morning. You get any sleep, buddy? Upon engine firing, will there be sparks underneath it like the shuttle? Absolutely. Ble yeah. Ble mm -hmm. They use their... They use... They use igniters down there. And I say igniters, but they don't actually ignite the engine. The shuttle engines, the, the RS-25s and the subsequent shuttle engines are started up basically by shooting compressed gas. They shoot helium into the turbo pumps to get them spinning. And then th once they start spinning, then you start pumping fuel and then they ignite it. Uh, so basically the equivalent of cranking an engine over and then the engine started like like that. They do that with rocket engines. Um, those sparkers, despite being called an igniter, are, are the slang term for them is a rofi, but they're not actually a rofi. Uh, a radial outward firing igniter. Um, it's not a rofi. It, it is just a... Uh, uh, and it, it's just a it's called a hydrogen purge igniter if you really want to know um, long story short because they're cranking the engines for a second there's a split second with the shuttle motors where you're shooting atomized fuel out the bottom um, what's atomized fuel atomized fuel is fuel that is chemically combined with oxidizer um, Every combustion engine atomizes fuel. Every single one of them. Um, if you want to know what kind of like what that looks like, there's a Smarter Every Day video on YouTube. Uh, Destin over at Smarter Every Day. His video about carburetors. It, when he made that see through, he made a see through carburetor, and you can literally see the fuel get atomized. A rocket engine does that, but it does it with two liquids instead of instead of a liquid and a gas like a carburetor. Carburetor uses the atmosphere. The rockets can't use the atmosphere because they fly out of the atmosphere. So you got to bring the oxygen with you. It's a fancy Bunsen burner, kind of. JSDN, when is the rocket launching? We are about 7 hour and 45 out. 7 hour 45 from now. 2.17 uh, p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So how do you know so much about the sensors and how the rocket works? Laurie, I get asked that a lot. Um... I'm self-taught when it comes to this stuff, but I also sit and listen to literally every NASA press conference. Uh, they, they, NASA told me, long story short, um, I listen to every conference, I listen to everything that every SLS engineer has to say uh, in the press, uh, and that sometimes those explanations can be a little bit lengthy. This is how I spend my time. I'm basically a big geek, yeah, possibly even a dork. Borderline weirdo. I, this is how I spend my days. I love reading about rockets. I love talking about them. I love communicating it. It's my favorite thing to do. So you're staying up. Are you going to stay up to the launch? Absolutely, JSTN. I'm going to be here for the duration. I'm here until it launches, and I'm going to be here even after that. It's about, I don't know, it's going to be about an 11, 12-hour stream today. 
Uh, I'm going all the way until NASA tries to moonshot that ICPS. See this stage right here? This, this white part right here. That's the upper stage for SLS. That's the one that's going to get them out to the moon. I'm not missing a NASA moonshot. I've never seen one before. I've only read about them and I've only seen footage from 50 years ago of moonshots. This is the first time NASA is going to shoot something human rated potentially out to the moon in 50 years. This is a big deal. I'm here for the duration. Aren't you sleepy? No, oh, I got plenty of sleep, dude. I'm good. <laughs> Tech, trust me. Yeah, I've never seen that, man. I've never seen that before. How many? How much time daily do you spend reading about space things? Eight hours, ten hours? Uh. Yeah, back alley. It's not as much as it as I used to, to be honest with you. But it still is a lot. Like, it's not eight or ten hours, dude. I'm usually here talking to you guys, and keep in mind that. Ali, every stream that I do, literally every stream that I do, I learn something new about rockets. Every single stream. I'm a firm believer in that if you stop learning, if you stop challenging yourself and you stop learning, you're going to basically stagnate. You're either getting smarter or you're not. There's no third direction. You don't push. So you always got to stay hungry. You always got to stay feisty for it. You always got to want to learn. There is no single person that knows everything about that launch vehicle. There's no single person. So even the guys at NASA, like sometimes you ask astronauts about a specific system on the vehicle, they'll be like, I don't know. That's not my job. I'm just, I, I fly the damn thing. You know what I mean? Does a pilot know every nut and bolt on an airplane? No. The point is, is that you always should be learning. And Ali, I've been doing this for a decade. I started streaming in December of 2012. I'm old in Twitch years. I'm old in internet years. Like, I've been doing this professionally since September of 2015. So, literally got seven years under my belt of doing this as my job. Uh, in 12, in 10 years total, 2012, so 10 years total streaming. I've, every stream I learned something new about rockets. I've been streaming five, six days a week for seven years. <laughs> I know my stuff. <laughs> and I still, that dude, I still read about rockets off stream. I'm still learning. You gotta keep doing that. Hey, Snowy, 9137. Love the passion. Thanks, Armchair. It, this is my stuff, dude. I love it. It's so freaking cool. Where in that graphic is the ridiculous cost of the ULA monstrosity? Um, this isn't ULA. ULA only made the upper stage, Mad Dog. Lockheed made the capsule. Northrop Grumman made the launch abort system. Boeing made the core stage. And Northrop Grumman, Northrop Grumman made the, the side boosters. And Aerojet Rocketdyne made the engines. The, the shuttle engines. I discovered Twitch during the lockdown and now I'm addicted. Yeah, JSTN. I, Twitch does that, dude. <laughs> it's fun. It's a fun website, dude. I'm happy that Twitch is, you know, giving me the venue to do what I do here. Any word on the countdown restart? So, Draco, they're in a planned hold right now. Um, that's not a problem. Everything's fine. Uh, it's just a planned hold while they basically prime the fuel lines. They're filling the fuel lines that go to the vehicle up with cryogenics. Now, it, that's, not just, not, that's not just as simple as just, okay, turn, the, turn it on, prime the fuel lines. They got to do it slowly. They got to do it slowly to make sure that you don't get geysering in the lines or or leaks. Now I know what you're saying. What are you tell? What are you saying? NASA can't make a line that doesn't leak. Eh, it's not NASA that can't do that. Physics kind of doesn't want you to. The propellants that they're using are liquid oxygen. The liquid oxygen oxidizer is liquid at minus two ninety three F, and the hydrogen that they're using is a liquid at minus four hundred and twenty. <laughs> nice uh fahrenheit so that that is basically somewhere what is it like minus 100 c for liquid oxygen it's somewhere around there and minus 270 c for the hydrogen we're talking like maybe 100 kelvin maybe i i the kelvin i'm bad at the conversion off the top of my head 100 k for the for the liquid oxygen and like 5 k for for the uh for the hydrogen they can't just fill the lines up What's going to happen is the, the propellants can evaporate in the line. They have to thermally condition the lines. They have to fill it slowly. 
because if you fill it up fast, gas accumulates in the line. So um, if you do it too fast with the hydrogen, basically you'll flash freeze the line and hydrogen will end up leaking out of the line all over the place. That's just physics. You can't, you can't really get around that when we're talking about a 400 degree Fahrenheit temperature differential or a 270 degree temperature differential. You know, and that's comparing to like 0C or 32F, right? There, there is a huge, that's a huge delta of, of temperature change. That's a lot, that's a lot of, that's, that's really freaking cold. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, so when you go to prime those lines, you have to do it slow. So with the hydrogen, if it evaporates, it'll leak everywhere. With the liquid oxygen, the oxygen will also evaporate, but see, the oxygen won't leak. The reason why the oxygen won't leak and the hydrogen will is that gaseous hydrogen atoms or, or molecules, I guess, they're really, really small. They're really tiny. They'll leak out of everything, like, like a sieve. It would be like making a boat hull out of a sponge. Doesn't work, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> physics, physics do be like that is what I'm trying to tell you. The liquid oxygen is big enough that it won't leak, but you'll, you'll overpress the line. And that's what geysering is. You'll overpressurize the line and eventually that gas, if you fill it up, if you try to do it too quickly, that gas has got to go somewhere. And it basically turns into a LOX geyser because that means, you know, the gas is pushing up against the hydraulic, uh, pushing, up, pushing up against the, the, the liquid oxygen. And the liquid oxygen is incompressible because it's a liquid, right? It's, like, it's actually technically slightly compressible, slightly, but liquids don't compress, gases do, right? So now you have gas and liquid pressurized inside of that line. The gas will overpress the line and it'll pop and you get a huge geyser. So the reason why they fill the lock slowly is, is called anti-geysering. You, don't, you, don't, you do not want that. <laughs> that is very bad. I mean, a lock's geyser would be kind of funny, but you also, yeah, also I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that liquid oxygen leaking out all over the pad is probably something NASA doesn't want. It will circle the Earth several times before the moon. So, Brenda, yeah, it, it will. Uh, they're going to do one orbit around and then go for TLI. Uh, SLS is going to shoot the Orion capsule and the ICPS upper stage into a... Okay, here come your unit conversions. NASA said it's going to be a 1,000 nautical mile by 20 nautical mile orbit. So, basically, it's a big... Uh, it's a very elliptical orbit. It's a very um, oval-shaped orbit with the highest point at 1,000 nautical miles. Um, so 1,000 nautical miles is about um, 1,100 statute miles, so, right, so like American miles, uh, and that's 1,650, 1,700 kilometers for the, for the Euro guys uh, and the rest of the world. You get what I'm trying to say. Hey, I did the conversion for you, okay? Give me a break, man. That's hard to do off the top of your head. <laughs> so SLS is going to shoot this thing into a very high orbit. It's going to get out to that 1,000 nautical miles or 1,100 statute miles or 1,600 kilometers. And it's going to circularize out there. So it's basically going to boost the, the lowest part of the orbit up into a nice circular orbit in what's called MEO, medium Earth orbit, at 1,600 km by 1,600 km thousand by a thousand and then once they get in the right phasing basically the moon is in the right spot they'll shoot for the moon with a burn called translunar injection tli nasa has done tlis in the past there were seven of them actually eight eight of them so apollo 8 apollo 10 apollo 11 apollo 12 apollo 13 apollo 14 apollo 15 apollo 16 uh, apollo 17 so there were nine tlis in the past uh, during the Apollo program. This is the first translunar injection burn with a human-rated spacecraft that NASA has is going to do since December of 1972 on the Apollo 17 mission. You missed an alarm, huh? All right. The perigee will raise to 181, and TLI will go 429 by 30... 3.5 mil. Oh, thanks, Devlin. Sorry, I said circularized. Yeah, yeah. No, not circularized. They're basically going to be in a high eccentric parking orbit. Thank you. I mean, it's not like you got to wait six hours or anything. Tony, honestly, that six hours for me is going to fly by. Uh, I've already been streaming for basically an hour. Um, 
Yeah, and it's it feels like I've been here for five minutes. Overpressurization during LH2 slow fill. This happened on Monday. Did a manual configuration to get it to work. Starting that now. There you go, Rockets. How you doing, buddy? How you feeling? You feeling limber today, dude, or what? Hydrogen flow is good now, I guess. They have implemented several fixes to that and retorqued the bolts on the tail service mast, the hydrogen tail service mast carrier umbilical plate. Uh, and yeah, they have a solution to f fill the hydrogen without it leaking. Looking a little forward in the countdown. Currently at T minus six hours and 40 minutes. Gene's definitely there, Mad Dog. There's no way he's not. He's probably not commanding the like flight control, but he's definitely there. I, I guarantee you he's there. The uh, resumption of the countdown clock? No, quack, never. Roughly 7.07 .07 a.m. Eastern time. Again, we will resume. Resume out of what is a pre-planned two and a half hour hold that we're currently in, all planned. Gene Grants can wear a vest whenever he wants to, Bobby. The cryo-loading operation moved back into the left, and so now it's earlier into the hold. That wasn't the original intention when they drew up the plans, but through the wet dresses and launch attempt. And I mean, Mad Dog, I don't know point. about you, Working at NASA and doing crazy stuff like this is all about maximizing your uh, maximizing your chance of success. If I was the flight controller in at Johnson Space Center in charge of the Artemis One mission, I would want him there. I'd be like, Gene, hey, I know you don't you kind of retired, you don't do this anymore. Can you uh, you kind of have some expertise in the matter here? Can you, you do you think you can come help me out? <laughs> you can come help me out just to be sure. <laughs> you know. ML Rocket Science, are you excited, man? I am ready to go, man. I'm ready. Uh, I've been waiting for this mission for a long time. And there's a lot of people that have been waiting for this mission a lot longer than me. Hey, Ando, what's going on? Cajun, you're ready to go? I notice all of my rocket nerd friends have an obsession with expensive sports cars and big construction projects like skyscrapers. Is that, the, is that the same with you? I own four automobiles back alley. Yeah. They're not they're not nice automobiles. I don't own four Ferraris. They're all old trucks and old cars because I like old trucks and cars, but yes. Oh absolutely. Sun's coming up, armchair. Yep. Marley you got your tent bonfire marshmallows ready for a long stream. There you go. Pack it in. We're gonna be here a while. Do you wanna be an astronaut? Laurie, I'd I'd go, sure. If they wanted me to command a vehicle, I'd do it. Um or just be on the vehicle. Yeah, I, I'd do that, sure. Um, I'm much more interested in how the vehicle goes together. A designer. Something along the lines of, like, uh, Robert Goddard. Uh, Von Braun. Uh, Elon, stuff like that. Like, those, like, design, like, I like built, Sergei Korolev. I like, I like engineering the rockets. That's my favorite part. Flying on them is fun, too. I'd do that, sure. Yeah, that's right, Cajun, that's right. Ever played KSP? KSP is the main game that I stream, Armchair. I have 15,000 hours in Kerbal Space Program. When I play Kerbal, I don't just build, I don't just put the rocket on the pad. I build the launch pads, too. Want to see? I build the launch pads and I conduct, and I teach people about NASA systems engineering and how to build a space program, how NASA does it. I use, I use KSP to teach people that. Like here, I'll give you a, give you a look. Like, see, I don't just build the launch pad and put it out. I build built my own integration building, my own VAB, and then I put the I put the core stages together. I've engineered my own rockets, own separation systems, own structural analysis. I do I do all the test stand work, just like NASA would. That's how I roll. That's what I like doing. Uh, yeah, it's hard. Very difficult. Very difficult thing to do. It's a hard, hard task. But nobody said rocket science was easy. Even even when Kerbal's holding your hand with it, it's still difficult. Remember this in the dark program? Yep. Are you planning on playing KSP2 if it ever actually releases? Yeah, Fox Ride. I, I know I know the, the 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 creative director. Yeah. Pretty good friends with that guy. 
Okay, the, uh, What's your KSP the secrets? Team, the liquid oxygen team, uh, discussing the, the NASA test director and the launch director. Hang on one second, uh, Lori. The stop flow that happened there, was on that, the liquid yeah. oxygen side. Uh, they've got the... 2.17 p.m. Eastern time units. Right. It's putting pressure into the line. Stable. Oh, yeah, quack. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm and, the biggest uh, nerd. The, the liquid big oxygen nerd. is flowing big, back big nerd. to the vehicle. Not the biggest, I would Minimal say. impact to the timeline. Flow rate. Um, no impact to the flow rate uh, going forward. I think it uh, might have had to do with uh, the tank being at a high liquid level once it, once it was refilled after the first launch attempt. Bobby, I know nothing about KSP-2. Seriously, so I know what there, you guys know. I do that on purpose. Side, Compartmentalization. On the recovery plan there. Just to recap, that went into... Absolutely, Euclid. It's one of the best flow. ways to demonstrate rocket science to children. Yeah, absolutely. But the team is uh, manually bringing it back into the configuration to get moving again. Okay. Seemed like they had a little bit of a hiccup. We'll look for more updates. With fueling there. We are close to sunrise here on the east coast of Florida. Light begins to illuminate the background, as you can. You can't see from this shot, but. Um, <sighs> I do play Minecraft video games. I haven't played offshore. it in a little while, but every Saturday. I'm, I, sh I usually play Minecraft in the mornings on Saturday. We have a survival city build that Weather we're working team on. Is watching, as you can see from yeah, this shot, big. the light that's starting to fill the sky. We're at twilight. I'm not sure, Cajun. I didn't hear it. T zero at two seventeen p.m. Eastern time. We are currently in the cryo loading operations loading both the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen tanks. Had a couple bumps in the road. Team is dealing with those. That's why they have planned holds, because sometimes sometimes you chill it down a little bit too quickly, oxygen. it leaks a little bit. Starting to flow that back down the lines from the cryosphere to the rocket. I love how it calls them cryospheres. That's awesome. <laughs> Starting to get a little bit of venting down in the engine section. What's the weather looking like? We are 80% favorable super chilled during liquid the launch oxygen. window. Goes into the tank and almost immediately, even in fact down the line, it, uh, it tanks were filled state, pushing gas out of after the last attempt. Overpressure so warnings when they were filling. Got it. The gaseous oxygen through. So we're talking about some res some residual gas as well, Devlin, right? As the top of the tank. And once we get a little bit more flow in there, a little bit higher liquid oxygen level. Start to see the venting midway up the rocket. Uh, so camera nine twenty three launch control. Uh, that's not NASA doesn't have nine hundred and twenty three cameras around the launch site, Sirius. If that's what you're asking, the nine denotes where the ca the location of the camera. The first digit in that naming convention denotes where the camera is. So out of all the nine hundred series cameras, that is the twenty third camera. 900 are blast detonation area cameras, if, I, if I'm looking at that right. 800 are pad cameras. So if you have like 801, that is a camera that is actually on the mobile launcher. 900 series cameras are ones that are in the blast detonation area, the BDA, or uh, around the pad area. It's Florida weather, you never know. Yeah, Hawkland, well, okay. The, I could go on with the weather about, you're right, you're absolutely right. I could go on with the weather, you know, people about like, you know, warm fronts moving, moving northwest and creating a trough and pulling in sea air, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, it's targeting 2.17 p.m. for the launch window. Anybody that lives in Florida knows it really doesn't rain usually at 2 p.m. It usually rains at 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock. That is what makes the launch window favorable because they're going to try to get it in before it starts pouring and monsooning for 30 minutes, and then it gets sunny after that. Yeah, they're going to try to get in right before it. Now, wh wh why? why? Why does it matter? Why? Do <laughs> well, one, you don't want to launch into the rain. That's just... It's not that that's a bad thing. The rocket probably would be fine. However, you don't really want to take a chance. You want good baseline data, because this is a test flight. You really want the first one to be launching in close to ideal conditions, so you get a good... 
good bench test of the vehicle. You don't want to launch the first one in the rain because then your, your data could have been influenced by that rainstorm in some way, shape, or form that you didn't see. So you want a good baseline. You suck. <laughs> oh, hey, Gilmore, you suck. <laughs> Lightning also is kind of scary. Well, Alex, this is, you know, I always say I learn about rockets every day. I learned about what's called anvil cloud rules uh, from NASA's press conference yesterday. I know what an anvil cloud is. An anvil cloud rule is a nice way of saying don't launch into a thunderstorm. But there was a little bit of a clarification on that from the weather officer from NASA's press conference about Artemis yesterday. It's pre-flight operations press conference. Uh, that was yesterday morning. Um, the weather officer... Uh, from Patrick Space Force Base, which she was, she was actually really cool. I learned a lot. It's freaking great, great teacher. Um, oxygen loading side of things. Hang on. Just got an announcement that the main propulsion system chill down is complete. Yes. And Good. locks Good is news. in slow fill. Again, the main propulsion system, the plumbing between the tank and the engine, that is in chill down. And now we are in slow fill okay big step right there so anvil anvil cloud rule basically means that there are thunderstorms in the area and it's not that the rocket could get struck by lightning it's i mean okay so this thing is metal first of all and if you're launching a big metal thing into the air you 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 don't want to basically make the lightning rod they that happened in the past. It didn't end well. I mean, it kind of did, but it kind of didn't. Um, basically, they don't want to put the rocket into a scenario where it becomes a, a big lightning rod. And I know what people are saying. Well, EJ, how is it... If it gets struck by lightning, it's not going to ground out. Who cares? Well, it will. It'll ground out on the plume. Yeah, that happened. It, that happened on Apollo 12. They launched it in like 10 seconds into the flight give or take, I don't remember the exact time, Apollo 12 got hit by lightning. It became a huge lightning rod. And what happened is the lightning went down the stack, out the back, and the, the exhaust plume from the engines, it actually arced through the exhaust plume down and hit the tower. It, and it created a circuit for a second from the cloud all the way to the ground. It created a ground and it, it almost scrambled the brains of the Saturn V on the way up. They had to switch to an auxiliary power system. They had to switch the signal condition electronics to an auxiliary power system. Ecom, try SCE to auxiliary. And that actually fixed, fixed Saturn on the way up. But yeah, you don't want to make the lightning rod because lightning can arc down the plume. The plumes of the rockets are actually, actually conductive. They can conduct electricity and it can create a circuit. You don't want to scramble the brains of your rocket on the way up. That's a bad idea. Huh, yeah, just give Artemis an SE, a signal condition electronic switch. It'll fix everything, right? <laughs> yeah. So, check it out, guys. There's slow fill. This is a liquid oxygen line that goes into SLS's inner tank up to the oxidizer tank up there. Let's see, this is the bulkhead here between the oxidizer tank and the inter tank. And then right here, what we're looking at is the top of the hydrogen tank. This is a oxygen, liquid oxygen fill, fill line. We could just call it oxygen. That's fine. Liquid oxygen fill line here. There's. It's actually also the fill and drain line. They fill up the rockets down at the bottom with commodities. So the, the liquid oxygen line connected to the rocket is about 100 feet that way, or about 30 meters down there. Uh, and then there's two downcomers on... So fill and drain lines that go up the sides of SLS, and both of them go into the intertank and up to the LOX tank. Now, why would they have two? Why do you need two? Well, you need two because you need to flow a, great, a good amount of liquid oxygen to run four shuttle engines, basically. Run four RS-25s. Uh, so there's two of them. But you can see that the line is getting chilled down because they've started flowing liquid oxygen into the liquid oxygen tank up here. You can see the two downcomers right there. They're on either side. The fuel lines are actually down here. And <clears throat> basically... What NASA, what, what NASA, and this is what most rockets do. 
you fill you, you always fill from the bottom. Every rocket fills fuel from the bottom. You fill fuel from the bottom and you have a vent line out the top, right? But in this particular scenario, these lines that they're using to fill up the liquid oxygen tank are also the lines that liquid oxygen is going to flow back down into the engines when the vehicle takes off. Why? Because this way you only need one. You only need one pipe. You don't need a fill pipe and a drain pipe. Make one. It's less mass that way. Every rocket does this. So like Falcon 9 does the same thing. The liquid oxygen the liquid oxygen tank goes through the RP-1 tank on Falcon 9 and the 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 pipe that they use to fill up the liquid oxygen tank is also the pipe that they use to drain it when the engines are firing. Kind of like the shuttle. The shuttle did something similar to this. Uh, this ha Once again, these are external locks down comers. That's, or just a locks fill and drain line. Uh, they're called down comers because it, it comes down from the liquid oxygen tank into the engines. Now, once again, these are external. The reason why they have external liquid oxygen lines on this and why they don't go through like what a Falcon 9 or a Saturn 5 would do is because if you flow liquid oxygen through a liquid hydrogen tank, you can heat up the hydrogen. Think about it for a second. So liquid oxygen is minus 293 Fahrenheit and liquid hydrogen is minus 423 Fahrenheit. Or four, four, I just like saying 420 because hilarious. That's the meme number. If you flow liquid oxygen through a liquid hydrogen tank, you're actually going to heat up the hydrogen and you can overpress the hydrogen tank. That's why the locks down comers are on the outside. Uh, now, if you're using like Falcon 9, for instance, we'll use Falcon 9 as an example. If you have Falcon 9 and you're using um, kerosene and liquid oxygen, flowing liquid oxygen through the kerosene tank down to the engines actually is not that big of a deal because if you freeze up the kerosene in, inside of Falcon 9 or what's called RP-1, it's basically kerosene. Uh, if, you, he, if you cool that with liquid oxygen, it actually you can actually get more fuel in there. SpaceX does that. I don't speak Imperial, my friend. <laughs> so hydrogen is minus 270 centigrade and then liquid oxygen is... It's minus 218C. There you go. Oh no, that's the freezing point. It's cryogenic with a freezing point of 218. This is a boiling point of 182. We'll just say minus 200. We'll just say minus 200. We'll call it a day. Hey Taffy, what's going on? Yeah, Loco, it's Apollo 12. Mm -hmm. You're a freezing point. Ugh. SLS doesn't even use balloon tanks. Yeah, kind of can't. It's really cold. Yeah. Hydrogen's cooler than liquid oxygen. The liquid oxygen is cold, but it'll heat up the hydrogen if you tried to run oxygen through a hydrogen tank. Yeah, that's bad. Was it still at 60% go? No. Uh, well, at the start of the window, it's 60 heart, and it moves to 80% towards the middle and the end of the window. What game are you playing? Pressure issue uh, resolved. I'm not playing any game. Uh, I'm watching a NASA the, uh, launch and commentating on it. The team just got the go to perform slow fill for liquid hydrogen. Again, they just okay. got the go to perform, to begin, slow fill for liquid hydrogen. Daffy, if you want to call this a game, we'll call it Human Space Program. We're not playing KSP, we're playing HSP. <laughs> So we got a call for, no, it's all good. Don't worry about it. If you have any questions, and that goes for anybody, if you have any questions about what we're doing here, I don't mind. It's, it's all good. I just get a little confused. Uh, so this is the science and technology category on Twitch. And what NASA, I'm covering a NASA launch here uh, on the Twitch side of things. I actually have permission from NASA to do it. Um, and I am covering NASA's first moonshot in 50 years. They're, this rocket's going out to the moon. It's the first time in a long time. Five decades. Have you read American Moonshot? Rexy, who is that by? I know of the book. I don't think I've read it. 
It's a big rocket, Taffy, a very big rocket. This rocket is the size of a skyscraper, and it's going to the moon. It's a big one. Human-capable mission. Moonshot usually implies that, Forlorn, but yes. A big Falcon rocket. Someone was a Doom Flare. Yeah. Mad Dog, here's the thing. We could sit here and we could say how expensive SLS, SLS is all day, but, dude, it's a, it's a thing that I have. Look, SpaceX might be able to do it for cheaper in the long run, and I, I'd agree with that. But you don't build a moon rocket for $2 million. You know what I'm saying? Even Elon, could, even Elon would tell you this. It takes billions of dollars to make a vehicle that is capable of getting to the moon. Starship is taking is going to take billions of dollars to get right. Now Elon has that much money. He 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 can throw, he has deep pockets to be able to throw money at that problem. But even then, throwing money at the problem doesn't usually fix it. You need competent people to to actually build the thing. But at the end of the day, dude, you know, I, I sit here and people I listen to people talk all day about oh SLS is too expensive. And it's not. It's it's actually right on par for how expensive it is to launch to build a rocket and get it to go to the moon. My big critique of SLS is that it's, it's not going to launch enough. I want it to launch more. If it launches more, the price will go down. Hey, Hotbox, what's going on? But, dude, you can't, you can't get to the moon on hopes and dreams. It doesn't work that way. It's always going to take a billion dollars. You know what I mean? Discovery, go at throttle up. Hey, VNSH, I don't mind that you have opinion that have that opinion, but I try to run family friendly during the day. You got to remember, there's a lot of people here watching with their kids. This is a big deal. So, you know, your opinions of Elon Musk, notwithstanding, just please try not to swear in here. I don't like, don't get me wrong. I don't have a problem with cursing. Like I curse sometimes too, but yeah, yeah you know, you can say whatever you want about Elon. I'm a pretty big fan myself, but people can disagree. That's fine. It's totally okay. Hey, Huey, what's up? 40 minutes. What's your name, EJ? Picking up the count in just a few minutes. This is Bobby the capsule. The Orion that's up there is basically real. It's missing its life support systems because there's no people on board. There's it's no need to complicate the test flight even more. Uh, it's missing the life support systems. But yeah, for the most part, that is about as close as you can get to a flight level Orion. More competition, more ideas, and innovation. Bingo. How's the weather looking? We are 60 to 80% favorable throughout the window. I don't think so. I don't think so, hit him. <laughs> Dude, I don't know about you, man. I, I wouldn't want to do that in space. <laughs> Recreational narcotics in space is either a really good idea or a really bad idea. First of all, you don't want smoke inside of your spacecraft. That's burning something inside of the spacecraft usually doesn't end well. I'm not sure about burning that. You might might you might be able to use other means to to do that, but either that would either be really fun or not really fun. <laughs> that would either be really fun or it would really suck. I wouldn't be surprised if EJ did not drive a Tesla. I don't drive a Tesla JSTN. All, all my I, I have all, all my cars have V8s in them, and they're not very efficient. But I don't hate Tesla either. I can't. The, the, what I'm trying to tell you is that I can't afford a Tesla. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the, I don't have enough money to do that. Ask me about burning stuff in space. Yeah, yeah, it's not. That's usually not a good idea. So as good as it, as can be reasonably explained, here's hoping the vents work this time. They will, Creeper. They worked last time. It was just a. It was just an off nominal sensor reading. They, the the engines bled. Engine three did exactly what it was told. How long will it take to get to the moon? About a week, Woodsy. This is a relatively low energy transfer burn out to the moon, comparatively to Apollo. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, there's no people on board, so you can use a low energy transfer. That's not a big deal. Uh, so, it, 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 Apollo took three days. This will take about a week, give or take. Now, two, Orion is designed to last in space a lot longer than the Apollo capsule would. Uh, Orion's designed to be up there for a long time. Orion could technically be up there for about 200 days with nobody on board. With people on board, about, about 20 to 30 days, op Orion can operate by itself. 
no problem, 20 days in deep space, which is a pretty hardcore feat. That's really difficult to do. So what are the small nozzles near the thrusters for? Moving? Those vents. As you can see on your screen. Those are liquid oxygen vents for the main propulsion system. When they start to flow propellant into the engines, you'll see those things venting. Corvax. You look like a Tesla driver. Thank you, I guess. Okay, liquid oxygen has gone into fast fill mode. The pump speed for fast fill, about two and a half times faster. Uh, about than two slow weeks, fill. Cammy. Yeah. Stand by. So it's a week. It's going to take about a week to get out there. It's going to spend two weeks in what's called a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. It's basically a high eccentric orbit, a highly eccentric retrograde orbit around the moon. Uh, and it's going to be out there for about two weeks. And then it's going to take about another week to get back. It's a total. It's a 37 day mission. So I know that was four weeks that I said it's 37 days there. It's not that that was a rough timeline. You can go on NASA's website to get a better timeline if you want. Countdown is resumed, dudes. Will NASA stream the whole thing live? Not only will they stream it live, Gooners, uh, right we'll get 4K live streaming views from the moon on the Orion capsule. It's a pretty big deal. Going through a scan of the core stage tank. Okay, so this is the outside of the liquid hydrogen tank on SLS. You see a couple of different things here. Right here is what's called a raceway. The raceway has, is basically the wiring. It's, a, it's the wire harness for SLS. The, all the wiring that's from the engines that are down there go up this thing over here. Next to the raceway, you see your locks downcomer. It's called a downcomer because it takes locks down. Locks comes down from the liquid oxygen tank that's up there down to the engines that are down there. Engineers, the, the names are very literal. Okay, so that's the locks downcomer. It's what they use to fill and drain the liquid oxygen tank. Then, these lines over here, these metal ones, those are pneumatic lines. Those are pneumatics for the rocket. Now, what, okay, what uses pneumatics? What uses pneumatics on this and why? Well, the tanks, long story short, the tanks use pneumatics, right? See, there's the liquid oxygen line that goes into this white section down here that looks like R2-D2 got cut in half and got attached to an orange thing. Uh, that's the main propulsion system, or MPS for short. Those are the two boosters on the sides. Those are the engines. Those are the main SLS main engines down there, RS-25s. Now, pneumatics. Note that the pneumatics are coming out of the main propulsion system, and then they go up that way, these metal lines. What do those do? Well, it's for the tanks. Because, okay, think about this for a second. If you have a bottle of water, and you, you've capped the top, right? And then you drill a hole in the bottom... The water will come out, right? But it'll go floop, bloop, bloop, bloop. Because as the water goes out, as gravity forces the water out, it's going to force air in. Or else the or else the bottle of water will crumple, right? Say it just plastic bottle, right? So if you unscrew the cap and then drill a hole, the water will piss out really, really fast, right? It'll, it'll, it'll exit the bottle very quickly. Gravity will push down on the water. Archimedes principle will do its thing, force it out the bottom, right? With a rocket, you have to do that, but you have to you have to drain you have to drain fuel very quickly. But the thing about the rocket is, you can't rely on gravity to do that for you, because the rocket is going to try to beat gravity. Remember that part? <laughs> it's going up into space. You it's it's designed to basically accelerate to a speed where its angular outward velocity is basically canceling out the force of gravity. That's what orbiting is, right? So you can't rely on gravity to do that for you. That's why there's pneumatic lines here. What those lines are for are for what's called autogenous pressurization. So there is basically a tap off from four uh, from all four of these engines. And all four of those engines at some point in their combustion cycle have gaseous hydrogen in the loop and gaseous oxygen. So the parts of the engine, so parts of the engine are producing taking some of the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen they're taking some of it, and it, it, it turns it into gas, obviously, because gas comes out the bottom very fast and it's very hot. You, you won't, you, you'll, you'll know that part when you see it. Uh, 
but some of it gets taken out. Some of the liquid oxygen turns to gas and it gets it goes up those pneumatic lines. And some of the hydrogen, what's wrong with the counter? Goes some of the gaseous hydrogen goes up that line. And those two lines, the the autogenous pressurization lines lead to the top of the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen tank. Because the rocket can't rely on gravity to push the fuel down when it's going up into space, right? What they do is they Com they, they actually put gas into the top of the tank. As the propellant gets drained out, the gases get pumped in. And that keeps the tank at a stable pressure the entire launch. It's called tankulage. If you, if you want to know the technical term, U-L-L-A-G-E, ullage. It's a weird word. That is super important for a number of reasons. One, obviously you want the fuel to go down. You don't want the fuel to go up. That would be not good. Now, keep in mind the rocket is under acceleration, but you don't you you want to keep the tanks at the at the right pressure, and that's the second part. You want if if the pressure is changing inside of the tanks, well, pressure on these tanks is very 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 important to the rocket's structural integrity. Rockets pressurize, and they pressurize at a very high pressure inside of the the hydrogen and oxygen tanks. They do it for structural rigidity. They do it to make the vehicle stronger. Think about, think about a can, a soda can, right? This is, this is from the other day. This is from yesterday. I should have cleaned up. Think about this. When this thing is open, you can crush it, no problem. But if it's pressurized and it has liquid inside of it, it's really, you can't do that. I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to do it with my hands. And if I did, it would just pop. It wouldn't crush like this, that's for sure. Rockets do that same exact thing. Rockets do that same, same exact thing. They pressurize the tanks for structural rigidity. They do it for a lot more reasons than that. Oh, Hex, I know, I know. But what I try not to do is get into semantics on the stream and try to keep it very basic. I know all the reasons that they, they do that for. There's plenty of them. Uh, I could get into tank baffling. We could get into anti-vortexing inside of the tanks with propellants. Uh, we could do a bunch of, I could tell you a bunch of different things about what ullage propellants do. They can even be used to propel the vehicle during staging if you really want to. But I try to keep it nice and simple here. But you're right. Yeah, it's rocket science, man. There's, it's, this thing's way more complicated than what I'm explaining. I'm just keeping it very general on purpose so we can get new people involved with rocket science and hopefully maybe, maybe into that field someday. You're absolutely right, though. It is way more complicated than that. <laughs> it's not just for structure, and it's not just to make sure the propellants go down. There is a number of reasons why you'd want to do tank ullage, but those are the big ones off the top, off the top of my head. I know, MP. Isn't it cool? Thanks, Inglonius. Yeah, that was a fantastic demo. Yep, yep, yep. Orion vortexing inside of a tank. It, it, the, you need to put baffling inside of the tank, especially around the tank pickups. And this doesn't necessarily have to do with ullage, but kind of. Uh, you could... Basically, when you're flying up into space, right, what can happen is the propellant will create a whirlpool going into the fuel lines that go down to the engines. And that whirlpool inside of your rocket will act like a gyroscope. Yeah, so the rocket can process. Like, like you know, if you spin like a, a top, right? Eventually it'll start doing this, right? Instead of just spinning straight. Yeah, it can act like, an, it can act like a gyroscope on the rocket and actually get it to spin. Oh yeah, <laughs> gotta be very careful. Yep, that's right, Dog Viper. Yep, mm-hmm. Has NASA? Oh, here. Let me. Let me. At the moment, there was a leak detected. Because there's no the crew on board. Cavity. Test the rules. Oh, we got a leak. Went up to eight percent. That put it in automatic revert for the liquid hydrogen flow. Rockets okay. in a safe configuration. Hydrogen leak. Looking at the path forward. The team is going to let the area where leak is coming from, which is a quick disconnect. Catch can leak again, up. guys. It should take about 30 minutes. They'll let it warm up to reseat the valve, and then they'll line. try again. No problem. This happened last time. And the hope is that... <laughs> Zuna. 
it'll warm up that 2D and uh, once they hit it with cryos again, hoping to reseat. Guys, I, I want to be that quick dip. I want to be very clear, and I'm not just doing this to for like damage control for NASA or anything. I want to be very clear here. You know, you hear about these hydrogen leaks and you're like, what, NASA can't even make a damn fuel line work? No, 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 no. It's, it's not NASA. It's physics. F physics. Y you, yeah, hydrogen is like that. It, it's a real big pain in the butt. It's, dude, they went to fill this last time and it worked. It's about, the reason why is because the hydrogen is really, really cold. And if you flow it even a little bit too fast, the where the fuel line connects into the main propulsion system down at the bottom of the vehicle, if you flow it even a little bit too fast, right, the hydrogen will start to evaporate. And guys, this isn't just NASA. You know, ULA has this problem with Atlas V. It happens with Centaur and Atlas V sometimes too. The hydrogen, it, it leaks. It, it happens. It leaks all the time. You're going to get some evap. All right, and when hydrogen, when liquid hydrogen evaporates, it creates gaseous hydrogen. And the thing about gaseous hydrogen is that it's really, really freaking small. So unless NASA can figure out a way to make a bigger hydrogen atom, you're you're stuck with it leaking. It happens. Like that's what I mean about physics. It's it's not NASA. It's physics. You can't really get around that. <laughs> you could try, and Lord knows they are, but. You can't really get around it. It's really difficult. The other thing to take into account here is that this is a brand new launch vehicle. They'll figure out a way to get it to work over time. And that might include a redesign of that catch can system. They've already redesigned it from the test from the test run that NASA did at Stennis last year. Or yeah, it was last year. They already did redesign it. This is the redesigned version. It's you're trying to beat a very complicated physics problem here. But don't worry, they'll get it. They'll get it. What they're going to do now is they're going to stop the flow of liquid hydrogen into the main propulsion system here. The, it's coming through. You can't see it from this picture. It's coming through this, this box over here. That's where the hydrogen comes from. It goes up and in. What they're going to do is stop the flow into the tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate, which goes into the main propulsion system. This part that looks like R2-D2. They're going to stop flow for that, and they're going to heat up the seal and the flange on the tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate, the fuel line. They're gonna they're gonna heat it up a little bit so the seals and the 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 O rings in there. No no don't worry they're not those type of O rings for the people that are like O rings NASA. Oh God no 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 not those. It's it's different. They're gonna heat up the seals and they're gonna when they flow liquid hydrogen again it'll reseat the seal and it should work. Temperature but the core stage is. So they want. I got you, Delano. That's what I do, man. That aluminum core stage shrinking at the same rate at the top and the bottom when they load propellants. So again, uh, the liquid hydrogen. Absolutely, team, Orion. Uh, in stop flow, working uh, a leak in the engine section. What are the blackest squares on this is Artemis launch control. the aprons for? This is instrumentation. It's not instrumentation. It is for video. Slacker, rockets paint checker. They paint checkerboards on rockets. They've been doing that since the, um, since basically the, the, the 60s. They, they put these on there because this is a test flight. All these things are here to look at footage. And so like, say when the vehicle launches, all right? Say when this goes. These black and white checkerboards, actually it's a chessboard, right? The, these black and white squares are there to be able to judge distance between things. Believe it or not, when the SRBs, for instance, ignite, they inflate just a little bit. They actually inflate. It's a steel, it's a steel casing and that the SRB has such pressure that it actually expands during flight. It, it inflates it a little bit like a balloon. You know how much you know how much pressure you need to you know how much internal pressure you need to make steel act like a balloon to stretch metal like that? It's pretty crazy. So these are here to look at the relationship between points here like literally when they're filming the rocket get off the pad. If one of those points goes out of whack a little bit at any point in the footage you can use a you can you know sit here and look at it and judge the distance or you can use a computer to to sense that all this stuff is staying in perfect correlation. 
if something like if like say an SRV kind of goes like this a little bit, this is a gross exaggeration. Say it does something like that, they'll be able to see it because they'll see the boxes moving around in relation to other boxes. Uh, it, think about it like a crash test dummy, uh, or or when like a, an automaker does a crash test for their car, they have they have the crash test dummy, yellow and black circles, to look at the relationship of things relative to other things, right? To basically see how much metal deformed, right? Or see how see how see how well the car took the accident, took a crash, right? When they crash test stuff, it's the same kind of thing. But you, I I'd like to say that they're not crash testing a rocket, <laughs> that. <laughs> that would be bad. They're they're just testing. It's not a crash test, but they still want to make sure that all this stuff stays in good correlation with each other. Now, with that being said, we'll even before it launch, we'll be able to see these boxes actually move around just a little bit. I want you to if you're going to be with me here all today, I want you to look at this. See these aft SRB attachment struts on both sides? See how they're kind of tilted down? They're kind of tilted down a little bit. When we get near the launch and they're done fueling, watch these. I want you to look at those again. They'll show them again. Remember, they're tilted down, okay? You'll see. You'll see one of these things moving around. How much pressure does the SRB throw out? I don't know what the chamber pressure is, Alex. It is a lot. If it's enough to stretch a steel casing like a balloon and inflate the SRB, yeah, it, it, it's a lot. Are they watching these points with a NASA spy plane? They will use a WB-57 for instrumentation war for, for that type of stuff, but no, that's mostly about the pad cameras. It's mostly about the cameras on the pad to make sure that everything is staying correlated to each other. Because, like, if the SRBs, like, say one of the SRBs do this. Say they, they, say they, have, they have a little bit of torsion on the stack, which does, that could happen. You would know. You would see, they would be able to see it because the checkerboards would start to turn. This is all, like, there's a, hundreds of cameras on the pad. Not, not, not exactly hundreds, but there's it's a good hundred cameras on this mobile launcher alone. And they really, NASA, not only do they look at the data, but they look at the footage. They look at the footage in very high resolution, slow-mo uh, footage of the launch. And in that slow-mo footage, slow-mo guy style, they basically do that. NASA basically wrote the book on slow motion photography for the people that don't know. Uh... They, that's when they go and they look to see if any of this stuff's moving around. I want to say it's for instrumentation, but it, that's not really it. It's more cinematography than anything. Yeah. What's the fabric thingy that is connected to the engine? Lori, that is a thermal protection system. Um, it's a thermal protection system. That's called an aft skirt. Well, not an aft skirt. It's, it's actually attached to the, the, the aft skirt and the bow tail on SLS. Those are heat blankets. The reason why those are there is because the top side of the rocket engine is carrying that liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into the combustion chamber on the RS-25s. So the top of the rocket engine needs to be really, really cold. The bottom of the rocket engine is, well, I think a good way to put it would be not cold out the bottom of the rocket engine. Yeah, it's not cold. It's really, really freaking hot. Those blankets are there to protect the turbine machinery on the... Uh, on the rockets, but keep in mind here. Let me go to my let me go to my splash screen. Keep in mind. Look at see over there. The rocket engines need to be a, the rocket engines are thrust vector controlled. It's a TVC thrust vector control on a gimbal. So basically, the rocket engines are all on a ball. Basically, a, it's a gim, It's called a gimbal in mechanics, but it's basically a ball joint. And then they have two hydraulic actuators that can push the engines in any direction. See over there. See the engines? That's from that's the, those are the same engines. That's from the the um, the Green Run test, which was a huge uh, uh, static fire for for the SLS core stage. See the engines wiggling around. The reason why they need the blankets there is because the blankets need to stretch, because the engines can do this. Not not this one, even though those will have heat blankets too. That's super heavy. That's SpaceX. But over there, far left screen. They need the heat blankets because it needs the rockets need to do the piggly wigglies on the way up. Not not necessarily that. That was a that was to kind of push the stage to its limit. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's to push to push the stage to its limit. But those heat blankets need to be there because the rocket engine is actually moving around. Good questions, guys. Very good. Hey Bailey, good morning. Why is it orange? So, <clears throat> okay, it's orange for a number of reasons. 
Um, I personally think the orange looks really freaking cool. Just, just me. Uh, the orange is called Spray On Foam Insulation. S-O-F-I. Um, or SOFI for short. Now, what, what does SOFI do? Well, it does exactly as the name impri implies. It's spray on foam insulation. Like the, it's kind of similar to the spray spray insulation that you have in your house if you have that. Uh, it's a, it's an insulator. It's a it's it insulates those cryogenics, the cryogenic tanks. Now, here's the thing. Um, I say the spray on foam insulation has multiple uses, but the biggest reason why this Sophie is there, why that orange foam is there, is to insulate the propellants. It's basically a, a koozie. Like, you, you guys know the, the foam kind of, like, cover that you can put on your drink, and in the middle of summer, you can put it on your drink, and it insulates it and keeps it cold? It's literally that. It's a koozie for the rocket. That, but it stays with the rocket. Now, why? Why would you do that? Well, once again, hydrogen and liquid oxygen are extremely freaking cold really freaking cold. They have to stay cold if they want to be a liquid. If you let liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen warm up even 10, 15, 20 degrees, they'll both turn to gases. And the engines down at the bottom of the SLS core stage are liquid fuel engines. They don't do very well putting gas in there. <laughs> that, that, that can break things. You could spin a bearing, which is what NASA was worried about when they, when they scrubbed Monday's launch attempt. They were worried about spinning a bearing in the engine on the, on the, uh, the high pressure... The high pressure fuel turbo pump, the H, uh, the HPF uh, TP, they were worried about spinning a bearing in the turbo pump if they put gas in there because it didn't cool the bearing down to the right temperature. True story. Are you a rocket engineer? Uh, I'm a communicator, Cuzzy. Uh, I, I'm a STEM communicator. I read and learn about rockets and I use it to teach people here. Uh, no, I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm self-taught, believe it or not. There's those outer genus pressurization lines that I was telling you guys about. For the edumacation, sweet. It's painted orange so they can find it when it gets dropped. Lori, this thing is not surviving re-entry. You don't, you don't survive re-entry coming back from a thousand miles up in space. Or a thousand nautical miles, 1600 kilometers. You don't, they, no, it's going to re-enter. The, the foam is there to insulate the propellants and get better performance. Because the longer that you can keep hydrogen and oxygen as liquids, the more performance you're going to get out of the vehicle. Now... The spray-on foam insulation is a shuttle-derived technology from NASA's space shuttle. Now, SLS is basically what happens when you try to build a Saturn V out of shuttle parts, out of, out of old shuttle parts. Now, that's fine. It's all fine and dandy, but they had the... And, it, dude, SLS is it's a great rocket. It's a great piece of equipment, I'd say, thus far. Uh, hang on one second. Director, on a plan, currently we are in stop flow for liquid hydrogen team is working that they're warming up the tail service mass umbilical section got it stand by oh thanks moving i appreciate that yeah i i really yeah this one is not reusable yeah cindy it turns out it turns out when you go to the moon reusability is kind of at odds with doing that just because of the crazy amount of energy that you need there are some people that are working on that though Something, something, stainless steel, something, something. But anyway, um, the spray on, hey, Zostar, thanks, man. Welcome to Mission Control. You go with throttle up. Uh, so the spray on foam insulation is something that's from the shuttle program. The reason why is, okay, so let's take a look at a, let's take a look at the shuttle, okay? So there, from the shuttle program, there's that same orange insulation, but the reason why they did that is because when rockets are using cryogenic that conversation starts i'll update you now again hold on uh, leak detected right there in the engine section of the core stage on the liquid hydrogen side so 15 minutes ago uh, liquid hydrogen was flowing went into stop flow after a sensor there detected a higher than uh, normal percentage of gaseous hydrogen, which is the indicator you for quit. a leak. You quit. Fucking control. In an area, um, in, a, in a basically the can around the QD. The leak is in the plate cavity, indicating it's a QD seal leak. So now the liquid hydrogen team is uh, working a plan 
uh, forward to reinitiate the flow of liquid hydrogen. Meanwhile, liquid oxygen is flowing at a little slower rate. We've got a graphic that's tracking that in the core stage. The liquid oxygen tank is above the is a liquid hydrogen tank. It's 196,000 gallons. As you see there, looking on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, we are in fill. The tank, again, above the 537,000 gallon li liquid hydrogen tank. You can see the fill rate and where that is on the rocket. Temperature. So I want to point out a couple of things here. All that obviously is right. That's real That's real time telemetry that we're getting from launch control. Uh, that's not a block 1B SLS. That's a block 1 SLS. That, that graphic is wrong. But one, once again, they interns probably made this, so, so whatever. This is this is the stuff that's important, and that stuff is right. Um, so they ha they are slow filling the liquid oxygen tank while they're warming up the hydrogen tail service mast umbilical. So what's going on here? And this is what Daryl, the NASA communicator, is is talking about. See this white thing right there? That is a tail service mast carrier umbilical hydrogen catch can. It is on the tail service mast umbilical carrier plate on SLS, which is basically that's that's the fuel line. Not that particular piece. This bottom huge stainless hose right there, that's the fuel line. That's the hydrogen fuel line. How do I know? I'm a nerd. Trust me. Now, hydrogen, like I said, likes to evaporate. It very much likes to evaporate. It's really difficult when, I mean, even in Florida in the, you know, in the morning, it's still pretty dang warm down there. Hydrogen is hydrogen at minus 270 centigrade. And it's probably like 20C positive in Florida. That is a huge temperature margin right there. So in Fahrenheit, it's like 70 degrees in Florida and it, hydrogen is minus 420F, okay? <laughs> That's a huge temperature differential. So when they flow the hydrogen, they gotta do it slowly, okay? So there's a catch can and a seal right here. Basically, if you start, if it flows the hydrogen just a little bit more than, than what they want, like you have to be very careful with this, the, the valve, the, where, where the, the flanges won't seal correctly and it'll leak. And that's what the, the scavenging system and the catch can is for. This top line right there is actually a hydrogen vent line. It takes all the hydrogen gas out of the, out of the system because you're going to flow hydrogen and you've, you, no matter what, it will evaporate in, one, in some shape, way, shape, or form because you have warm lines. Like I said, Florida's, Florida's pretty warm and the propellants are extremely freaking cold. So when you flow hydrogen in... To a, to a warm line, you're gonna get some evaporation. Some of the line is going to heat the hydrogen up just a little bit and the hydrogen will turn to gas. That's what the catch can system is for. That's what that white box is. It's designed to catch any hydrogen gas that comes, that leaks out of the, out of the connection right here. If it leaks too much, that means the valve or, or the, the seals right here on this line did not seat correctly, meaning they flowed hydrogen a little too fast. So what NASA is doing is actually they're, they stop the filling for a second to get the, the seals to warm up. And when they flow again, they're going to try to get them to seat correctly and, and pump fuel in. Hey, Tessa. So once again, that's basically, those are the fuel lines right there for SLS. This big, big t fuel line right there. That's the bottom one. That's the hydrogen fuel line. This top one is the, is the gaseous hydrogen vent line. This gaseous hydrogen vent line basically leads to the biggest Bunsen burner you've ever seen. It's a Bunsen burner that's like, like I don't know, 50 feet tall, about a five-story building. Seriously, it's a Bunsen burner. What does a Bunsen burner do? It, it just flows gas, flows gas out a nozzle, right? And then you light the top of the nozzle and the Bunsen burner has holes in it for, you know, the flames are going to pull oxygen in through the holes and mix it with the gas and then send it out the top. It's called a purge flame. It's a gigantic hydrogen Bunsen burner because the thing about hydrogen gas is that it, you're always gonna get hydrogen gas from flowing around liquid hydrogen. Inevitable, it always happens. Physics, you can't, you can't really beat physics in this, in this regard. 
So you're always going to get gaseous hydrogen. And if you don't give the gaseous hydrogen a place to combust, it'll find a place to combust for you. It's like Clippy. Hey, I see you're trying to combust hydrogen. Would you like me to do that on the outside of the rocket for you? No, Clippy, shut up. If you get the joke, you get it. it. It's annoying. Hydrogen will go everywhere you do not want it to go. And that's the reason why the igniters are down there. Somebody asked me about the igniters on SLS. Yeah, you're, you're going to have an igniter as well down there to purge the hydrogen when the engines start. So anyway, we were talking about spray-on foam insulation a little bit earlier. Lori, if you're still here. Um, the spray-on foam insulation is from the shuttle era because they didn't want ice coming off the liquid hydrogen tank and hitting the shuttle's thermal protection system. So they, they insulated the tanks with foam to make sure that that doesn't happen. Turns out that you know later the foam came off, but that's another story. But that is left over from the shuttle program. Not left over. They, they, it's a design that they chose to use with SLS here. And um, it, it, it's not necessarily there because they don't, they're worrying about like ice coming off the booster or anything because there's no shuttle here. You don't need to worry about hitting it. Uh, it's there to get better performance out of the vehicle. That's all. Isn't hydrogen lighter than air and would just go up? It's not that it's lighter than air, programmer. People people say lighter, lighter than air to kind of... It, it's easier to visualize it that way. Hydrogen gas is more buoyant than the gases that are naturally found in our atmosphere. That's the right way to say it. So, have you ever gone swimming in a pool, right? And you, you swim down to the bottom and you, you exhale and the bubbles go up. Why do they go up? Well, gravity is pushing the water down and keeping the water in your swimming pool, right? Gravity is pushing that water down, and because it's pushing that water down, it's compressing that air that you exhaled and forcing it up, right? Because it's less mass. It goes up. Because gravity is pushing down on the water. It pushes down on the water, the air goes up. It displaces it. That's a better way to, that's a better way to look at it. Hydrogen, since it's less mass, lighter than air, right? is getting displaced because nitro there's nitrogen and oxygen that you're breathing right now. You think that's air you're breathing now, right? Nitrogen and oxygen has more mass than hydrogen does. So the, the gravity is put gravity and the earth's magnetic field are pushing those gases down, mostly gravity though. And the hydrogen goes up. Same with helium. Come on, stop trying to hit me and hit me. Yeah. Hey, Drysden, 56-month resub. Thank you. We have ambient air mixing with it in Florida, so it's a different process of fueling with these fuels. Yeah, Cindy, it's uh, hydrogen. Pain in the butt. What if my lungs were full of perfluorobutane when I exhale? I, I, uh, explosions? Hi, last. Hello, Bess. How are you? Good morning, my first question. Why heat blankets are slightly different from each other? Is it because of different angle rotation at the gimbals? It's probably most likely because they had to do work on the engines and they just installed them a slightly different way. It's inconsequential, Baz, but yeah, good eye though. I know a lot of people that are more dense than nitrogen and lack oxygen to their brain. <laughs> I know what you mean, man. <laughs> when would the crew ingress? <laughs> uh, crew ingress would be done post fueling, Balxi. So, uh, the the crew would probably go in a like couple hours before launch, like they did with the shuttle. Do you want to do you watch Fab Rats YouTube? I'm gonna go meet the today. They're out of Utah. I've heard of the channel in the but I don't watch. What's on top of the rocket that looks like a light? Good question, Speed. That is a launch abort system. In the LAS, um, the launch abort system is attached to the capsule here. The capsule that's riding inside of this kind of um, oblong cone shape. So that's where people would be if they were going to launch people on this rocket. You know, because the crew access arm is right there and that would rotate into position. Um, the, launch is, the launch abort system is basically the ejector seat. Yeah, it's the ejector seat. Do you want to see what that looks like when it fires? I can show you the test footage. NASA has it up on their YouTube. 
This was a couple of years ago, the Orion AA-2 mission, where they tested the launch escape system. It was actually a pretty awesome little mission. What they did, what they did was they they took the launch escape system and they attached it to basically a counterweight that's the same same weight or mass, if you're speaking nerd, as Orion, and then they basically shoehorned an ICBM first stage. Yeah, an ICBM, a Minotaur first stage. Uh, behind that to get it to fly up in the air to mimic the, the launch abort conditions for SLS. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't the launch. This is a replay from a couple years ago, but it's actually a really funny looking rocket. Minotaur launch vehicle is carrying the AA-2 launch abort system for a full express test. Well, there's something you don't see every day. So this thing is designed to go up and mimic the conditions. It's designed to mimic the conditions that Orion would encounter on SLS. And it's funny because they literally did that by, once again, they shoehorned an ICBM first stage in here. It's a, it's a Minotaur first stage. That launched from Complex 46, which is at, at, at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, which is a ICBM t test site. They don't use it very much, but you get the idea. So. These lights up there, they're, the lights up there, they're not actually lights. Those are rocket motors. But the thing about it is that you don't want to shoot the rocket motors straight down to where the people are. That Rocket exhaust is not good for humans, to, to be pretty frank there. But my name's EJ. So they shoot the nozzles out to the side. It's actually a really cool system. Take a look. Watch. They'll, they'll trigger the aborter here in a moment, and those those engines will fire, and it pushes the flames out to the sides around the part where people are in. And then, up at the top, they have a, a solid rocket attitude control system that's going to flip the thing around. It's going to flip the capsule around to basically turn it and put the capsule in a nice safe descent so it can use its parachutes. See? See, the attitude control system right there... It's up at the front. It's You can see it pulsing. It's modulating the thrust to be able to turn the capsule around. And then once it does, the launch abort system will eject and it'll kind of like, kind of like poop the capsule out the back. Watch. Currently T -minus Watch down here. Ready? Two minutes and, counting. With an update on the liquid and that puts the capsule leak. on a trajectory where it can deploy its chutes. About a half hour ago. They're working a plan, getting ready to put a plan into effect here in one minute. They're going to manually warm up the liquid hydrogen line, which um, is connected it on is the other side of this core stage. The shot you're looking at, um, I can you show see you where picture. that checkerboard target is. That's a target that's put there so that the flight tracking cameras can understand the orientation of the vehicle in flight. You see it on the uh, core stage. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, boosters on the side as well. At any rate, right where that checkerboard is, on the other side of the vehicle is where the umbilicals connect the supply side for liquid hydrogen. And Why do they paint it orange? It's thermal insulation for the and propellant there's a plate, sliver. An interface. Um, it's a block goes one. From the ground switch. side to another plate on the vehicle side, on the inside, and there's not a on this rocket pad. Those two, and they got a spike in uh, hydrogen. It's from uh, this readings. white box right there. That caused an alarm to go off and stopped the flow of liquid hydrogen about 30 minutes ago. There's a cavity that's formed between the two plates. Yeah, the so they, side they, had, the they had a side. leak right in here. There's, so, there's all kinds of sensors on this thing to detect hydrogen leaks because if you leak too much hydrogen gas, well, um, Hindenburg... Yeah, they 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 very, be very careful with that. that. Update just the Hindenburg didn't end well, and this is using the same stuff, <laughs> or potentially it's making the same stuff. It's hydrogen gas everywhere. Is there a major difference between SLSs and, and Saturn V launch escape system? Yeah, more modern. Of that quick disconnect. Same idea though. Where they suspect the leak is. It, the foam can either be so orange or white, Lori. That connection after they stop. But you could paint it if you want. They did during the early shuttle flights. They've been warming it for the past half hour, allowing that to warm up. We're trying to get it to, to reseat guys, correctly. The cryo team, they say that that, uh, that allows it to uh, reseat once they Now, they, they use something different, Pigsy. They use the flaming trash can. 
and slowly uh, chilled liquid hydrogen that gas gets in there and that slow I think looks forlorn in temperature, but yeah paint paint's heavy um, paint adds weight that's right Basdon that you got it and that and, uh, eight inch QD right in, yeah you're right liquid hydrogen supply line that's the one they currently suspect is leaking we're going to get an update from the hydrogen team as soon as they have put this plan into work once they manually pre-chill that line which is now warm they're going to let the NASA test director know <laughs> yeah kill fun way. so stand by for that from what this is Artemis launch control from what Daryl was saying is that they didn't detect a hydrogen leak inside of the catch can from what he just said there's a there's a hydro, hydrogen gas is forming in a cavity here between the tail surface mast umbilical carrier plate and the main propulsion section um yeah, you, you don't want a lot of gas in there because if you if you compress too much hydrogen gas in there, the, the plate will pop off. It's a quick disconnect. It'll pop off with enough pressure. Uh, yeah, you don't want to do that. So they're heating up the tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate by stopping the flow of fuel. And they're going to try to get it back to near ambient temperature and then try filling it up again. Um, so... Yeah, we were talking about the launch abort system over here. The launch abort system in PigSig, I'm not 100% on the, what the cue ball is. You might have to refresh my memory. But the attitude control system on that launch abort system speed is actually really freaking cool. I, I, call, it the, uh, I call it the flaming trash can. I'll, I'll show you why. Uh, yeah, here. Here's the flaming trash can. This is the attitude control system that's built into the front of Orion's launch abort system. <laughs> flaming trash can. <laughs> Don't go near the flaming trash can. <laughs> flaming trash can what else are you gonna call it that it's built into that front nose cone right there and if you see it working it'll fl it flips the capsule over watch you'll see it pulsing see it up there <laughs> it's, it's flaming trash can that's hilarious yeah, that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to flip the capsule around and then poop the capsule out the back. Ready? Boop! <laughs> the cameraman's like, uh, alright. That'd make a nice burglar alarm? <laughs> yeah, maybe. But yeah, that's what that thing is up at the top. It's the ejector seat in case something goes wrong. Yeah. The cue ball was like the pitot tube at the end of it. Oh, uh, I, I'm not sure where the pitot sensor is on this thing, Pigzig, if there is one at all. I'm not 100% on that one. Yeah, that, that, the flaming trash can's name... Thank you, Thomas. The flaming trash can's name is the attitude control motor, the ACM. Uh, yeah, it, flaming trash can sounds cooler, though. Ejecto Cito, cuz! Ah, I love this button! <laughs> True, you know how much nitrous you would need? You know how much they would have needed to pressurize the nitrous tanks to be able to do that? It's almost like Too Fast, Too Furious was mildly unrealistic. Nah, whatever. Still a good movie, cuz. How does the attitude control motor work? Well, it's a solid rocket booster that has a bunch of... Well, here. Let me just... I'll show you the pictures. It's a pintle valve control system. Um, so... Basically what that means is... Discovery. Go at throttle this hat here is attached to an, SR, an SRM. And the solid rocket motor is pressurized in here. Right, and they have a bunch of solenoids that are controlling these exhaust valves. You like that, ladies? It's pretty good. Yeah, next, I'm pretty hyped. Yeah, it's a it's a pintle pintle valve control ACM nozzle or nozzle. 
nozzle arrangement. There, that, if you really want the technical name of it. Long story short, there's a bunch of little valves here and explosion is happening inside of this part and they open up the valves to get the explosion to go in a different direction. That's, that's the really simple way of doing it. That is the abort motor. The abort motor actually burns a bottom to top and exhaust comes out of those light things that the speed called it. They do kind of look like lights. If something goes wrong with a launch escape system or whatever it's called, be activated. Yes. Oh yeah. The, it's the ejector seat. You, you use it if something has gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. It looks a lot more complicated than I thought. Yeah, that's rocket science in a nutshell, Zanith. It's always more it's always more difficult than you think it is. How many scheduled countdown pauses left? One, Joan Cone. They will pause at T minus forty minutes. Uh, and that'll happen That'll happen about an hour before the count. There's a little there's a planned hold there. Uh, yeah. Has the LAS actually ever been required in a real-life situation that saved lives? Ozone? Once. Yes. A Soyuz, um, a Russian, or a Soviet at the time, Soyuz rocket has a launch abort system similar to this. Uh, actually, I can think of two times off the top of my head. In 1985, uh, they went. the Soviets went to launch some folks to their space station. Uh, I think it was to Mir. Uh, and for whatever reason, a fire broke out at the bottom of the pad. And the rocket started catching on fire when they lit the engines, like not in places that you want. And the launch escape system got the the cosmonauts away from the rocket before the whole rocket went pop. Yeah, yeah, good call. The second time I can think of a launch abort system actually being needed was actually fairly recent. The Soyuz MS-10 flight with um, Alexei Ovchinin and Nick Haig, a NASA astronaut, was flying up to the space station a couple years ago. And the Soyuz rocket, once again, went to separate its side boosters. And one of the boosters basically didn't, the, the jettison motor didn't work. So it separated and then aerodynamics forced it back into the core and damaged the, damaged the rocket. So the rocket basically stopped working on the way up. And before it popped, the launch abort system traction motors, the RDG traction motors on Soyuz, basically the abort system, got Nick and Alexei away from the rocket before it popped. Yeah. I watched that launch live on stream, and I'm like, oh, we may have just watched some people die. That's not good. Okay, they survived. Thank God. Uh, yeah, it, they, yeah, they almost popped. And it's funny because... Uh, they landed, Nick and Alexi landed out in the forest in Russia somewhere. And from what, from what we've been told, they got out of the capsule after it landed and they went, well, Nick was like, wow, that sucks. Man, we almost, uh, that was dangerous. And then the, the Russian, the Russian cosmonaut, Alexei Ovchinin got out and he said, huh, short flight. Discovery and then went about his, went about his day, went about his day <laughs> Try, trying to get the locator beacon set up so they could be found. Short flight. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's, dude, I don't know if that story's true or not. It might be. I'm pretty, that's, that, that, that reads correct. Yep. Yep. I've, I've talked to Russian cosmonauts before. I've interviewed them on stream before. And I was talking to Gennady Padalka, who's a very famous cosmonaut. I was talking to him about Soyuz, and I'm like, wow, Soyuz has been working for all this time. It's such a great capsule. It's it's a true workhorse of, of human spaceflight. And he looked at me and said, yeah, it's old. I'm like, all right. Do I? That sounds right. Yeah, Vasily, that, 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 that sounds like, a, that sounds like Alexei Ovchin. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, short flight. Yeah. <laughs> American components, Russian components, all made in Taiwan. That, that movie sucked, but it is pretty funny. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, the recovery beacon went, started going, Grilani, and that's, that's when I went, uh-oh. <laughs> Soyuz locator started going off, and I'm like, yeah, that's not good. MS-10 uses the art, yeah, it, 
it uses the secondary abort system, the RDG traction motors. So not the actual abort, but the backup to the abort system, Thomas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your Russian accent's actually legit. Yeah, yeah it's okay. For sure. Thanks, JSDN. I try to I try to have some fun with this stuff. It makes it easy. It makes it easier to communicate it. You know what I mean? Why do they pause hold? Can't that be scheduled into the original countdown? Delano, good question. Uh, there are planned holds because sometimes you have you run into snafus here, like the hydrogen leak. Uh, so it's good to it's basically good to give yourself a little bit of ample time in the countdown. Um. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah. That's that's why they do it. It's just because sometimes, like, you might run into a fueling problem, or an astronaut may have to go to the bathroom. I'm serious. There's there's toilets built into this thing on purpose. You think I'm kidding? They're up there. There's a bathroom up there. So if you want to take a leak before you go into space, yeah, no. And there's yeah, there, 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 that's definitely a thing. It, it could be. Ah, oh, I gotta take a leak. I'm serious. It's a buffer. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Tracking any issues? The port, they had a little bit of problems with that, with the uh, tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate, the hydrogen TSM. They're, yeah, here's the update. Teams are performing a manual liquid hydrogen fill after warming up the, the liquid hydrogen line. Okay. Sometimes you got to lighten the payload. That's right. There is a lost place. What's that moving knowledge? You're talking about Baikonur, aren't you? There's a lost place in Russia or Azerbaijan where you can see old Russian spaceships rotting away. So that's Baikonur. That's the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Yeah, those spaceships, the Russians didn't abandon. When the Soviet Union collapsed, they went into private hands. I'm sure. I'm sure they legitimately went into private hands. So some, some guy technically owns all those things and he's just letting them rot out there. The Russians actually want those damn things back so they can put them in museums. True story. I've been trying to get a hold of them. But yeah, the guy that owns them won't let them, won't let them go. He's just rather see it rot, which is really annoying. But yeah, that's at, that's at the launch site in, in Kazakhstan. Very nice. Yeah, that's true. They've been trying to get they've been trying to get all those things. You see them on the Urbex videos all the time on YouTube. So like Baldwin Bankrupt, for instance, pretty good YouTube channel. The, he did one where he went to the MIK building and saw Buran. Oh, my alarm's going off. It's time to wake up. <laughs> yes, of course it would be a car engine revving. Duh. Um, this is usually when I wake up. I've been awake for a little while. Uh, but yeah, the the orbiter that's there, Burya or it's the Russian word for little bird has been just like it, it a, a guy privately owns the space shuttle now how that like once again how that guy came into the ownership of government property is kind of sus but whatever they've been trying to get it back the Russians actually don't want it to sit there and rot <laughs> Is the hydrogen umbilical, is that the hydrogen umbilical that we saw on the screen? Yeah, Whitney, they're having some trouble with the tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate. It's not actually the catch can this time around. The, the carrier umbilical plate quick disconnect is actually pooling gas inside of it, and it's pulling the it's 8 TSM time here carrier plate the off of the vehicle. Florida. They had to stop. There's another leak. With NASA Communications, with an update. We are in the midst of tanking the core stage of the space launch system rocket he's actually kazaki he's a kazaki national mercy eastern yeah. time different country technically PM eastern time this is nasa's moon rocket that is going to send orion on a flight test I got it, around Porsche. the moon a little bit less than 38 days they drain the lines port not the this tanks. flight test intended to test yeah orion it kind of sucks but it is what at it is lunar return velocity get it around the moon, bring it back, test that heat shield, make sure it's safe for humans to use. We are currently working an issue with the liquid hydrogen loading. I'm listening to the launch team now.
So there was a leak that uh, developed in the liquid uh, hydrogen supply line at 7.15 this morning. So it did, we're running behind on loading liquid hydrogen at this point in the operation. We were scheduled to do the engine bleed kickstart. That's on hold. The team currently has a plan. It's more about checking the data, Juni, and figuring out why it failed and coming up with a solution. Yeah, that would that would be a problem. But they've already tested Orion's heat shield before on the EFT-1 mission in 2014. The flow is on the 8-inch quick disconnect, which is opposite a shot I do not we leak, have on the engines. Tessa, you leak. It's in the engine section, but it's the supply line. What you're looking at right now is actually the, the middle of the rocket where the GNT, GN2, which is liquid nitrogen, or gaseous nitrogen, rather, is supplied along with the hydrogen vent line. Here's the engine section on the opposite side, right where the checkerboard target is. is that the camera is uh, over here, to the, the, rocket, one that's, which the one that's on the has stream. A flight side so it's plate over here somewhere. A ground side it's one of those plate. guys. And the cavity in there, a uh, leak was detected on the 8-inch supply line of liquid hydrogen. I talked to Jeremy Graber, the assistant launch director. He says that uh, they saw a spike in uh, hydrogen gas in there. Now they're reconfiguring the system to minimize the leak and try to get back into hydrogen loading. Working they on it They allowed the connection to warm up a bit for about uh, very low hour Bruno. to 40 minutes. And then they are putting right now into effect a strategy to manually begin that hydrogen flow. This isn't slowly. Windows 7 back alley. Try to get that seal to reseat and cure that leak. That's currently in work, and that's the latest. It's that piece Meanwhile, right there. on the liquid oxygen side. The reason why he's talking like William Shatner is because he's listening to the he's listening to the NASA communications loop, and if they have something important to say, he's going to stop. Oh, just liquid, like uh, I'm stopping side, for they him. Are flowing currently at 32 percent full. They have slowed down their pumps because of a rule that requires you can't flow over 50 percent of the locks the tank. liquid oxygen to be in a certain proportion to the hydrogen. And you can see the graphic there. In fact, it's scrub for you to work this time. Yeah, oh, Lori. Mm -hmm. like Remember to get some food and water. I ate a lot of food before I started. I figured I ain't taking a lunch break today. You know what I'm saying? 32% <laughs> full on locks. They've slowed down their pumps because of the rule that says you can't get more than 50% locks See? in the tank before you've gotten 5%. 217, Benny. Uh, liquid hydrogen. PM. We're still a little ways out. And I do have confirmation now that... Uh, 10 minutes ago, sorry, 15 minutes ago, the team did There's start their the flow. Blade. You can see that represented on the graphic on the right-hand side. The measurement reflecting 2% Of course, back alley. I'll remember to go to the bathroom. On Thank hydrogen, you. <laughs> moving slowly and carefully. So why is this a so new issue? Did they do something different? Here. Let me listen to finish listening to Daryl, and then I'll tell you. For now, this is Artemis Launch Control. Okay, he's done. So, guys, why is there a leak again? Um, honestly, I don't, you know, ideally, you don't want to plan to have it leak again. But sometimes, sometimes, you go with what you know. So what does that mean? Well, when they tried the launch attempt on Monday, they tried automatic filling first and it leaked. And then they switched it to a manual fill mode and it worked. Sometimes that it makes sense to do the exact same thing that you did on Monday because they got past this point on Monday. So right now it would pay to do the exact same thing, don't you think? I mean, ideally NASA's not planning for a leak. They don't want a leak to happen, but but 
they might have put the rocket into the same mode, so to speak, as they did on Monday, because this is right now, that's what they know works. It's very possible that this was intentional. Because think, think about it, man. There's a rocket. This rocket has millions of moving parts. Do the exact same thing you did on Monday because it works. Even if that, you know, they switched to manual filling on Monday. They did that same thing. That's why I don't think, I think it'll work. I think they're going to initiate manual fueling and this thing will fill up with hydrogen. Because it's the exact same thing that they did on Monday. Don't change, don't change the routine if you know it works. Now, obviously down the road, they'll make adaptations to make it work on the first try. But in this particular scenario, you want to try to get the vehicle into the closest state that it was before, when they tried to launch on Monday, to get to the point where they scrubbed on Monday and hopefully pass that. You know, hopefully we see a launch, right? So it's very, it's, they, they may have done that on purpose. I'm not saying they did. I don't know for sure. I, they obviously don't want it to leak on the first try. But they, they know, NASA knows that manual filling does work because it worked on Monday. And the vehicle hasn't changed since then. It's still sitting there on the pad. Nobody's gone and messed with it. Only, they only mess with it to retorque the bolts on the flange to the same torque spec because it turns out when you take a bolt that's torqued to a certain specification and then you freeze it at like minus 400 Fahrenheit, it, it, it can stretch a little bit or contract. It, the torque spec won't be right. So they retorqued the bolts into the same configuration that they were in on Sunday before they launched on Monday. They did them. They did that yesterday and they, they, they basically mimicked the same exact scenario that they did on Monday. So like I said, the automatic filling is they, it, they probably knew it was going to leak. And they that's, once again, another reason why you have planned holds. They probably... I, I guarantee you now that the manual fix will work. It'll, it'll fill it. If it doesn't, that means somebody did something else to this rocket and put the vehicle into a different mode than what it was on Monday. Then you got problems. Then you got to go figure out what somebody did to it. It's like when people go mess with, a, mess with software that's been pushed to, a, to the server, right? And they didn't say that they did anything, so you don't know what's changed. Same exact thing, different config. Pain in the butt to fix. But everything that NASA does gets logged and recorded, and SpaceX as well. So they have, a, they have basically the change log for the vehicle, so to speak, if, to speak in software terms. Uh, so if nothing has changed and the vehicle's in the same mode that it was in on Monday, this should work. I can say that with a pretty high degree of confidence that it will start fill, filling. And they've gotten to 3% now that, I'm, now that, now that I've said that. The Kraken Force is strong. I was looking for a way to wreck stuff. Yeah, dead scum. It's almost like Kerbal is right for the wrong reasons. But yeah, putting the right... I've put many, many a launch pads in Kerbal into a failure mode that can cause the gnarly explosion. Yeah. Isolate variables. The bleed on engine three was the cause of the scrub. That's the only variable you change and you do everything else the same as before. Bingo. Anxious bingo. You got it. Nail on the head, dude. You, you landed on a rock? Oh no, Lori. <laughs> Yeah, Bear Rock, for the most part, the same configuration. You want to keep it as close as possible. So, they've gotten to... This number is slow going up. See, that's what I mean. Manual fill is working. We, I can tell just by these numbers. All right, Junk Cone. Like the Breaking Grounds Rock, I may need to get a refund after this unacceptable DLC. Maybe you need to practice your lunar landings. Lori, did you know that Neil Armstrong on Apollo 11 had that same problem? He saw that the LEM was going to take them down into some rocks, and he took manual control and manually piloted the LEM down to the surface for, on this first try. No revert. True story. That's just, dude, that, that happens, Lori. That happens. You're going to find rocks, and they're going to be in the way. It's not as unrealistic as you might think. They are manually filling at a much slower rate. We're going out to the moon. Test flight for the rocket and the capsule, Benny. There's no people on board, but it's an uncrewed test flight. This thing's going to the moon. We're going to moonshot today, hopefully. You're about to fly a 30 minute flight. Feels weird. Huh. Interesting, let's see. Again, the aft strut constraint 50% locks, 5% hydrogen. 
they're on target to uh, satisfy that constraint. Off topic, but why did NASA build so many launch pads at KSC and most of them weren't even used regularly for the past 50 years? They didn't. The Air Force did. Back alley. NASA has two launch pads at the Cape, 39A and 39B. The Air Force and now Space Force has like 50 of them. Missiles, missile testing. That's the reason. How long are these flights to the moon? Krasno, Orion's going to take... This one is a relatively low energy transfer for human space flight comparatively to Apollo. It's going to take about a week to get out there. And Orion's going to spend more or less two weeks out at the moon uh, orbiting around in a retrograde orbit around the moon. And then it's going to take about a week to get home. It's a 37-day mission total. Uh, very A long-duration flight. This is a big deal. It's a big flight. Big challenge here. Yeah, there you go, Roger. Yep. Can you explain the capacity difference between oxygen and hydrogen? Brad, that's a really good question. Sure, man. Yeah. Um, so, it's fuel ratio for the rocket engine. The, a lot of rocket engines run very fuel rich. Why would you run fuel rich? Well, if you run fuel rich, you can control the temperatures on the engine. That's one of the things that NASA does to make sure that these things don't melt when they go to fly them. Because it's just metal, right? But you have to find a way to cool the metal. One of the ways that they do that is to run extremely fuel rich. Now, in the case of the shuttle engine, what they do is they take the hydrogen, which is colder than the liquid oxygen, and see these kind of ridges on the motor? These, like, the ridges and the tubes that go up and down? Uh, inside of those ridges and tubes are cooling channels. So because the hydrogen is so ridiculously cold, they actually use that to cool the nozzle. So... The rocket is going to run a little more fuel rich. They're going to have a little more hydrogen than they do liquid oxygen. The other thing is that oxygen can be stored at a higher density than hydrogen. Uh, the reason why is because, well, it comes down to mass of oxygen and mass of hydrogen. If you have a hydrogen tank and you, you store it at a high density at high pressure... Well, long story short, because hydrogen gas is very small, very small molecule, uh, it would be like squeezing a sponge. So the hydrogen tank has to be a little bit bigger and they have to run a little bit more fuel. If you look at the relationship of hydrogen to oxygen, the hydrogen tank is like three times the size of the LOX tank. Liquid oxygen, however, is a much bigger, higher mass molecule. So you can pressurize liquid oxygen and it won't leak. It'll just increase the pressure. Round two, fight. What's up, Eagle? Do they have cameras inside of the Orion craft like SpaceX does? Motley, I'm not sure about an interior view that we could see. They definitely do. I don't know if they're going to show it to us. What I will tell you is that I, I have it on pretty good authority that, that Orion has some 4K live streaming cameras attached to it. And we will see those. Two of them are out on Orion's solar panels. So we'll have like basically a selfie stick view of the capsule flying through space. So I, I'm not sure if they're going to give us interior views. They might. If there were people on board, they probably would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's part of the reason why I'm, why I'm here. Why I want to I be here the entire day. I don't want to miss any of this. Because the, the selfie stick camera is what I'm waiting for, man. <laughs> Thanks, ladies. I'm, I'm glad you like it. I mean, fortunately, people here on Twitch take pretty good care of me. So, <laughs> I would love to if, if, if big big news would have me on there. But on paper, I'm like, because I'm self-taught on paper, I don't know anything about rockets. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you for being here all day. It's my pleasure, whoever. Yeah, my pleasure. I love this. is great, man. I love this. This is this is sweet. Look at this. I mean, look at this. look at this thing. Are you kidding me? This is unbelievable. That's a thirty-story building worth of rocket. It's a skyscraper launching into space. This is great. This doesn't happen every day. Maybe soon, though. Am I right? Yeah. I would love to see a 4K Earth rise. We will, Susie. We will. If this thing goes. Oh, we're going to see it. Guys, it looks like that slow, fill man the slow manual fill, like I said. Go with what you know. That looks like it's working. They've gotten up to 4%. There's now 21,000 gallons of hydrogen inside of the hydrogen tank. But look. See what I'm talking about? 
So that was a really good question asking about different tank sizes and fill rates and stuff. Look at how big that hydrogen tank is compared to the liquid oxygen tank. The hydrogen tank is three times, it has to be at least three times as big. I have a vision of going to the moon. Oh, Eagle, that sucks, man. <laughs> Other than the capsule, how much of this rocket is reusable? Carl, unfortunately, only the capsule is reusable. I know, I know. Uh, dude, it, it kind of bugs me that they're putting shuttle engines. They're going to Viking funeral some shuttle engines. But you know what? For lunar missions, I'll trade it. When you go to the moon, man, you, you, it's really hard to do fully reusable. And Elon Musk will tell you that. It's really hard to go full reusable and try to get out of low Earth orbit. Over on the core stage, even the SRBs. Currently at four percent. That's right, Vixen. Annual fill at the moment. No, Laurie, I'm a 3D artist by trade. Gallons in. Yep. This tank is. Most yeah, of Cindy. The core stage, five hundred thirty-eight. Yeah, uh, Cindy, I, I'm a big shuttle guy. I love the space shuttle. Uh, it, it is amazing. It's one of the most amazing pieces of equipment humanity has ever devised by a long shot. Don't get me wrong. This is good, too. I like this. And the only time I'd be the only time I'd ever be cool with expending shuttle parts on purpose would have either been for shuttle C if that ever happened or this. I will trade shuttle parts for boots on the moon. That's fine. But also, it does hurt. It does hurt. The casings are leftover shuttle parts. The engines are leftover shuttle parts. The service module propulsion system is leftover shuttle parts. It, it really sucks. But I'll trade it for boots on the moon. That's fine with me. Takes over for manual, goes into auto. So we'll wait uh, confirmation yes, of that. How'd you In know? the meantime, the rest of the launch team has been configuring uh, the rocket for launch, including the upper stage, what's called the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. They might shy, I'm not sure. Preparing that for fill. They've established communications. And, exactly, Cindy, uh, I'm with you on that one. To get Agreed. That ready. You can see from this shot here, the ICPS, which runs from Better than the sitting around. the conical section. Oh no no no, Forlorn, you're confused. I don't want the shut. I, I, I don't want the shuttle engines no sitting around off. either. I want them flying because the space shuttle should still be flying. Yeah, I said it. I I mean, shuttle could do lunar architecture. No, the shuttle can't get to the moon. This isn't some fake stuff like for all mankind. No, it can't get to the moon. The shuttle could build vehicles in orbit like the ISS that could get us to the moon with better propulsion systems. That's what it was supposed to do, but they never did it, which is kind of annoying. But if we can't do that, this is the next best thing. That's fine with me. But again, the, the liquid hydrogen team. Hey, Meeps. Eight month resub. Working a, a plan to. Well, Starship moving knowledge is basically Shuttle 2.0. That's fine with me. I'll take that. Side. This is Artemis launch control. If NASA wants to build Saturn V style rockets and SpaceX wants to take a stab, t throw their hat into the ring with fully reusable by making Starship into a space shuttle, that's fine with me. That, see, that, that, that gets us the best of both worlds. We have something like the Space Shuttle that's way better than the Space Shuttle and something like the Saturn V that's way better than the Saturn V. You, don't, you, don't, you guys don't understand. Everybody wins. I, I'll take this. That's fine with me. I'm greedy, man. I want more rockets, not less. Yeah, Tesla, for sure. Yep, yep. I can watch the rockets after launch from your front yard. That's cool. She was originally, she was originally designed for 100 missions. I want my 100 missions. Yep. Yeah, I know. I'm with you on that one. Yeah, they get along just fine, Cindy. In fact, actually, NASA extended the SpaceX's commercial crew contract to include, like, a significantly more amount of Dragon missions to the ISS through 2030. Uh, it's a $1.4 billion contract. So to say that NASA and SpaceX don't get along is, yeah, categorically false. One point, a $1.4 billion contract would very much disagree with you. And this view also is great, Barnes. Yeah. I thought yesterday was the next launch window. No, only 1D. They moved it to Saturday. Without the shuttle, can we build another ISS? This thing would, be, this thing would build a great space station, Quack. But it would be more like Skylab. Less like the ISS. 
or Starship. Starship could build a really nice station. NASA has actually plans for several different types of commercial stations to to uh, fly in the future. It's called the Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations Program, or CLEOD for short. Really cool program. They're gonna they're not gonna replace the ISS with another ISS. They're gonna replace the ISS with a bunch of small commercial space stations, which is actually that's cool. That's fine. That's pretty neat. Hey, Hibbit, what's going on? Does the ground shake with all that thrust lifting that unit off the ground? Yes, ladies, absolutely. The vibrations from the rocket that, that come off during liftoff are so bad, they actually have to spray the pad down with water to dampen the vibrations because the, the vibrations reverberating off the ground from the rocket launch can damage the rocket on the way up. True story. Happened during the first shuttle mission. The vibrations from the SRBs were so loud that they reverberated off the ground and shook tiles off of the shuttle. Oh yeah. The rocket can damage itself from the sound that it makes. The ISS has been being extended moving out to 2030, from what I understand. Yeah, they are making use of it. Best, best be, you know, paid a lot of money to put that thing up there. Okay, we see gaseous oxygen coming out of the forward skirt of the core stage right there. That gaseous oxygen vent line is the gaseous vent line for the oxidizer tank. Uh, you, you don't want to vent liquid. You don't want to vent gaseous hydrogen overboard like this. That's because it'll explode. But I don't think anybody's going to scoff at venting oxygen into the atmosphere. So that's why it's just a straight open line like that. You can see that even that gas that's coming out of there is extremely cold from the ice accumulation on the forward skirt right there. Oh yeah. Joe, yeah, those, they didn't, nobody knew how crazy these SRBs can actually get until they actually launched them. Launched them, excuse me. Do you think using Starship as a fly anywhere to 30 minutes text is the next revolution from commercial aviation? It could be, back alley. Depends. Stuff takes time. Everybody thought in the 30s that dirigibles were the future. And then the Hindenburg happened. So who knows? Who knows? I don't know. I feel like the ISS is going to be around for a long time. Na NASA, in their last authorization act, quack, so basically funding, they funded it out to 2030. So yeah, the ISS is going to be with us for a little while. Uh, Dan, weather is looking at 60% favorable at the beginning of the window, and it's going to only go up from there to 80% favorable by the end of the launch window. So if something, if this thing doesn't go today, it ain't going to be because of weather. Where'd you put my coffee? I didn't I didn't get coffee, Re. I put your food on the coffee maker so you make the coffee. What is the oxygen vent throughput? I don't know what its flow rate is. Vix, it's just venting gas basically at the rate that they're filling up. Sorry, I'm working coffee right now. Damn it, Leroy, where's the coffee? Diet Coke! Yeah, that's not true, Forlorn. Actually, the new guy that the new guy that uh, that's running Roscosmos because the other guy uh, stopped running Roscosmos. The new guy that they have, I think is I think his name's Yuri Borzimov. He's actually pretty good. He's vowed to keep uh, basically rule eight for Roscosmos, just like NASA, which is actually that's a step in the right direction, man. Not man, but you get the idea. EJ, how do you feel? I feel fine, Forge. Yeah. I knew, the guys, the second they had a leak from the automatic filling systems, I knew they were going to switch to manual, and I knew manual fill would work. I'm pretty confident in SLS right now. That's the same behavior that you saw from the vehicle on Monday. That behavior is well understood, which means launch, launching, uh, the probability of launching is favorable. Do you need coffee? Um, what's Rule 8? 1D, Rule 8 is my rule against, like, political rhetoric in here. I don't really like talking about politics. The only real politics that I get into is politics of space flight policy, so like what NASA's doing, because NASA's what NASA is governed to do with SLS is technically law. So that's all I divulge into, but I don't really cover political issues. There's plenty of political streamers out there and pundits on Twitch that talk about politics, and guess what? I'm not one of them. 
<laughs> I will talk to you about space flight. You know what I'm saying? Are you going to be live streaming till launch? That's right, Dan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back alley. Sure. There's plenty of people that talk about that, and I ain't one of them, man. <laughs> yeah, Bobby, there, there was. it's a little more of a complicated story than that, but yeah. It, it's actually pretty cool. The The new guy that's running Russia's space program, his name's Yuri Borzimov. He has specifically vowed to keep politics out of their space flight program, just like NASA keeps politics as much as they can out of their space flight program, which is good. That's cool. I'm cool with that. That's fine. Yeah, exactly, 1D. Every, you know, like... So I like dealing with engineering, dude. You know why I like dealing with engineering? Because engineering's about numbers. It's about numbers and physics. And guess what? The laws of physics are not open to interpretation. And in that regard, engineering is really easy to understand because there's people that are wrong and there's people that are right. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's really easy to draw the line and say that this rocket did not work correctly because it blew up or it did work correctly because it flew into space. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's why I like sticking with engineering because it's not necessarily open to interpretation as much. It's not as much of a social construct as it is a, a mathematical construct. M much easier to understand. <laughs> At least for a bonehead like me, you know? Mustang, Camaro, Challenger. Mustang. Yeah, only 1D, yeah, I mean, the, the, the practical physics, though, doesn't change. It's when you start getting into speed of light, string theory, quantum stuff, that's when start stuff, stuff starts getting a little bit weird. But also, at the same time, I don't deal with quantum physics on here. We deal with practical physics, so, yeah, it stays pretty straightforward, you know? The laws of physics don't have a complaint department, you're dang right. Engineering's about building cool stuff. Sanchez, are you excited? Me too. Make physics great. Jeez. Come on now. Just join. What's the situation with Artemis? Uh, they had a leak from the hydrogen umbilical again, Def, but I think that was induced on purpose. Uh, they've initiated manual fill mode on the hydrogen tank and are currently tanking the vehicle. They are in slow fill on the hydrogen right now and fast fill on the locks. The next update we should be getting is fast filling the liquid hydrogen. Uh, when we get go for fast fill, that's... Yeah, that's, that's good. Also, gophers. Newton is still good enough for most daily use. Indeed, Simon. Yep. Zanvort quality in 30 minutes. Yeah, I'll have that up on the other screen, dude. When you get really small, really cold, or really fast, that's when physics break. Yep, yep. I deal with the more practical applications, Altio. Absolutely. I got my Duncan today, Illness. Did you know that there's an Artemis real-time orbit website? Yep, yep. So, once again, they're still in... S Hold on. 32,000. Is it going up? Yep. Yep. The sensor read 429 for a second. Yep. They're in slow fill. They're slow filling the hydrogen manually. The next step here is to transition to fast fill. Now, there is a thing here with uh, tank pressurization and structure. There is a constraint that the LOX tank can't go over 50% filled if there's nothing, if there's nothing in the hydrogen tank. So... We should see NASA start to fast fill the hydrogen here. What's the locks? Hold on. What's that locks number doing? I got to look. Give me one second. 778. Yep. It looks like they started slow filling. They started slow filling liquid oxygen because that number over there can't get over 50 if that number is in single, single digits. The reason why is because if the locks tank gets too heavy, it can crush the hydrogen tank. The hydrogen tank needs to be filled. It's the pressurization thing I was telling you guys about. So it looks like they initiated slow fill of the LOX tank to let the hydrogen tank catch up. Once the hydrogen tank goes into fast fill and that number gets into the double digits up there, that's when they'll start fast filling LOX again. Hey, WD-40, what's up? Yeah, Shy, of course. Do you have a video to show us from Kerbal, Simu Kerbal Space Program, a simulation of liftoff? I mean... Actually, I don't, Dan, but I have built SLS and Kerbal before. T-minus five-ish hours. How long does it take to fill this thing up? Uh, 1D, if they get into fast fill, uh, I don't know, an hour? Maybe? Maybe an hour, hour and a half, something like that? 
that's kind of crazy when you think about it because these rocket this rocket has more liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen in it than an, an Olympic swimming pool has water. To be honest with you, that is insane amount. That is an insane amount of liquid being moved. Oh, hold on. Counting here at the Kennedy Space Center, getting an update from the LHY team. They're currently discussing uh, some problem solving. They uh, have their liquid hydrogen line in manual fill after a leak developed an hour 15 ago in the 8 inch QD line that supplies the liquid hydrogen. QD it's is just quick on the disconnect. opposite side of that checkerboard target on the core stage. Engineers are discussing plans wait, to wait a couple hours. Raise sure. that level to fast fill. I'll have more on that in a second. Stand by. Yeah, we're really waiting. What we want Daryl to say here, the NASA PAO that's doing the communication on this cast, what we really want him to say is that NASA's transition to fast fill. If they get into fast fill for the hydrogen, then yeah, then we're good to go. What's that, Forge? Yep, there's your cumulus clouds right there from Trevor. Trevor Malman is a launch photographer, guys. Yeah. Oh, I got a message. Might be important. That is a cumulus cloud right there. Yep, yep. Big cumulus cloud. Cloud cover today goes from two to ten thousand feet. I think uh, that's pretty much what the weatherman was saying, or the weather woman in this in this case. That's not an anvil cloud. It's not. It it hasn't formed up top. An anvil cloud would be kind of hourglass like. That's a cumulus cloud. Is that within the rules? Yep, absolutely. It's a great shot by Trevor for sure. Answering that message. the clickety clack noise I kind of do too it's, it's good uh, it's progressing okay drummer they had to initiate manual fill uh, on the hydrogen line because they had that leak again but I'm, I'm pretty sure that leak was induced on purpose because they wanted to make the launch campaign as similar to the launch campaign on Monday because this part of the launch campaign on Monday was technically successful. So go with what you know, right? Don't change anything on the vehicle. I'm pretty sure they induced the hydrogen leak from automatic filling on purpose. Right now, NASA is trying to reseat the valve. They've gone into replenish mode on the LOX tank because the LOX tank can't go over 50% 50 full here, but if the hydrogen tank is in single digits, so they've initiated a replenish mode, which means that you're not going to see any increases on that number. They are currently slow filling liquid hydrogen into the hydrogen tank here uh, and confirming more or less that it's not leaking. The manual fill will work. I, I, I'm pretty dang sure. Unless somebody changed something, which I'm pretty sure that didn't. Uh, but once they get up above like 10% here, they'll initiate fast fill. Hydro they just initiated fast fill. That number is going up like crazy. No, it's actually flipping back and forth. That's still a slow fill right there. This is in replenish mode, so that number should just kind of fluctuate up and down. Two seventeen, Ryan. Still. Yeah. Yeah. See, they see that vent's really working. 
they, they're really working. They're switching it into a replenish mode because that te you don't want to go above 50% because that'll start doing funny things to the structure of the vehicle. The, the rule is 50% over 5. Yeah, Mappy, that sounds right. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say single digits, but yeah, you're probably correct. The NASA folks must be stressed over this. Yeah. Looking, it's you don't... Right Here's the thing. <laughs> don't get mad at it. <laughs> don't get stressed out. Don't get mad at it. Work the problem. That's launch direction, launch control, flight control, flight direction 101. Just figure out what's wrong. There's no need to freak out. Just be very concise and clear in what you do. And keep your game face. It's, you know, you don't want to do anything stupid. Hey, what's he? Three month resub. Thank you. Yeah, you, when you're dealing with, when there's this much on the line, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and say that the people in control aren't a little stressed out, but. Yeah, exactly, 1D. You gotta take your time with this. You gotta be clear and concise. You don't wanna put the rocket into an inadvertent failure mode. Even if you put it into a failure mode and it launches and it still works, that's not good baseline data. Remember, this is a test flight. Discovery, go at throttle up. Sorry, I'm talking to one of my buddies here. Oxygen is venting out the top there, guys. They're in a replenish mode, so that vent is going to be working overtime to... Uh, that vent's going to be working overtime to make sure that the tank is, stays in 50% topped off... Con well, 50% topped off configuration. It's not topped off, obviously, because it's at 50%, but they're basically stopping it right now, and the LOX is going into replenish. Okay, another try. Did they save the last filling, and do you know how much one fill filling is worth in dollars? Asking for a friend. Um... It's middle off. Um... So, Stefan, first of all, if you want to get my attention, just tag at EJSA in chat. If you don't tag me, I'm going to assume you're not talking to me just because there's a lot of you guys here today. And I'm trying my best to keep up with chat. Uh, I'm trying to the best of my ability. So, um, I'm not sure what you mean, did they save the last filling? They're, they're working on filling it up right now. It's slow. They're slow filling the hydrogen. This number is slowly going up. That one is kind of in replenish. And it... it See how they're, it's slowly going up as well? Um, it looks like NASA's deemed acceptable to go above 50. Well, that's still in the single digits. That's fine. Uh, they're slow filling the hydrogen. So this filling is still going. It's just going slow right now because NASA wants to take the time and make sure that it's working how they think it's working. It's really important. There's nobody, there's nobody here that can go and look at the rocket other than like with cameras, right? So the launch director is three miles that way. You know, they can only see what the computers can tell them. And, you know, you can't just send a person out here to go and, you know, hit it with a hammer if it doesn't do what you want it to do, right? So, in terms of saving this filling, yeah, they're doing what they can from the launch control center. 
uh, and it looks like everything is going okay. Guys, if, if, if this was going wrong, they wouldn't be topping, they wouldn't be filling up, they wouldn't be slow filling that LOX tank. If something was going weird with the hydrogen tank, they wouldn't be doing that. The requirement, the requirement is LOX under 50 if LH2 is under 5. There you go. There you go, Devlin. Yeah, I said single digits, but 50 and 5 is what we're looking for. Thank you. Somebody else said that too. I just wanted to be sure. I think you met as recovered from the last try. Last time, it didn't lift off, so I wanted to know if they saved the fuel for another try. Long story short, Stefan, yes. But with these cryogenic fuels, you can scavenge it, but these fuels, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, really like to evaporate. Look at these temperatures. That ain't the temperature outside. In Florida, it's, it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit in Florida. And I know, I know, I know, I know. I can't go two seconds without mentioning Fahrenheit without somebody saying, why isn't it centigrade? So you want centigrade numbers? It's 25C in Florida right now. Hydrogen is at uh, 271C, minus 271C, and liquid oxygen is 170C. There's a huge temperature differential there. So, Stefan, the, the propellants, because they're so cold and they don't want to be cold, we're making them cold, in a really in a really warm area right or basically anywhere at sea level is pretty dang warm comparatively to those numbers the propellants do evaporate and they boil off uh, they they boil off and they evaporate out and they have to vent them so you do lose some propellants every time some of it just evaporates or boils off every time you go to tank the vehicle they got most of the propellant out from the last try in terms of cost <sighs> I don't know. Um, if I had to ballpark it, the cost of filling up SLS with, with fuel is, I don't know. I, I would throw a ballpark guess like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, something like that. that. That is a guess. I want to be very clear. I'm not NASA. I don't know. That sounds about right. That tracks right. Two, two to three hundred grand. Yeah, that's not the expensive part. Comparatively, the rocket costs billions of dollars to make. Yeah, fueling it up is nothing. Why isn't the fuel in liters? Because frick your measuring system, PY. That's why. Level sensing cryo cryogenics is really interesting problems. You, can use, you can't use hydrostatic pressure because they are compressible. Yeah, yeah, pray. Pain in the butt. That's a bad guess. I think the fuel cost of a Falcon 9 is above a million. No, that's a bad guess. Fuel cost for Falcon 9 is like 200,000. Falcon. Oh, well, okay, then frick yours. All right, cool. Then we're on the same page. <laughs> we're on the same page then. <laughs> frick your system. No, frick your system. All right, cool. We're even. <laughs> Rip. Did they figure out what went wrong last time? And are they sure it's not going to happen again? Dan, they did figure out what was going on. The engine actually did chill down. They did bleed the engine successfully. They just weren't really sure. They weren't 100% sure if they did because there is two sensors, basically a temperature sensor, to sense whether the engine is down to the right temperature and primed and full of fuel. Uh, if it's the right temperature, that means it's full of fuel. Right, because it has to be well. Till 8 the bleed has to show Space that. Center in Florida, uh, looking at one of the sensors wasn't uh, reading correctly, and they had to be sure it was a bad sensor. Oxygen from but yeah, the it should go fine. Stage tank. I'm doing good. Smoke Midway up the rocket. That's a good sign right there. The liquid uh, oxygen, currently at 56 percent filled, is going well. Interesting, Prey. Over on the liquid hydrogen side, teams are working to fix a hydrogen leak on the flow there and they have got uh, the launch director to sign off on a troubleshooting plan and, and here's what it is they are going to uh, do a stop flow on the liquid hydrogen side uh oh they're going to close the vehicle fill and drain valve to keep and yeah you know, it's not that much stefan Comparatively to like how much the, the ground costs. transfer line with helium, and attempt to reseed a QD oh. where the leak is. That QD, it's a quick disconnect. It's on the supply side. If we go down to the engine uh, shot, that's the location 
where it is. They put pressure on that line in an attempt to try to get that 8-inch QD yeah, connection Yeah, but Devlin, they make, they make commodities on site, They believe Devlin. that um, the seal that's inside... Why it's, that's why it's not as expensive. The, the vehicle... NASA the makes the liquid plate, oxygen down the street. Exactly I've seen the plan. Exactly on the opposite side of um, the Security course. Security gifted us up to Delano. There, right there where you see that uh, checkerboard target huh. for tracking purposes. Okay. This is the uh, plan that they have in place, again, to try to try to stop a, a leak, which they have seen um, some indication that it continues to leak when they raise, raise the press, pressure on the liquid hydrogen. So, okay, to build off of what Daryl was saying right there. Um, That's the latest. Stand by. So to build off of what Daryl was saying, the, the hydrogen is leaking out of the quick disconnect. Now, I, I, once again, I can't say this enough. I know what people are going to say. What do you mean? NASA can't make a damn fuel line work correctly? What the heck's that about? Well, physics, physics, yeah, that's the problem. Hydrogen is really freaking cold, and you're always going to get some leakage. There is a catch can system that is designed to catch the leaks at the point where they're flowing fuel. Hydrogen likes to evaporate when you flow through fuel lines. It really, it really likes to. And if you get ha hydrogen gas, you don't want that leaking too much. That happened in the 30s with a with a dirigible. It leaked hydrogen gas. Thing about hydrogen gas is that if you don't give it a place to explode, it's going to find a place to explode. So that catch can is catching the leak, and there is always going to be a little bit of a leak because the hydrogen will always evaporate in some way, shape, or form. Now, it's not to build off of what Daryl said, it is leaking, but it's leaking at too high of a rate. It's leaking too much. But the catch can and the scavenging system to and the purge flame is catching the leak. It's just not leaking at the rates that they want. Discovery, go and throttle up. It always is going to leak. Security, five month resub, thank you. And then security gifted the sub to Barney of the Rubble. <laughs> nice. Thanks, man. I'm not sure, Shy, to be honest with you. The seals on the lines get brittle, Paul, and that's why it leaks. It seems like one of the seals isn't seating correctly, so it's leaking too much. It's always going to leak, guys. That's why they have a catch can. It always will leak. That's just physics. You can't beat that problem. Hydrogen is too cold. <laughs> it freezes things. Hey, Elro. So what Daryl said there is that NASA is going to flow hydrogen, uh, not hydrogen, they're going to try to purge the line with helium and try to get the valve to seat. Why? Now, why use helium over hydrogen? Well, helium is kind of, believe it or not, it's kind of close. It's a distant relative of hydrogen, almost. Like, if you look at, like, on the periodic table where helium is, it's like a distant cousin. Hydrogen team updating S oh. the NASA test director that they are go to proceed with the Raising the pressure to reseat that hydrogen supply yeah, I agree. line That's QD. They said they're going to hit it with helium to try and reseat the yeah, valve. They're probably going to do that because helium is a little bit easier to work with. And uh, it, it's kind of similar, like a distant cousin of hydrogen. That and helium is, is used in the pneumatic systems on a lot of rockets anyway. Um, so they're going to try to purge out the line with helium. Uh, in it, it to not they're, they're, I can guarantee you the reason why they're doing that is because they don't want to waste too much hydrogen remember with the hydrogen you've got to top off because it always evaporates it always will you're going to flow it through a fuel line evaporation leaks you're going to flow it into the rocket evaporation leaks it happens I do not leak you leak so they don't want to keep topping off they don't want to keep topping off the hydrogen they don't want to keep slow filling it because they're burning off too much hydrogen they don't want to empty the fuel tank that's designed to fill the damn rocket. They always want to leave enough extra fuel inside of the hydrogen cryo tanks that are over there. Or actually, if the rocket is relative this way, they are over there. The locks is that way. Uh, they don't want to use up too much hydrogen. So in case the rocket scrubs, they want to have enough fuel to be able to quickly, to, to basically do this again. So they're going to try to seat that valve or seat the seal inside of the tail service mass carrier umbilical with helium now because they have more helium than they do hydrogen. Is there a valve that they close upstream when they push the helium? Can some of the helium get into the tank? Um, 
Yeah, security, you can have helium get into the tank. That's really not a big deal. Uh, as long as you purge it out with hydrogen a little bit later. Nice, Bri. Yeah, that'd be pretty good, Forge. Something like that, Will. I think it's five to six, but five to six fuel the oxidizer, or six to five. I, I'm not 100% sure. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I'd have to go look it up. Helium is also inert compared to hydrogen. Yeah, mm-hmm. Boil off the bane of many uh, realism overhaul missions. Indeed, Bobby. Yep. The helium is heavier. Will it stay at the bottom? Mm, if it's in gaseous form and the hydrogen is in liquid form, no. It'll get displaced and it'll, per it'll go out the scavenging system. Hey, 2020. Have they done this before? Uh, Dan... Yeah, of course. Yeah, with the shuttle. Yeah, they've done stuff like this. Shuttle had these problems, guys. But th the thing is, with the space shuttle, the quick disconnect, the carrier umbilical was a little bit different because it was attached to a space shuttle and not the core stage. So they had these problems figured out with the shuttle. Now, SLS is a shuttle-derived vehicle. It is using a lot of similar components to the space shuttle. But it's not a space shuttle. It's a different vehicle, different configuration. So... Different vehicle, different configuration. You're going to run into teething problems. They have, th This did happen with the shuttle, but they figured it out. They figured out ways around it. And SLS has never launched before. NASA right now is currently trying to figure out ways around it. That's, dude, this is what happens. This is space flight, man. You're going to get, you're going to get problems. Murphy's Law is a pain in the butt when it comes, when it, in the application of rockets. It's a real, it's really annoying. <laughs> But uh, you got Murphy's Law is what can go wrong will go wrong. So being a flight controller is about being able to improvise, adapt, and overcome over the challenges that you're presented. It's really cool. It's a really inspiring thing, if you ask me. That's correct, 2020. It's a moonshot. It's the first moonshot with a human-rated spacecraft that NASA has done in, 20, in 50 years. Yeah, you don't want to miss this. Are we trending towards a scrub? No. It's kind of 50-50 right now, Limprod. I Actually, I'd say 60-40 in terms of trending towards a scrub. 60% in favor of launch. Of course, Forlorn, that's right. Leaks on any complicated machinery are inevitable. But, see, that's the thing. SLS leaks, it always is going to leak. That's how you know it has fuel in it, obviously. It's like a helicopter, or in my case, my automobiles. If it's leaking oil, well, that's a good indicator that it's got oil in it, okay? Okay, when it stops leaking oil, that's how you, that's when you should, that's when you should be worried because that means it has no oil in it. True story. Is that wood? It's spray on foam insulation, Horsu. It's foam insulated, foam insulated material that was sprayed on. Also, yeah, Geeson, that trailer is sweet. I want it, by the way. The best way is to say the leak rate is outside of what's acceptable. Exactly, Prey. That, yeah, what I explained it a second ago, that's what I said. It's the rate of leak that's the problem. Because hydrogen always leaks. Always. It always will. Because physics. You know, asking hydrogen not to leak is like asking water to not be wet. It's like, oh, how dare you be wet water? What's wrong with you? How dare you not leak hydrogen? What's wrong with you? No, no, it's always going to leak. It's the rate of leak that's the problem. Uh, weather, uh, Ryan, if it's going to scrub today, it ain't going to be because of the weather. We have cumulus cloud rule in effect, so you have cloud cover from 2,000 to 15 or er, to 10,000 feet. Uh, for the Euro folks, that's like 700 to 3,000 3, meter. Um, uh, winds are due east. Uh, 8 to 12 knots, which is 9 to 10 miles an hour, or 9 to 13 miles an hour, uh, or what is it, 12 kph to 18 kph. Not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, very favorable weather conditions today. Uh, sorry, 2020. If you freeze water, it is not wet. If you freeze hydrogen, the universe has divided by zero, PY. 
If you get solid hydrogen, you got a big problem. <laughs> you got a big problem. <laughs> hey, Mogoonie, what's going on? Uh oh, Bobby. <laughs> the difference between. As a task leads to get it done, but with NASA, everybody thinks they are in charge. Yeah, Rice, you, you say that, and I get it, stick it to the man, I, I understand, but it, it, to not have hydrogen leak in a rocket, in rocket science, in the application of using hydrogen as a commodity for your rocket, to not have it leak means you've somehow found a way to break physics. It's not NASA, it's physics, man. It doesn't matter. SpaceX runs, in, SpaceX runs into this problem with methane as well. You have to vent the methane into a purge flame or a recondenser, and it does leak. It happens. Remember SN4? It leaked a lot, and then the whole thing blew up. Yeah, anybody remember that one? Yeah. Th this is a physics problem, guys. It's not, it's not NASA. <laughs> this, I, I can't stress that enough. So the SLS is similar to like the SR-71. It always leaks for the same problem, kind of. Ah, Creeper, the SR-71 leaked for other reasons. But it, it, hydrogen is always going to leak. It leaks in Delta IV. It leaks on Atlas V. They just don't really talk about it because it's... Once again, saying that hydrogen leaks happen in the applications of rocket science is like saying water is wet. It doesn't need to be reiterated. People, People... People know water is wet, but people don't know that hydrogen always leaks, which is why I'm telling you about it. Does that make sense? Why don't we just put plasma shields on rockets? Then the hydrogen can't leak. It's really that simple. Oh, yeah. Mogoni, do it then. Please. That would help us all. That would be really nice. If it didn't leak, there's nothing in it. Indeed, Nuggets. Can we even have a recondenser for hydrogen? You could, T-Man. A little complicated, though. The blame diagram is broken. I can't, I don't have the money. Oh, okay. Do they reuse the fuel for other things when scrubbed? Well, they reuse the fuel to, to launch the rocket again, cuzzy. But yeah, it, like, it, they could take the liquid hydrogen out of this and use it on Atlas's pad, sure, of course. All you need is a tanker truck. How we looking? Eh, they're having some problems with that, the, the TSMU hydrogen's uh, eight inch quick disconnect. It's not seating correctly, Phil. Why no electric rocket? Um, energy density, for the most part, is the problem there. Prot, it's kind of similar. So, like, what you say? Like, first of all, I don't know how we would propel a rocket with electricity unless we like shoot ionized gas through an electrical arc, which is what electric thrusters do in space. But the thing is, is that oh, time to wake up. The thing about that is. Uh, You're, you need a big battery to do something like that. Too big of a battery. Chemical rockets are still the best way to do it by a long shot. Yeah, of course, Prey. Yeah, it's an 8-inch stainless steel quick disconnect. Yep, yep. Did they retorque it after Monday? They did. Yeah, I know, Excessum, right? <laughs> it's not... You can... Yeah, you can... You can make hydrogen. Yep, yep. I forget how you do it, but it, yeah, you can do it. You can make hydrogen gas. We'd need the Tesseract, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that, Nuggets. Yep, yep. Hey, Thorn. Hello from Vermont. Hello. What other choices of fuel could they use for this? Or is that the way it is because of the components they are using? It's because of hydrogen, hydrogen dead scum. Yeah, that's why they have leak problems. But hydrogen gives you the best performance, so all these problems that you get from it pay off because hydrogen is the most efficient it's the most efficient pro chemical propulsion system that we have hydrogen is like twice as efficient as using kerosene in a rocket literally twofold efficiency and you don't need to worry about carbon emissions when there's no carbon in the equation there's oxygen and hydrogen in fact the exhaust from the SR, from not the SRBs, from the sh shuttle main engines, just water vapor. It's just really hot water vapor. Just water vapor. Space launch system rocket on the pad. We are currently in the midst of self taught top left to try and stop a uh, hydrogen leak at the cavity between 
uh, the plates where an eight-inch supply line goes into the tank. The supply line is That's right, Karama. the 538,000 gallon. Yeah, there you go, Meyer. Yeah, electrolyzing salt water. That's right. On it it makes all the bubbles. One of the, uh, <laughs> I've done that. Along with liquid oxygen. It's currently in We order. could, Paul, yeah. Not very good impulse, though. We're going to hold pressure for five minutes, see if they can get that uh, seal to reseat, get that QD in the seal to reseat. <laughs> Thanks, Snibbles. Hasta plan initiated. <laughs> As you can see on the left, the they have an oxygen, oxygen plant on continuing site. Continuing to fill currently at 66%. Because they stay the pretty clean. Hydrogen yeah. is in stop fill while they pressurize this line with helium. Stand by for more. <laughs> yeah, Cindy, that's right. They just took the ladder off from when they retorqued the bolts on that quick disconnect yesterday. <laughs> it was a big ladder. They needed a crane to get it up there. A helicopter needs atmosphere to fly, Moguni. In space, there's no atmosphere, or at least not a significant amount of atmosphere to get a helicopter to work. I, Jen, yeah, Alex, I, I, I like this. I, the, the, this is cool to see tank levels and stuff. No one does stuff like this. So if this scrubs, would it mean a rollback to the VAB to fix the issue? No, probably not, Shadow Man. Uh... They have another launch attempt on Monday. If they miss the one on Monday, then they will roll back. They're trying to avoid rolling back if they can. But you you don't want to roll back to the VAB. But if you have to, you have to. But NASA would like to not do that. The salami lid ain't going to fit, Mappy. All right, it ain't going to fit. Is a fully stacked, star stacked Starship bigger than this? A uh, fully stacked Starship Chaos Slayer is about as tall as the launch umbilical tower next to SLS. But keep in mind, this version of SLS has a very small upper stage for testing purposes. The bigger versions of SLS will be somewhere around the same size as Starship with, you know, bigger upper stage and payload fairing. Yeah. This, these, I mean, these are big rockets, man. They're very big. Now, with that being said, SLS has about 35 mega newtons of thrust, so about, what is it, like 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust coming out of the business end here. Super Heavy has 15 million pounds of thrust coming out of it. Yeah, that's a lot. It went down from 9 to 8. It's because, Pasquale, it's because the cryogenic propellants boil off. Hydrogen and oxygen, when they're stored at high pressure in liquid form at a really low temperature, because you need to be a really low temperature for them to be in liquid form, the boiling point goes down. So those propellants, believe it or not, at minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, or what is it, like 270 C, they are boiling. So they will boil off like a pot of water on the stove. Is there, is this rocket more powerful than Falcon Heavy? Uh, yeah, Horsu, yeah, oh yeah, way more powerful. Uh, Falcon Heavy puts out about, I don't know, so we got nine Merlin, nine Merlin 1D, nine, or three cores, so nine times three, that's 27. Thousands, thousands, that's 9,000, nine times three. Yeah, 27,000 kilonewtons of thrust, more or less coming out of a Falcon Heavy. That's a little bit less than this. This is 35. So the Falcon Heavy is like 26, 25, 26 meganewtons. This one is 35 meganewtons. Yeah, it's a little bit more. You just use newtons and then pounds. SLS produces 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust and Falcon Heavy produces 5.5 .5 million pounds of thrust. So that's it. There you go. I, give, I have to give measurements both times because if I only give the Imperial ones, then the metric people get mad. And if I only give the metric ones, then Imperial people get mad. And if, and if I give both of them, someone's going to say, but why not Kelvin? And I'm like, <laughs> That's insane nervous. No, you said SLS and this and that. Yeah, well, Cor, you know, you're smart enough to be able to do those conversions. I trust you. How many football fields? Three. Wait. 
Kelpurial, because... Yeah, I, I we only accept standard banana measurement, so S, uh, standard measurement banana, so SMB is how we... In horsepower, please. Uh, and we only use kilo feet here for our unit of distance measurement. Kilo feet, we use base 10 feet because let's just piss everybody off. <laughs> What are you trying to share, Jim? They're still working on it. They're trying to seat the valve correctly with helium. In Ford F-150 RPMs, please. Your stream. You want to share my stream? Who do you want to share it with? I, I wouldn't go around posting my stream in other people's stream. That's very disrespectful to other content creators. But if you want to share it with somebody, yeah, go ahead. Sure. I don't care. I'd prefer that. That would be doing me a solid. But don't go posting the links to my stream and other people's streams. That's messed up. That is a really that's a really messed up thing to do. You don't you don't need to do that. Kips rules all vagabond. Nice. I have a few viewers. If I, you want, so Jim, you want to restream my stream on your stream? Yeah, go ahead, dude. I don't care. Go ahead. As long as you give credit, I don't care. Yeah, sure. Have some fun, dude. Talk about it with your community, man. I don't I don't care if you restream my stream. Just give credit where credit is due. Uh, I want more people involved in space. So yes, I would, yeah, go ahead, man. Sure, I don't have a problem with that. Go ahead. You want to put your commentary over my commentary? Do it. I, I really don't care, honestly. Doing okay, Just thanks. Uh, Jim, you know what, man? I appreciate I you asking, dude. I really do. Thank you. All right, hold on. They have completed the pressure the yeah, pressurizing of the line. Now they're going to slowly restart flow of hydrogen okay. into the tank. Let's Again, see. they're done with the pressurizing of the line to try to get the QD to reseat and uh, stop the leak that they currently have in a cavity. Security, the hey, thanks, the, man. The plate that holds the ground side umbilicals to the rocket in between the plate on the ground side and the flight side. And Hill has gift, gifted you a sub, Jim. The progress. We're, we're about to see, Cammy. They used helium to reseed it, and I'll tell you, they wouldn't be trying to flow hydrogen again if they weren't confident that the helium reseeded that, that, that seal. Oh, that's cool, Ga. Neat. They retorqued the bolts yesterday, Signard. Yeah. Security, man, you're going crazy with the gift subs today, dude. I really appreciate it. I can't thank you enough. He gifted a sub. I don't know, Kev. I don't know, Jeff. Has he? I must have missed that. Red, red card. How does helium reseat a seal? Just interior pressure. That's the idea, one D. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They can't go and have somebody reseat it with a hammer, right? So use some use some helium gas to push against it and get it to seat. And hopefully that works. So what they're probably what they're doing is they have the helium in the line, and the helium is gonna hold that valve in place, and then they're gonna flow the hydrogen past. The helium will get pushed pushed out of the system. And they're gonna they're gonna flow the hydrogen right up to it. The helium is there as a as a buffer to to hold the seat in place while they flow hydrogen through it. And don't get me wrong, once the hydrogen tank gets fully pressurized, the helium will evac out of the system automatically, like, just because of displacement. It's taking advantage of September. Maybe a dumb question, but is the timer accurate for the start? We're currently, they have to go into another planned hold. NASA's currently targeting 2.17 p.m. Eastern time for this launch. It's simple and reliable, 2020. It just doesn't make a lot of power, but yeah, go ahead. If you want, you want a Saturn view, yeah, that's all right. Why are they doing the oxidizer first? Chap, it's not that they were doing the oxidizer first. They started flowing the liquid oxygen, and then they started flowing the liquid hydrogen, and then they the leak rate of the hydrogen became too high. So they just kept loading up the liquid oxygen while they were trying to fix this problem with the liquid hydrogen so it gets done. Actually, that LOX tank is close to being in LOX replenish mode. 
I don't know, Dot X, maybe. <laughs> Any chance it will launch sooner? I'm taking the dog to the vet. No, 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 Cuzzy. 217 is the opening of the launch window. So that is the first possible chance that it could get to launch today. The launch window does go for about two hours. So if this problem takes a little bit of extra time, uh, that's why they have planned holds and they can, there's a nominal bit of flex time by about two hours. The reason why, uh, the reason why we have a two hour launch window today is, well, long story short, uh, the reason why that, that's so short is because the moon has to be in the right place. You don't want to launch a rocket to the moon and miss that, that you, solar orbit. You, you're going to orbit around the sun for a long time. It'll be a long trip. So uh, there's only a certain time during, the, during each, each part of the day for these couple of days here that where they can launch and be in the right phasing, what's, what's called phasing. Basically, the moon has to be in the right place. It's funny because after Monday, the moon goes out of favorability. It, 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 they can't launch. They won't launch because the moon won't be in the right place. It's going to take a month for it to come back because the moon's going to all the way around. Yeah, you don't want to launch. You don't want to launch a rocket to the moon and miss. That would suck. <laughs> if anybody's ever done that in Kerbal, you know what happens. <laughs> How long would it take to fully fuel the hydrogen tank if there was no issues? Oh, we'd be fueled by now, Cammy. Fueling on SLS would take two hours maximum. Yeah, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Like, if you compare it to something like Falcon 9, hey, thanks for the hype train. Antares, the two months, just woke up, hope everything is good. Yeah, it's all right. 2020, the bits. It, it's kind of crazy. SLS takes like two hours to fuel. Falcon 9, which is a very small rocket compared to this, takes 45 minutes to fuel. Think about that for a second. SLS has like, dude, I, I don't even know what the relative like amount is. SLS has like four or five times the propellant that Falcon 9 has, and it loads it up all like way faster. Hey, Anglonius, thank you. Bits and tips, Forlorn, thank you. And craft orbits near Venus somewhere, something like that. That's right, Red Munchkin. Yeah, hey, how you doing, buddy? Shadow Man with 100 bits. Does SLF have, SLS have multiple ports to take on fuel or just a much larger hose? It's an eight inch, it's an eight inch fuel line, Barley. Um, eight inch is 20, 20 centimeters for, for the, actually, no, it's a little bit more than, it's like 22, 23 centimeters. It, it, it's, it's big. It's, it's, it's like, uh, actually it, it would be 203 millimeters. So 20.3 centimeters. Yeah. It's a big fill line, eight inch, eight inch fuel line. And there's only one. Yeah, you, you you don't want multiple fuel lines going into the rocket because that's more things that you have to add to the rocket. And that makes the rocket heavier. It's higher mass, I know. And that makes the rocket less efficient because there's less fuel on your rocket and more rocket on your rocket. Your rocket won't be able to go as far because it's more complicated. It's carrying more stuff up into space. There's one fuel line. Eight inches of standard speaker element, we get it. <laughs> I don't know that. How, would I, how am I supposed to know that, Bobby? Well, Sinerd, my unit conversion there was if 16 inches is 406 millimeters, 8 inches, 203. It's half of that. And I was using gun caliber size as my unit, of, as my unit for conversion. That's how, believe it or not, that's how I'm able to, to move from meters, centimeters, millimeters to inches and feet back and forth really quickly because of bullet caliber. Really, really, really easy way to know your unit conversions. 25.2 millimeters. One inch, 12.7 millimeters, 50 cal, half inch. I'm serious. It's a really, it's a really good way to do the conversions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Luna one missed. Yeah, it's going on a long trip. Yeah, yeah, 30 caliber, one third of an inch is 7.62 millimeters. It's so stupid, but it works. Typical American. Oh, shut up, Forlorn. You do it too. <laughs> <laughs> How good of a view will Orion have of the moon with the orbit it has? A very good view, Deft. Yeah. I hear there's a fuel leak. 
Electric cans, yes, there is a fuel leak, but once again, it's important to understand that there, you're always going to get leaks when you flow hydrogen. It's just... My, T minus four hours what I've been telling people is that like hydrogen will leak in the same way that water is wet. It happens. Has, uh, it's the rate of leak. The it's leaking of the too line, much. And now they are about Here, to begin on. manually flowing liquid hydrogen uh, through that line again, slowly. Uh, to check uh, to see if they were able to get the that quick disconnect gone, that's on the other side of the rocket where all of the lines, the propellant, line, propellant lines come into the rocket to fill it with liquid oxygen and hydrogen. Yes, Liam. Uh, they're going to start that flow and, and see uh, if the troubleshooting is plan worked. This is the second plan uh, that's, been, uh, that's been tried. The first one was they let it warm up for a half hour and then flowed propellant back through it to see if that would uh, get it to go, stand by. Propellant is now flowing. Thanks Liquid for taking hydrogen. the analogy Propellant literally. Is now flowing not. through the trouble doing line. Doing the opposite the, of what an analogy uh, is supposed to do. Hang on, fellas. That's a lot of steam coming out of the flame ducts here. Give me one second. I'm not sure, Cindy. Yeah, so that's uh, I forget if uh, if it did that last time. Yeah, one D maybe. I'd be interested in an update here. Um. Well, that quick disconnect is up here, Creeper. That, whatever that is, is coming out some somewhere down underneath the rocket, and it's rising, which is... Yeah, see, it's coming out, it's coming out like, down below the flame duct. Uh, the flame duct is the hole in the mobile launcher where the exhaust goes through. The flame duct goes down into the deflectors, which goes down into the trench. Um... <laughs> Max, <laughs> how's the Haster Blend going? There you go, bro, Handy. We don't, we don't want no scrubs. Yep, don't go chasing locks waterfalls. I think that's okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure it did this before, but yeah, it just, it may not have looked as crazy on the stream before on Monday's launch attempt because, it, but long story short, the sun wasn't up. It wasn't as warm, so you're not going to make as much condensation. S straight up. Mick into Q2 K-Mag out. That's very oddly... Alright. Oh, Spinala. What's the burn time of the SRVs? 2 minutes 12 seconds on the on the 5 segments, Cammy. They, they go... That's right, Inglonius, yep. Funny story, I've ridden my bike past this launch pad. On 39B top left? Right on, dude. I've... I've stood right there and looked into this flame trench. Yeah. See that door right there? I've opened that door before. NASA uh, invited me down there one time. Off the books. Not off the books, but you get the idea. Yeah, that door is really heavy, by the way. The door the door is like like six inches thick. 
and it's solid steel, it's not hollow, yeah, it's pretty heavy. It's designed to, to you know, withstand the blast of a rocket at close range. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty armored. Yeah, everything is a blast door there, sign nerd. Yep, yep. But, yeah, I've walked, dude, I've walked right there. It's kind of surreal. What percentage of it is it full scent, Mike? Uh, we're, like, maybe at, like, 10% scent right now. Should have wrote your name somewhere. Uh, honestly, Deft, I was too busy swooning at the fact that I was standing on Launchpad 39B. Yeah. Unlikely. Unlikely, bro, Handy. That, keep in mind that crack in the insulation is inconsequential. It is something to be noted, but that has nothing to do with the hydrogen filling systems. Yeah, Orion. I... Yeah, I, I've, dude, where this camera is, I've stood right where this cam, right, right where that camera is. I've been on the mobile launcher before. I got to, I got to walk on it in 2015. It was unbelievable. I mean, it was just basically a tower at that point. It had no systems installed on it because they were still retooling it from Ares One. Do you have some pictures? I, I couldn't take pictures of the pad, Dan. Either that or I forgot to because it was so ridiculous. Uh, I, I forgot to. But I did get pictures on the ML if you want to see that. Uh, what do you think of my KSV rocket? Let me see, Lori. Uh, I can see that's a lot of boosters. Uh, but more boosters usually does the trick in KSV, am I right? So yeah, a little while back, you know, it turns out when you do a stream about NASA, people that work at NASA notice that, and they're like, "Oh, hey, come here. Let us let me show you something." I'm like, oh, all right, um, let me find the pictures. They're in here somewhere. And now that I'm like, oh, I gotta find them. I can't find them. Give me one mom, one moment. Tell Miss Jenny Summers that Mr. Achwell Foley is here. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Here we go. Yeah. That good enough? That's on like the 30, 30 foot level on the mobile launcher. And, uh, there you go. That one, that's right, Communication, one of my favorite movies. Yeah. I am literally holding onto the handrail for dear life because it was cold and rainy and windy that day, and the whole mobile launcher does this when it's windy. And the floor is graded, so you can literally see the ground. This is at level 285 on the mobile launcher. 285 feet off the deck of the mobile launcher. So, this right here is the deck of the ML right there. The level zero. 285 feet is this level up here. The ML has 285, and then there's 305, and then there's whatever's up at the top. Yeah, no, the whole ML was doing this, and yes, I got a little bit of vertigo, I'm not going to lie to you. How bad was the sway? It was enough to feel it, RJ. It was kind of, the sway wasn't too much, but it, it was doing, it was like that. It was enough to feel it. You could feel it moving around. KC7NEC. Thanks for the, thanks the four-month resub, buddy. Yeah, smoked. It's a little ways up. And then... We took the elevators up, and then the guys at NASA made me and my buddies walk down. We had to walk down the stairs from 285. Yeah, that was a hike. It was like that scene in Ghostbusters when they're trying to get to the top of the building, only downwards. We're like, okay, we'll take the elevator down. They're like, no, you take the stairs. And it's like, uh, okay. Yeah, pesky NASA people.
<laughs> NASA hates it, dude, for sure. Yeah, right. Was the elevator a smooth ride? Oh, yeah, nervous. It was great. One of the smoothest elevators I've ever been on. Yeah, we got we got our steps in that day, Barley. That's for sure. <laughs> hey, Rizik. What's up, dude? Oh, yeah, that pick I'd be shaking the head real. Oh, dude, I was holding on because the whole thing is doing this. And I'm like, I, I, you know what? I don't even care. You can call me a wimp. That's fine. I'm like, I don't want to fall. Red flag Q2. Someone threw a flare onto the track. Yeah. Good time, Cammy. Good times. The silence from NASA is deafening. Okay. They're retrying manual fill here. Hey guys, I got a question. Uh, anybody go on YouTube and see that footage from Apollo camera E8 of the Saturn V, like that slow-mo footage of the Saturn V launching? Is anybody, are you, is anybody here familiar with that video? They're working on it next. You guys know camera, A, camera E8? Look at the number in the top right. There you go. Eight is the code for cameras that are on the pad. Nine is for cameras on the BDA. That's pad camera eight. There's SLS camera E8 right there. Yep, you're on camera eight. Little Easter egg for the people that know. Here, I'll show you guys. That's camera E8. Is there a 404 camera? No, there there was PY, but they can't find camera 404. I don't know where it went. Yeah, that's camera E8, if you were wondering. And we there will be footage like this for SLS when it goes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, there's camera eight, right there. What's SLS mean? SLS is the name of the launch vehicle, only 1D. It's Space Launch System. 808 is two 404 cameras. Well, yeah, that's how they found it, dude, obviously. Such a dirty burn. Well, Chano, the, the Saturn V F1 engines used film cooling on the nozzle to control temperature. Basically, they ran unburnt fuel from the gas generator because the gas generator on those engines runs extremely fuel rich for cooling purposes. They regeneratively cooled the nozzle by dumping the exhaust from the jet engine attached to the side into the nozzle. Hence that nice film cool that comes out of the nozzle. Uh, that's, why, that's why it looks so dirty. Uh, believe it or not, that's just the outer part of the flames that are coming out of the engine. Uh, it's, it's called film cooling. Uh, it, you give a nice film of cold, cold er fuel between the really hot rocket engine and the metal uh, to give a give you a good thermal barrier. Think of it like insulation for the inside of the nozzle happening in real time. Yeah, that's why you have those dirty flames coming out the bottom. They do screw with the exposure, Alex, on these cameras, sure. Yeah, that's what... Here, if we back it up a little bit, see that? That's what that is. It's coming out of this gas, the gas generator on the F1. Basically, <laughs> these, the F1 engines, right? There's a jet engine here. It's called a gas generator. What does it do? It makes a lot of gas. And that gas is used to spin a turbine. Okay, so there's basically a little jet engine attached here, and instead of having a compressed, hold on. did not work. The second troubleshooting plan to uh, seal a hydrogen leak at an eight-inch line that feeds the propellant into the rocket. The uh, troubleshooting. Uh, effort uh, as reported by the hydrogen team uh, they said they started slowly bringing liquid 
uh, into the tank. And gradually, as they started to raise that pressure, they saw the leak detector uh, go up, up above 4%. So they've backed it off a little bit and now are going to look no, for another... No, the F1s are the name of the Saturn V engines. ...to try and get this leak to seal. Engineers uh, now headed over to the anomaly loop. Uh, it's a channel where... Uh, the engineers SLS, the launch, do you want uh, a blend launch engineers hydrogen or Boeing blend engineers, C chief hydrogen engineer question? We'll all be discussing uh, a next plan. No, plan not, C. not really in Glenning. They've been in some preliminary discussions about blend it. Blend C, um, SLS, So they've already kind of touched question. it a bit, but um, now they're discussing it now. And we'll tune in and find out more. Again, uh, so... We can just recap. Hydrogen, hopefully, Herman. Seal the leak. A little with more than hydrogen. two hours ago, a uh, leak developed in the hey, um, supply side, calm, eight inch line, on. liquid hydrogen line, while attempting to slow fill, transfer from slow fill to fast fill, to load hydrogen into this rocket. And we've been going through a number of troubleshooting steps. The first was letting the connection warm up for 30 minutes and then manually starting back a slow fill. The second troubleshooting was pressurizing the line with helium to try to get it to reseat. Neither troubleshooting uh, effort um, was successful. And so now we're uh, awaiting uh, next steps. It's the fuel line, Triceratops. This is our it's, launch control. It's where the fuel line connects to the vehicle. Um, okay, not good news. The... The helium seeding with the with the manual hydrogen fill didn't work, um, so the teams are going on the what's called the anomaly loop and trying to figure out another solution. Meanwhile, back over here with the Saturn V footage that we were watching, it's a gas generator. There's a jet engine that's attached to two fuel pumps, and those fuel pumps move the liquid oxygen and kerosene in. And that gas generator, that jet engine, has a gigantic exhaust, and the exhaust dumps into this manifold right here. And that's what film cools the engine. Now, I know what you guys are going to say. You're telling me a jet engine exhaust is cooling something? Yes, actually. The jet engine exhaust is hot, but the rocket exhaust is even hotter. And the jet engine exhaust is just cool enough to be able to protect the outside of the, F, uh, the outside and inside of the F1 nozzles. Yeah. It's all about relative. Relative temperature. 4% doesn't seem like a huge leak. It's the rate of leak, Dan. Yeah, four percent is above acceptable levels. Don't get me wrong; they could probably still fuel it. It would, but you'd leak hydrogen gas everywhere, and you'd run the risk of leaking too much, and not having enough fuel for the rocket. You could do it, sure. They might decide to. It really depends on how willing they are to roll the dice. How sure are you that you're going to get a good roll? You could roll snake eyes, and then you're screwed. See what I mean? It's about making calculated decisions, and that's probably what they're discussing on the anomaly loop right now, if I had to guess. Discovery, go and drop you would on. think, even though it's a new rocket, they could make an umbilical setup that doesn't have issues after how many years NASA's been around. Roadrunners, it's, it's not that simple. What you just asked in terms of flowing hydrogen is like saying you'd think they would have a an internal combustion engine that's like 90% efficient nowadays. They've been making internal combustion engines for a long time. There's physic there's certain physics problems with liquid hydrogen that you just can't beat. Hydrogen will always leak. It's the rate of leak that's the problem. It leaks even when they fill it. See what I'm talking about? It's it, it's not it's not that NASA can't design a good seal. It's that the physics here are pretty complicated. You know what I'm saying? Execute order 66. No, not right now, Mink. Maybe later. I'm tired. Why do they keep saying Discovery go at throttle up? That's my sub notifier, 1D. <laughs> like, I know, I understand what you mean, dude. I know what you're getting at. It's like you'd think after 30, 30 years of the shuttle that this would work right, but. You know, it's a new launch vehicle. They're figuring out the right way to fill it right now. <laughs> and by the time we start to see people on this thing and then routine launches after that, they'll definitely have it figured out. At least, they, well, Roadrunner, let me put it this way. They better have it figured out. You don't want to roll the dice when people are aboard. That's a really stupid thing to do. But don't get me wrong. NASA wouldn't do that. What do you think about the comments from the MIT professor that said the Artemis was a flying museum that should have never been built? Um... 
Meyer, that's a good question. My question back to that would be, would you rather have nothing? What is the anomaly loop? It is a communications channel that the launch controllers use to basically troubleshoot the rocket, Mike. It's a, it's a radio channel. Was your sub-alert inspired by Challenger Go at Throttle Up? No, the Throttle Up call is something that happened for every shuttle flight, dude. There is a period during ascent where they have to throttle back the engines. Long story short, to get the rocket to get into orbit, you need to go fast. But you don't want to go too fast while you're still down here in the atmosphere. Because there is a point where your rocket can't move the air out of the way fast enough. Because the rocket can't move the air out of the way fast enough pressure builds up on the front of the vehicle. The air gets literally compressed up against the front of the vehicle and it can't move out of the way. There's just, there's too much of a traffic jam of air molecules, right? That point in a flight is called maximum dynamic pressure or max Q. Q is the numeral for pressure in like physics calculations. Uh, and it's maximum dynamic pressure because obviously the pressure is going to go away when the rocket gets up into space because there's no pressure up there, right? So that period during maximum dynamic pressure where you're, you're basically, think about it kind of like terminal velocity on the way up. You can't move the air out of the way fast enough, so you kind of have to throttle back because at that point you're, you're pushing against a brick wall. So they throttle back the engines. They throttle back the engines on the shuttle during this period of dynamic pressure to keep the pressure low uh, because the shuttle the shuttle couldn't move the air out of the way fast enough. And neither can this thing. Because it, it's flying through a fluid, fluid medium. There, there's, there's only so, there's, you can only go so fast before bad stuff starts to happen, like entry heating or something. So don't, don't get me wrong. The thing is, you're not going to see re-entry heating on the way up for most rockets. Except if it's a sprint missile. But that's another story. Um, so they throttle the engines back to try and help lower the overall dynamic pressure on the vehicle. That was a good question. Yeah, one day, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Fair enough. I'm a huge fan of space travel. And I'm glad we were doing it. it. Was not a comment in my own view, just food for thought. Yeah, Meyer, no, no, I get you. Yeah, that would be my question back. Would you rather have nothing? You know, because, I, and Meyer, I, I'll be honest, I know the answer that I'm going to get. Oh, well, SpaceX is doing Oh, yeah, because SpaceX, SpaceX's rocket is ready to fly, is it, uh, right? Uh, uh, right? Now, see, don't get me wrong. I love SpaceX. I love what they're doing. I think they should eat. They should be trying to eat NASA's lunch, so to speak. Absolutely. But Meyer, the thing is, is that I'm greedy. I want all of them. I want Starship launching next to SLS. I want SLS with Falcon Nines next to it. I want Atlas V. I want Vulcan. I want Delta. I want all of it. I want Ariane Five and Ariane Six in there. Soyuz. I'll take it all. That's fine with me. I'm a greedy, greedy guy when it comes to rockets. You know what instilled that behavior? being a space flight fan about 10 years ago when they decided to get rid of the shuttle and Constellation at the same time. I've, I've literally, as a space flight fan, I've been traumatized by programs getting yanked out from underneath it, from underneath me. Like, it really sucks seeing a space program get canceled. You can ask anybody here that's old enough to remember when Apollo got canceled. It's not, it's not, a, it's not good. It's not a good thing and it's not a good feeling. So, it, 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 it's terrible and it holds us back. Look, SLS might be using old technology. That's fine. That's fine. But it exists. It's right there on the pad. See it? I would rather this than nothing. Yeah, Joe, it was terrible. That's why I'm greedy. Because I've, I've seen what it's like to have multiple space programs get the rug pulled out from under them happening in real time. It was a nightmare scenario. I will never advocate for any launch vehicle ever to be canceled regardless of how old it is or regardless of how much or not it or or how behind schedule it is or when it's going to fly or over budget or anything never ever that's a really bad idea every single time and Meyer this is the next thing that I'd say to the to the person who's like oh this is old technology why are we using this every every single time someone has said why is NASA doing X task this way? We can do it this way for cheaper. 
They've lost capability. It's only trended down since the Apollo program. Every time some somebody comes around and say, oh, why are we using the Saturn V? It's too expensive. Use the space shuttle. It'll be a lot cheaper. Am I right? Ha 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 Every time, trended in the wrong direction. See what I mean? So, Meyer, that, that would be my question back. And once again, I, I, I understand. I'm willing to give a professor at MIT the benefit of the doubt. What that person probably meant is that NASA should be researching cutting-edge technology and should be on parity with, like, on par with SpaceX. NASA should be able to match SpaceX's capability. That's the argument to be made, and that's the one I agree with. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, but I think that SLS should launch more, not less. Because if we try to sit here and try to clean sheet a, ro a launch vehicle, right? If we tried to clean sheet a launch vehicle at this point, it would be another 10 years before it launches. Unless you want to throw copious amounts of money at NASA like they did during the Apollo program, it's going to take a while. SLS might be using old technology. If SLS is over here. It might be using old technology, but just because it's old doesn't mean it doesn't work. It works fine, well, in this particular case with the hydrogen leak, but it's a new vehicle they're working on. It. It's a teething problem. It happens. That thing right there, this is good enough. It is good enough for what we need it to do, and we can give it better upper stages. It's designed to hold a much bigger upper stage and stuff. So, yeah, oh, great. Okay, so what? It's using old technology. Who cares? Old technology works. That's fine. So it uses an old spacecraft. The Russians still use it. Does that mean it's a bad design? No. Not at all. It's one of the best spacecraft ever devised by man. So, once again, like, if not this rocket, then what? Update. You know? And you're still discussing oh, hold on. Uh, another troubleshooting plan. Again, engineers uh, discussing another troubleshooting plan to try and fix a leak in the liquid agree, hydrogen uh, side line that uh, leads into a cavity with uh, the two plates, two connection plates on either side, on the vehicle side and the ground side. Stand by for more. Okay, they're still discussing uh, where they should go with this. The SR-71 is pretty old. It's still the fastest thing around, Prot. That's right. It's a good point. Yeah, Meyer, that would be my question back. But I, I think what I think the, the, the implication there from that kind of question is, you know, why isn't NASA on the cutting edge like SpaceX? Well, all right. That's a fair, I'd say that's a fair criticism. Would an EUS using the J2X have similar performance to the RL-10? It would give you, it, Torlab, a J2X on uh, an upper stage for SLS would give you way, would afford you to be able to have way higher energy transfers to the moon so you could get to the moon faster because you have more, more oomph behind you. But the EUS that's planned to go on this thing carrying four RL-10s out back it doesn't have the kick that a J2 does, but it has way more efficiency. J2Xs can get, you know, per their testing, their short testing period, can get up to like 420 <laughs> uh, second specific impulse. RL10s are at 450. So you're swapping, you're swapping TWR for delta V in that analogy. In, in this, well, not analogy. In this scenario, I personally will take the EUS. The EUS would be better. Yeah, especially if you're trying to do something like Gateway and the rectilinear halo orbit and stuff. Discovery, go and drop. The way Apollo got to the moon was with the second stage is like basically brute force, brute forcing it. It's the highest energy transfer that you could do, straight home and transfer, where you're swapping efficiency for time. It doesn't take as much time, but it's it's a lot less efficient. Hey, Meyer, tier one, tier one sub. Welcome to Mission Control. You're a go at throttle up. I, I have a feeling we don't have many more options than wait for the quick disconnect elastometers to warm up than reseat. The QDs I work with on my project have handlebar warmers for this. Yeah, they, just warm it up. It's fine. It'll seat eventually, pray. What specific impulse on a manhole cover? Well, <laughs> the specific impulse on that manhole cover is... its the, the manhole cover wasn't the propellant. The nuclear blast was. Uh, and... I don't know if you can get specific impulse from a nuclear weapon, but you could definitely get total impulse from a nuclear blast. That's measured in tons, though. I do not leak. You leak. How do they know how much LOX and LH2 is really in the tank? Some boils off. Uh, 
Temperature sensors could tell. You could extrapolate that from a temperature sensor, Finn. Yeah. Or flow rate, uh, flow rate from the vent lines. That could tell you. How old are the two SRVs? Um, they were built fairly recently, THF, like in the last couple of years. It, guys, SRBs have a pretty high shelf life. It's longer than you think it is. Uh, there was a, a mission <clears throat> that NASA launched on a Minotaur IV rocket, and the SRB casing was 30 years old, fueled. And it's using the same propellants that these ones are. So I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about that too much. Uh, the, these SRBs were manufactured in the last couple of years, but they are using reused shuttle casings. Meyer, I love the intensity and enthusiasm for space. You deserve a sub, and yes, I'm throwing all... Uh, I am all for throwing all the money at NASA. I want more money for NASA, more money for SpaceX. I'm a greedy son of a gun, man. Greedy, greedy. I want, I want SLS, Saturn V, and the shuttle, and, and, and Starship, and Falcon 9, and Falcon Heavy. I want all of it. Give me all of it. Give me all of it. Give me all your rockets. Oh, so you want to see a couple of Falcon 9? No, son. I don't think you understood me. Give me all of your rockets. <laughs> sure, 2020, I'll take it. Mick to Q3? No way. Docs, Docs M, one year resub. Thank you very much. You want a side of bacon? No, son. I don't think you understood me. Give me all of your bacon. And then Skylab, Mir 2, and Space Station Freedom. Yep, yep. I'll take two number nines, a number nine large. No, no. I'll take two Falcon 9s, a Falcon 9 Heavy, two SLSs, a space shuttle. A Saturn V with extra dip. <laughs> you picked the wrong house, fool! <laughs> Can't throw San Andreas references past this guy, man. I played that game way too much. <laughs> supersize the rocket. That's what that is, Woodsy. What do you think that is? That's a pretty supersized rocket. And don't get me wrong. It's supersized rocket with some nice spicy barbecue sauce on it. Because what comes out of these white tubes here, very spicy. Very spicy. Ah. Atlas V heavy. Sure, we'll take it, Seinerd. Did Mick really make it to Q3? That's my boy right there. That's my boy right there. Let's go. He made it to Q3. Yes! Yes! The kid's got it. He's got the gift, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> How's SLS looking today? That hydrogen catch can leak got Ishiku as being a pain in the butt, dude. They're running into some problems with it. And we're getting a little late in the plan hold, but... They're on the anomaly loop now discussing a solution. Shut up, Tessa. Who is Mick and what is Q3? Quack, we're talking about Formula One. Mick Schumacher is a driver in Formula One. He's a, he's a German driver that's driving for an American Formula One team called Haas. Uh, if you're familiar with CNC machines, yes, that Haas. Uh, and uh, he, he's, he's like... He, it's not, he's not a rookie, but he's, he's pretty young. Kid's 23 years old. And I, 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 from what I've seen, I think he's a really good driver. But he hasn't been able to prove it yet. So him getting into Q3, qualifying. That's qualifying for the F1 race that's tomorrow <clears throat> at Zenvoort in the Netherlands. Uh, him getting into Q3 proves that he's fast. He's a, good, he's a fast driver. He's the ninth fastest on the grid out of 20 drivers. That's really good. That's really fast. Considering these guys, that, like these are the best drivers in the world. Uh, Jack, they're having trouble with the hydrogen flow rate again. Guy who set the flare on the track got kicked out. Good. Haas makes CNC machine. Yeah, Haas automation. Yeah, Meyer. And his, his dad is... His dad's a pretty cool guy. I mean, Meyer, I, I'm a big Ferrari fan. I've been following Formula One for 25 years. I grew up with that. I, 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 want, I want him to do good. I really want him to do good. It would make my day. And he's, dude, he's got the gift. He just got to get comfortable. That's what I've been saying. That's what I've been saying for a little while. Four richest drivers. Yeah, we don't talk about those. Yeah, but Dak, even the richest drivers don't get into Q3. You know what I'm saying? Why do the shrouds of the above nozzles look different? Um, it's probably because they replaced them for whatever reason. The, the, it, they're fine. It, the, those things get inflated anyway, so it's really not a big deal. Didn't the shuttle alva also a lot of trouble with loading hydrogen? Sometimes in the early parts of the program, Jack, sure. You know Stroll has pole too, so no way. 
Don't don't screw with me like that, VY. Did they fix the issue with the SRBO rings or just change launch constraints to deal with the issue? SRBO rings? Uh, no, that was fixed in 1988, Druid. Do you think that different one is because they examined engine three that wasn't purging? It's the sensor on engine three, Forlorn. Engine three actually chilled down correctly, if you really want to know. What's the smoke? Lori, that is condensed gaseous oxygen. Or just gaseous oxygen. Or just gox is what they call it. Sorry, I just like saying gox. It's a funny, funny, funny word to say. Um, that's just because the propellants inside of SLS are boiling. It, in order for oxygen to exist as a liquid, it needs to be really freaking cold. And it's really, really freaking cold at really, really high pressure. Really cold at really high pressure lowers boiling point. This is basic physics. So, so think about it this way. <clears throat> if I'm at sea level and I have a pot of water and I boil it, at what temperature is it going to boil? 100 centigrade or 212 Fahrenheit. If you're in Denver, Denver is 5,000 feet or 1,500 meters above sea level. The boiling point at lower pressure goes up. You have to boil the water for longer. Boiling point goes up with lower pressure. It goes down with higher pressure. And in this particular case, you have extremely high pressure and extremely cold propellants. The LOX boils off. So you have to have a vent or else you're gonna make a pressure cooker. And you don't wanna pressure cooker your rocket. Bad idea. For one, it'll heat up the propellants inside and then you make more gas and then um, popping a balloon. Yeah. Did I get it backwards? Been, uh, yeah, I got it backwards. Sorry. Too much information. Too much information floating around in my head. Flip the pressures around, but you get the idea. How do you know all this stuff? Do you have a degree or something? I'm self-taught, just me. I apparently don't know enough because I can't get boiling point and pressures right. Remember I said basics? Yeah, no. That was just... I have a lot of information floating around up here and everything is off the cuff, guys. I don't have any cheat card. <laughs> I so sometimes I sometimes I misspeak or get it backwards. I apologize. I definitely said that wrong. It's it's the other way around. Sorry, too much information floating around up here. Um, in terms of how I how I learned, I'm self taught. Yeah, and it shows. Do you have a link of where we could look at the part of the design? look at the part that's leaking. I don't have a leak, but I have a picture of it if you want. There was a tip in there. Thanks for the info. Yeah, sure, no problem. Should be on Jeopardy. <laughs> I, I like watching Jeopardy for what it's worth. There was a tip in there. I didn't see how much it was for. Let me, let me take a look. Thank you very much. Sorry about getting the boiling point thing wrong, fellas. Paul, EJ, used to go throttle up. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks for the 10 bucks. I appreciate it. I think you must be pretty high. I don't know, just me. I don't use intelligence quotient to denote how smart you are. Eh, I just learn stuff, man. I Rockets are fascinating to me. It's fascinating, this thing, how complicated it is. The pen is mightier for 500. I watch Rick and Morty. Yeah. You just gotta jam the hydrogen way up there, Morty, to make sure it doesn't leak. The seals are tight yet malleable. <laughs> Your cousin drives endurance races for Porsche. Dude and his team came first at Le Mans a few years back. Cool. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, sorry guys. I, I apologize about getting that wrong. I, I know it. It's just sometimes I say it wrong. There's a disconnect here sometimes between what this thing does and what that thing does. Boy's wicked smart. But yeah, just me, you know, I, I'm self-taught. Uh, turns out that if you have a stream about rocket science, you'll start to attract people that work in the industry and actual, are actual rocket scientists or rocket engineers, technically. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you just I just kind of keep learning over time, dude. Jam it right up in there. You got to jam the hydrogen right up in there, Morty. The seals on the TSMU are tight yet malleable. Um, yeah. So you get engineers. I get engineers basically teaching me about this stuff in chat as much as, as much as I can. I get people that work in the industry, people that work on all kinds of stuff, planes, rockets, whatever. Um, that and I do a lot of incessant reading about rockets pretty much every day. Uh, if you really want to get into rocket science and you want 
got an update entry on the level stuff. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. Regarding uh, what to do next about the hydrogen leak um, at the 8 inch quick disconnect cavity where uh, the 8 inch hydrogen line that goes into the rocket. Uh, engineers uh, discussed it uh, thoroughly, uh, discussed uh, a couple of options. Where they landed is with uh, Sometimes trying Alex, yeah. uh, troubleshooting plan A, the first uh, plan, the first uh, plan troubleshooting a. plan that they did. The uh, this fill. was uh, the one where uh, they stop the flow of That's hydrogen um, and allow the uh, connection to warm up for 30 minutes and then manually start back with a flow. Okay. Now the good news for the liquid hydrogen team is they had already stopped flow, so the connection was warming up for the past 15 minutes. So they only have another 15 minutes to go from this point um, in putting in this most recent troubleshooting plan, which is a plan that they uh, are, are, are well, knowledgeable about like, and are saying. experienced with. Um, it is uh, the go-to plan when, when they are looking to try to reseat that bullnose connector into, um, into the seal at, that, uh, at the connection point for the 8-inch hydrogen line. So it is in work. They got the go from the launch director. Uh, to give this another shot. You will, Kilpon. That's how I know Again, it's going to work. warm up uh, the connection and then uh, hit it with some cryos and see if that uh, shakes it enough to get it to reseat that bullnose connector into that seal. <clears throat> Dan, why don't they shine a huge laser at it to keep it warm? Over on the list that's too uh, much effort. Side, the air will do that by itself. Less work, man. To topping. As of right now, just heard uh, an update from Ooh. Um, the cryo team. Okay, locks. You can see the on the screen, it's in we're at 99%. That's good, that's good news. Almost full. Topping is a stage where it slowly now automatically fills to the 100% level. And then once we get to 100%, oh, yeah. um, then it will go into what's called a replenish mode, which is replacing <laughs> what is lost from the blow off. It's not going to do that if he the doesn't have to. The tank is boiling the entire time that it's filled and uh, loses uh, an amount of propellant. Replenish puts it back in. All right, we're standing by to see how this most recent, uh, or this newest uh, troubleshooting plan goes. Len. This is Artemis Launch Control. Okay, so speaking of industry, you're going to a relativity social recruiting event on Wednesday. Nice, Wiser. <coughs> now that they can't actually get over to the rocket, what can are they doing to stop the extra leak? They're trying to reseat the valve. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> They're trying to reseat, not the valve, the seal. Um, so, Laurie, they tried, they tried a manual fill. That was plan A. That didn't work. <clears throat> they tried um, another manual fill after that, after cooling it again. That was plan B again. And then they tried plan C, where they purged it with hydro with with helium to try and seat, seat the uh, <clears throat> valve and then flow hydrogen, and that didn't work. Now they're going after. Now they're going back to plan A. They're going to try to fill it again to see if any of the other things potentially had a fix on the vehicle. <clears throat> That's why they're just going back to doing what they started with. Uh, actually, plan A was automatic filling, plan B was the manual filling, and plan C was the he helium purge and then fill. They're going to go back to A to see if plan B or C actually had any effect on the vehicle. They're just being scientific. I need a, I need a glass of water, though. Uh, yeah, I'll be right back. One second, okay? <clears throat> I've been talking for a long time. I'll be right back.
Uh, the beer, please? I got Guinness in the fridge, Jimmy, if you want it. <clears throat> I'm a bit confused. If they had to go to Plan C to try and fix the issue and it didn't appear to, why would going back to Plan A resolve it? Um, because they want to see if Plan C had any effect. Goose! You linked an image. What does that image say? Shaxter, 76 month resub. Did you? I have a flat tire. And I should have bought a spare, I guess. With uh, the core stage at 99%, uh, you can see the, the venting of gaseous oxygen is in full flow. Two-thirds of the way up the rocket. <clears throat> You're looking at the nominal venting of uh, gaseous oxygen out of the core stage. So that's that the, the Gox line that's up there that's putting gaseous oxygen out. I just like saying Gox, so I'm going to say Gox as much as I possibly can. Gox. Uh, the gaseous oxygen is because that the, uh, the oxidizer tank on SLS is in replenish mode. Basically, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the propellants inside of SLS are boiling. Uh, they do boil off because they're, they're really cold at high pressure. Um, that lowers the bo low, lowers, lowers the boiling point. Now I'm like too so self-conscious about the pressure boiling analogy. Anyway, uh, they boil off, so it's creating gaseous oxygen. So they have to vent it, and they have to keep fill it. They have to keep topping. They're, they're in replenish mode for the LOX line, so the LOX tank is working just fine. They are having some problems with the seal on the connector to the hydrogen line. Uh, so two things about that. Um, the seal isn't working very well right now. It, 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 but the seal on the part where the fuel line connects to the launch vehicle is where this problem is happening. Guys, I want to I tell you, any rocket that uses hydrogen is going to leak in some way, shape, or form. It's just, that's physics, man. The hydrogen is so cold that it's really, you know, when you're flowing hydrogen through a cold line, it'll evaporate because that, that line is sitting in the sun. So you're going to get some hydrogen gas. It's the rate of leak that's the problem. Uh, the, it's leaking too much, which means that a seal, basically the seal between the rocket and the fu the rocket, the carrier plate, and the fuel line uh, on the fueling umbilical, which is behind this, is not is leaking too much. It's always going to leak. NASA has a scavenging system to make sure that the hydrogen gas doesn't leak too much and it doesn't leak where you don't want it to go. Um, the reason why is that if too much hydrogen gas leaks. Uh, well, Hindenburg, yeah, yeah, you don't want that. <clears throat> Ain't nobody want that. So it's the rate of leak on that, and that's because the seal is not sealing correctly. Uh, so let me show you. If we look at a picture of SLS here, and we go down here, and we look at this lobe-shaped thing, this is the tail service mast. Inside of the tail service mast, you have your tail service mast umbilical, which is this thing, that the white truss structure right there that has all the fuel lines in it, or the fuel line. And attached to the tail service mast umbilical is the tail service mast carrier umbilical plate. Now, if you look, there's two big lines right here. Those are eight inch or about 20 centimeter lines, a little over 20 centimeter lines. One of them is that catch vent line that I was telling you guys about. And it's attached to a catch can box right here which is designed to catch any leaks in the tail service mass carrier umbilical plate. This thing. The TSM cup. That thing. Um, the bottom one is the fuel line. So that's where the hydrogen goes in. And then this part is part of a scavenging system that gets that gaseous hydrogen away because you don't want the rocket to Hindenburg itself. Right here is where we're having a problem. And don't get me wrong, no the catch out. can, that white box, is there. It's it's all this right here. That It's there because it's always going to leak in some way, shape, or form. It's always going to because hydrogen's a pain in the butt. This does happen with hydrogen vehicles. This is part of the reason why hydrogen is such a pain in the butt. Hydrogen goes everywhere you don't want it to go, and it leaks all the time, no matter what. There's The thermodynamics of this is just too like it's a physics problem it's not really like the design it, you just gotta have to you gotta find the right way it's worked in the past hey Ozzy 78 month resub I say you just run up to the pad and light the candle 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could do that. You'd be you'd be d decreasing your odds of mission success if you do that. But yeah, sure. <laughs> What's up, man? It's gonna happen today. Maybe still far, and we're not sure. So hydrogen's like your dog. Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> Is there an issue? A hydrogen keeps leaking at an unacceptable rate, Adam. How you doing, buddy? Has fuel efficiency changed over the years? Hydrogen is the most efficient, Cami? Not really, no. Higher pressure equals higher boiling point. Yeah, higher pressure is higher boiling. Yeah, that's right, Rizzi. I can't believe I said that backwards with like... However many people are watching the stream right now. It's kind of embarrassing, but, you know, most of the information that I've put out today has been pretty spot on. So I'll take, I'll take the strike. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Swing and a miss, CJ. Swing and a miss. That's what they make duct tape for. Death, the problem is, is that hydrogen will go right through duct tape, like pouring water through a sieve. Hydrogen is really, really small. Especially gaseous hydrogen. It's tiny. It's a tiny little, tiny little, tiny little atom. It'll just go right through it. I'm just helping you remember. Thanks, was it? Perez, Perez binned it. Oof. How about 20 turns of duct tape? Well, the first thing it'll do, Vix, it'll, is it'll freeze the duct tape off. So the duct tape will duct tape will just crack off, and then it'll just leak. Flex tape, maybe. Maybe. To demonstrate the power, we saw this umbilical in that. You know what? That's not a good idea. Let's not do that. That's a lot of damage. How about a little more? Now that's a lot of damage. What about silicone self-fusing tape? It'll freeze it. It'll freeze it right off, Cyanerd, and then it'll leak. It'll go right to your thighs, and then you'll blow up. Weld it with some metallic hydrogen. I like the way you think, Tiberiox. Chewing gum, then duct tape. Maybe. No way, duct tape solves everything. Oh, slinging, that's awesome. No, Demon, Mick, Michael's kid. I'm so happy he's in the Q3, man. I want, dude, seeing seeing Mick drive, drive that thing into the points would make me nothing but happy. Use it with Gatorade. Yeah, you gotta use Gatorade. It's got electrolytes. What do electrolytes do? I don't know, who cares? It's got them. Last, pretty please, I know you're super busy. I have a question for you. If this goes through a scrub, could they fix the QD seal on the pad? They fixed the QD seal from Monday on the pad, dude. Yeah, of course. They have one more try if this doesn't go today on Monday. Perez just screwed Leclerc, or was it on purpose? Lovely PA for Mick. That a boy. Kid's got it, dude. He's got the gift, banana time. I watched footage of him driving around in Formula 2 and Formula 3. He's got the gift. I'm telling you. So you're feeling a launcher scrub today. It's kind of 50-50 right now, Long Eye. Discovery, go at throttle up. Hijack Beechcraft, flying track it on flight radar. Oh. <clears throat> Aviation, I hope it doesn't go near here, but interesting. He is the Minister of Defense, after all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. T-Day, 42-month resub. It was clearly Team Orders. I wouldn't throw it past Christian Horner to do something like that. Is the T-Zero time accurate? Laz Lazy, there is a planned hold built into this time. NASA is currently targeting 2.17 p.m. Eastern for this launch, so we got about, we're about we about four hours out with that planned hold. It's a planned 20-minute hold, so take that time and add 20 minutes to it, and that's more or less the right T-Zero time. If the QD doesn't seal this next attempt, it will likely be a scrub. I agree. Yep. It, I'm... <clears throat> Leclerc finished his lap before Paris crashed. Oh, that's good. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah, no problem, dude. In times of war, NASA would be considered part of the military, right? No, back alley. NASA is strictly a civilian organization. 
Discovery, go at throttle up. Yes, great. Thirty-one months. Oh, quick update. update on uh, the situation out here. The troubleshooting that the launch team is currently um, in the midst of to try to get this uh, leak to seal. Hey, uh, they have completed the warm-up and are now standing by to uh, manually resume hydrogen flow through the line okay. where they have uh, seen the hydrogen leak. At the same time, uh, the launch team uh, that's uh, managing uh, the upper stage uh, is going to start uh, doing their purge sequences for uh, the ICPS, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage. Oh, a good sign. This is at the top of the rocket. Um, they are he is a they purge out those volumes in there and purge out the lines. Uh, with uh, nitrogen over on the liquid oxygen side and helium on the liquid hydrogen side, purge out those lines. This is uh, they're going to do this so that they can uh, catch Good. up on the timeline, yep. which is which has fallen behind due to the liquid hydrogen leak. So the team doing what it can to uh, preserve this launch window, and then we're also monitoring this troubleshooting as well. Ten years of development, can't fuel the rocket. Hey, P.Y., where's, where's your hydrogen rocket? Three hours, rocket? 34 minutes and counting. Oh, wait. This is Artemis launch control. It got destroyed in a hangar collapse. Whammy. And one more update just came in. The core stage is now officially in replenish. The core okay. stage is now officially in replenish for the liquid oxygen tank. And you can see that venting from this shot right here and from this shot. Whammy. Fully venting out of the core stage at the top. Has messed up. Oxygen is good to go <laughs> and replenish. Still working, uh, troubleshooting over on the hydrogen side. It which is, is currently sitting talking, around yep. 9% full. They're going to try to fill again, it again, the Meyer. Team, uh, getting ready to manually start flow. So, what kind of things do they do to stop the leaks at this point? Slow filling the hydrogen could get the valve to se get the seal to seat correctly cooking. So I bet you they said they're going with plan A again and they're just going to try straight manual fill. Um but if they're um I'll bet you that they're going to slow fill it. <clears throat> they're going to go even slower than they did on the first try to try and get that thing to seat. If they don't get it this time, I don't think there's enough time to get everything else in line. <clears throat> Don't these umbilicals have latches on them to keep them from coming loose like this? Yeah, except when hydrogen flows through it, it freezes it, Sinerd, so everything contracts. So even if you torque the bolts correctly, the bolts, the bolts detorque themselves. Yeah. The bolts literally become unscrewed when you flow hydrogen through it, and it leaks. NASA knows that. It leaks on purpose. You can't, I'm telling you guys, you can't design around the damn leak. It's always going to leak. It's thermodynamics. Pain in the butt. Why is the time window what it is? The moon place? So why are they launching when they are? When they when they try when they're why so why are they targeting 217 in the afternoon, Eukerman? Long story short, phasing the moon. The moon has to be in the right spot for the rocket to be able to get to it. If they slow fill, can they delay the launch? A little bit, Dan. Yeah, you got you got about two hours of leeway time. The basically, Eukerman, the moon's gonna be in the right place today for about two hours. And then on Monday, it's it's going to be in the right place again for about two hours, only it's a little bit shifted. Monday's Monday's launch attempt will probably be a little bit later in the afternoon, if I had to guess. Could be wrong. Orbital dynamics is a pain in the butt. We still got plenty of time, guys. That's that's why I'm like, eh, it's 50-50. Uh, you know, if this thing seats, then they then they can get the rock they can get the rocket fueled and ready to go in three hours, no problem. What's the status? They're having problems with the tail service mass carrier umbilical limb prod. The hydrogen hydrogen keeps leaking at an unacceptable rate. LH2 has resumed flow slowly See? into the tank. They're going to slow Engineers fill it. Engineers opening Very slowly. that valve manually to allow that uh, liquid hydrogen to flow into the tank. Again, checking to see if the latest troubleshooting, uh, which is was also the first troubleshooting plan, um, but uh, trying it uh, a second oh, time water. to see if that's going to result in reseeding a bullnose connection on an 8-inch hydrogen line into a seal that uh, currently has a hydrogen leak. What's the problem, Smuck? There you go. The uh, liquid hydrogen team keeping the test director informed of... The trajectory updates in real time on the avionics void, Ray. 
True story. It's called updates, Ro and we are passing them along to you in real time. It's called Rand Steering. This is Artemis Launch Control. Really, really cool stuff. Um, yeah. So there's the update from Daryl. Okay, They're going to try to slow fill the LH2 again. Need backup tier 285. Thanks, man. Yeah. Void Ray, that's a good question, dude. Uh, so, you know, you say the moon has to be in the right place. The moon is always moving. It doesn't stop. So for that two-hour window, the, the moon is in the right phasing. And, you know... But the trajectory is going to change because the moon changes. It's not like it stops, right? So the computers, the flight computers that are on SLS automatically compensate for launching a little bit later in the window. And it'll adjust the trajectory automatically. There's a nominal range of trajectories with it from 217 to 417 in the afternoon that will... Um, there's also a leak over there on the right. There's a, there's a TPS crack. See it over there on the right? See that little, little, little pinch of smoke coming out? That's, that's okay, it's not a big deal, but interesting to see it over there. Um, that's a LOX leak. It's not an LH2 leak, sorry. That's a LOX leak because it's the LOX tank. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it's called right angle of ascension node steering void ray. And basically it updates it in real time uh, throughout the launch window. So if they say, I, you know, oh, we don't want to launch at 217, we want to launch at 3 o'clock. SLS already knows where to go at three o'clock to take into account the moon moving. Yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Vlam, they've had some problems with the hydrogen leak. Yeah, it's called, yeah, R-E-A-N, -R right angle of ascending node steering, or RAN steering for short. At least that's what ULA calls it. I'm not sure what it's called for SLS. It's probably called a different name. But basically the computers, the computers take into account launching later in the launch window. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about orbital mechanics, right angle of uh, right angle of ascending node is uh, one of the variables that defines one of six variables that define orbits around celestial bodies. You have uh, inclination, ex or semi major axis, which is basically how high the orbit is for the most part. That's the layman's terms way of saying it. All orbits aren't circular, so it gets a little different than that. I'm just so excited for the launch. Right on. Hey, Navodia, 15-month resub. Uh, there's semi-major axis. There's eccentricity, inclination, argument of perigee, time of perigee passes, right angle of ascending node. Hey, Napfin, what's going on? How's the SLS countdown going? Eh, it's going all right, drummer. A little bit of teething problems with the vehicle with that hydrogen, that hydrogen flow, uh, uh, the hydrogen leak rates at the point of connection between the vehicle and the fuel line. Uh, hydrogen, I think, I've, I've said it once, I'll say it again, I'll say it a million times today if I have to. Hydrogen leaks, guys, it happens. It, it happens no matter what. You could have a fully sealed line and it'll still leak. Gaseous hydrogen goes everywhere, everywhere. It's small, odorless, and it gets everywhere. Um, it's the rate of leak. It's leaking a little bit too much. Now, NASA has a scavenging system there and a catch can to be able to take into account, but that catch can only has a certain amount of bandwidth, and they also have a, only have a certain amount of hydrogen in the tank. You don't want it to leak too much. What happens if they didn't have the catch can and the hydrogen leaked anyway? Well, hydrogen, like I said, it goes everywhere you don't want it to go. Uh, and once you start releasing hydrogen gas around, well... If you don't give it a place to explode, basically a big Bunsen burner that's over there, a little ways off the pad, uh, it's, it's that way, or that way. If you don't give it a place to explode, it'll find a place to explode. And what, what happens when it does? Hindenburg. Yeah, Hindenburg. So SLS Starship, which is your boy? Uh, I like both of them, Funky. You wanna know the truth? I'm greedy, man. I'm greedy. I like both of them. I want more rockets. I'm greedy son of a gun, dude. I'm greedy, man. I'm greedy. Yeah, Simon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's not good, man. From what I understand, if they get into one hour before the window and fast fill didn't start, it's a scrub. That sounds about right. Tesla Max, 14 months. What's up, dude? So, like, honestly, I, I like all rockets, man. I'll tell you I'll tell you everything I know funky about SLS and I know a good deal or Starship. 
I put each of them under a magnifying glass because I like all rockets. It's okay to like more than one rocket, man. I like all of them. I'm Dude, I just... There's so much engineering that goes into every single one of these dang things, man. You can't hate on one. Well, you could. People do all the time, but... How long were the Apollo There's launch windows? No Are they able to adjust in a similar way? The, they had a little bit more flexibility with the Apollo mission, Smuck, because uh, the Saturn V has more C3 than SLS. It has more energy. So they could afford a higher energy transfer, and because they're affording a higher energy transfer, uh, you had a little bit more flexibility. Basically, Saturn V, Saturn V yeets, and it yeets hard. When do they run out of available time? Uh, guys, we got about we got about another two and a half hours before they run out of time, so to speak. Art, 16-month resub. Morning. One hour and 15 minutes to fast fill the LH2 per the timeline. Cool, cool. I mean, Devlin, I'm taking into account, you know not launching at 217 if they want to make that 217 launch yeah you better get it done sooner rather than later the hydrogen is at 10 percent. let's see if that number starts going up quickly then me that means that means we're good so it's 51605 520 51.6. that's that's a slow high that's a slow hydrogen fill that is a good sign Mortelson launches at 2.17 p.m. Eastern Time. There is a planned hold built in to take into account any weird problems that might happen, like this hydrogen problem that NASA's working through. So that timer isn't 100% right, but it's close. Add, add about 40 minutes to that, give or take. Actually, about 20 minutes. Add 20 minutes to that uh, because the planned hold is for 20 minutes. If you add 20 minutes to that timer in the top left, then you're good to go. It's bouncing back and forth, 52, 0, 52, 4. No problem, Mort. Discovery, go at throttle up. For the opening of that window would be T minus 10 and counting. Is our terminal count with T minus 6 for GLS go for tank pressurization? For opening of the window, that would be our deadline for the push. Yep, got it. Laser Drifter, what's up, dude? Yeah, 52.4. They're, they're slow-filling hydrogen, dudes. It's just a gas tank bobber going up and down. That's good news. If they're slow-filling hydrogen, yeah. Remember, guys, they can slow-fill hydrogen at any time that they want. It's the And it will leak no matter what. It's the rate of leak. It's the rate that it leaks at. That's the problem. If the leak rate is below four percent of total hydrogen move, then they're good to go. They can launch. They'll 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 go they'll initiate a fast fill. Hey Roro. Could they make the window with just slow fill? Uh probably not, Mappy. Maybe if they started slow filling and they kept slow filling right now, but that's not the right procedure. You don't want it that's introducing a new variable because SLS was designed with the intention of fast filling the hydrogen. So slow filling it could screw up something. You don't want to do that. Play how you practice. Bingo. How do you feel with the launch, Retta? I'm pretty confident that they'll get it figured out. And if they don't, we go on Monday. No problem. And if they don't get it, then we go in October. Whatever. Guys, scrubs in, like, the history books, no one remembers a scrub. Nobody remembers that Apollo 4 scrubbed multiple times. Everybody remembers that Apollo 4 launched. Nobody remembers that the S STS-1 scrub scrubbed, and it launched. It, it was a 24-hour turnaround for STS-1, and then they sent it. Nobody remembers that. Everybody remembers the first shuttle mission being successful, though. Guys, a week, a day, whatever, a month, fine. If you know this rocket took 10 years to make, we can wait another week. That's fine. In another video, Scott said that the valves weren't able to be tested in the wet dress. Is that actually the case? Uh, what valves are we talking about? The valves, there's no 
There's no valves in this thing. Well, there are, but I don't. I don't it's specific. Update on the troubleshooting. Got to be more specific. Uh, the second attempt at a warm up of the connection with the uh, hydrogen line did not work. Again, yeah. uh, the second attempt to warm up that connection for a half hour and then hit it with cryos in order to get right, the bullnose course. connector to reseat in the seal did not work. LHY. The liquid hydrogen team reporting to the NASA test director that as soon as they resumed flow, um, when they added any pressure at all, they saw the leak return. So that's the third troubleshooting attempt, two of them uh, the same, the first and the third. Uh, yeah, team now is uh, discussing next steps. This is Artemis Launch Control. Hmm. Hmm. Someone didn't torque in a star pattern. Yeah, I know. Someone needs to run to AutoZone and buy some stop leak. I'm trying to think what... I'm trying to put my mind in, you know, in mission... Con or launch control right now. What would you do in this scenario? Transfer windows to the moon in KSP, Jop Jop, literally when the moon comes over the horizon. Time for flex tape. <laughs> yeah. Nothing you can do except inspect it at the pad after safing the vehicle. Can we hire better hydrogen experts? <laughs> Hey, Minute Man. Quick, silly question. What's up? Has this setup been tested at launch yet? Will all the parts, with all parts from the space shuttle? Has this setup been tested at launch yet? Minute Man, it's been tested up in the count, in the launch countdown to T minus 29 seconds. That's, that's, that's the furthest it's been tested to. If that counter in the top left corner gets below 29 seconds, we're in uncharted territory. That's when we're truly rolling the dice. But this is high stakes space flight, man. You want to send anything beyond low Earth orbit out to the moon, to Mars, wherever. This is the level of difficulty. It happens. I would start to be worried about an extruded or cracked O ring or damaged nose seal. I wouldn't pray. Don't worry about it until it becomes a problem. Until you're absolutely sure it's a problem. You can't prove that that O-ring's damaged. You can't prove that any more than I can right now. Why worry about it if it's not? If you don't know if it's true? That's what I mean. I see people chat. Oh, I have bad feelings about this. All right, fine, great, good. Why? Why have? But why? I don't understand. Just send in the box, Boston Dynamics, robotic doggo, doggo to inspect the leaks. Eh, that's, a, that's a good idea. D-Tank, have a pad crew inspect and reseat the seal and go for Monday would be your thinking. Yeah, Devlin, you got to play on the side of caution. And everybody said, oh, safety first, safety first. This isn't about safety. This is about getting good baseline data on SLS. I, I would say that safety doesn't have much to do with it, but it, it kind of does. Like, you also want to make sure when you launch the rocket, it doesn't go near people. That would be wrong. But also, it, it's not... 100% about safety, guys. It, it, it is more about getting good test data, making sure your experiment is running to the best of its ability. Wouldn't sending the core stage through a lot of thermal cycles cause some damage to it? It is cracking the foam a little bit, Forge, but that's nothing but it, that's been, that, that behavior has been observed in the past. It's not a big deal. Safety of the engines. NASA only have 16 of them until the factory restarts production. The factory's already restarted production, can't have. You want the highest performing data possible for a clean test bed. Bingo, Puma. Exactly. So I noticed that like when this thing scrubbed the other day, dude, everyone's like, oh, it's better to be safe. I'm like, the safety has nothing to do with it. It's about getting good test criteria. I was like, 
that's kind of right, but that's not the whole answer. You know what I mean? And it's just, that's me being a little facetious, I guess. But also, when people say, oh, safety first, it's like, dude, there weren't people on this. What? All right. I guess that makes sense. What's the closest to a rocket that a regular human can build in their backyard? Uh, Tony, model rockets are just fine when it comes to stuff like that. If you want to get into what's called HPR, high-powered rocketry, um, there are organizations around uh, around the U.S. that you can jump into if you want to do HPR stuff. Um, but in terms of like what you can build in your backyard, heck, dude, I wouldn't launch an Estes rocket in my backyard. I have a pretty big backyard. I still wouldn't do it. Uh, you want to you want to do that on an open field away from people because the it's it's still a rocket at the end of the day. Yeah, it's not black and white; it's orange. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want, so for instance, if you want a rocket that goes over a thousand feet, um, why does all that paneling look so fake? Because <laughs> it's a it, it's a blow up castle, Mad Hatter. Um, no, it, it's all heat blankets, dude. That's why it looks like it's inflatable. It's, it's all thermal protection. That's why it looks so weird. Um, uh, so I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought there. Give me a moment. Yeah. Tesla. Nice. So Tony, if you, uh, excuse me. Sorry. Been up a long time. Tony, if you want a, like a rocket if, if that goes over like a thousand feet, that's when you have to start getting into like a license and stuff. You need your, um, there's L, L1, L2, and L3 certifications that you can get from different outfits around the U.S. called like, uh, one of them's called Tripoli. Um, and if you get these certifications, then you can go out to a range and you can launch your own stuff. I know plenty of people that do that. Would you build your own mini rocket? Actually, Dan, I plan on doing it. I plan on I plan on getting into high powered rocketry. It, so, I recently moved and I just bought a house, and the house has a huge garage. It has a huge shop. I'm in it right now, but I'm in the office that's in the back of the garage. I have a thousand square foot garage. I, oh, we are building rockets in there. Oh yeah, that's happening. R rockets that are legal to build. You know, you you can. It's not like you can go and build this in your backyard. I mean, if somebody did that, that would be very impressive. You have a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel for VODs, Dan. But yeah, if you want to get a hold of me, here's the. this is the place to do it. But I, I actually, Twitch just uh, messed with their exclusivity rules for partners. So I could post more stuff on YouTube and I could like live stream to Insta. I'm not doing that. Yes, Kyron. Once I get my tools down here, tools are all packed up. Yeah, no, right, right? Yeah. How's the fill up going? Not very good right now, Pasquale. They got a, they got a, or TikToks. Yeah, that's right. That's the room that was on your right when you were streaming from the casting couch. More or less hypersonic, yeah. I can watch you on the TikToks then. <laughs> the TikToks? <laughs> Uh, like a week ago, one day? Yeah, you, I still can, like, you can actually stream on YouTube now, but you can't simulcast to YouTube from what I understand. So, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll, you know, go pull some people from YouTube and make the stream more popular. I wouldn't mind doing that. And if we put the videos on YouTube, that would be, you know, you know, do a syndicated series on, like, building high-powered rockets. I mean, plenty of people do that already, but, like, my buddy Joe Barnard does that, if you're familiar with BPS.space. He actually makes model rockets that land themselves, which is really freaking cool. It's really impressive stuff. They're, they're having trouble with the hydrogen fill line, Rain. It's leaking too much. What's that stuff constantly venting from the side? It's gaseous oxygen scuff because the propellants inside of the tank are at very high pressure. <clears throat> so they boil. Uh, they, bo they boil off. Basically, the liquid oxygen that's in there is boiling off and it's creating gaseous oxygen and you have to keep topping it off until the rocket's ready to go. Cryogenics. Pain in the butt, dude. <clears throat> yeah, 1D. Some, I mean, some people don't care. Some people just do it, but yeah. Can you upload full VODs to YouTube now? I've been doing that for years. Smuck. I have an, a drummer. My lead moderator actually coded a automatic system that cuts and splice VODs by category. So if I change the category, it'll cut, it'll cut VODs up and it'll upload it to YouTube. Oh yeah, the VODs channel is popping right now, dudes. You guys want, 
You guys don't want to watch the VODs here on Twitch. I Well, one, I understand that. YouTube has a much better playback player than Twitch. I'll say that right now. It's not, not a knock against Twitch. This is my home. You know what I mean? This is my home on the internet. But yeah, if you want to just skip around and cut through different VODs, yeah, the VOD, EJ VOD channel is popping. Hydrogen leaks again on the line. Unacceptable leak rate, leak rate, City Robo, on the hydrogen tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate. SLS, sure love streaming. That's right. So you weren't exaggerating when you called the garage a VAB. Also, would you ever do something like part 103, like 103 part ultralight? I don't know about building and building something like that, Nighthound. I'd be, let's build cars first, and then I'll think about it. Rocket Guy has a point. What is Rocket Guy saying? If Artemis scrubs today, I think NASA will roll it back as this current best launch window ends on Monday, and NASA said they require 48 hours to recycle which I think would violate Monday. The next best launch time would be the very last days of September or the first week of October. Mm -hmm. Tax dollars paid for that lovely concrete. It's, it's nice concrete, man. It's nice concrete. I know, Element, he did, yeah. You need to ask Scott for a flight. Yeah, Scott's cool. He's good people. I, I know Scott personally. He's a good dude. I don't see your last, whoever said to see last, who, who said that? Apology department, you're right. Truly explosive bolts do exist, just not a glam word for frangible nuts. My data was still by many years. And eh, engineer, don't worry about it. Uh, dude, everybody makes mistakes. I made a mistake about boiling point today, dude, it happens. Is Das there? I think he is, yeah. I just don't understand why we're having so many problems. Yes, it's a new launch vehicle, but it's a new vehicle using old parts. Um, it's not its not a design problem, Rain. It's a physics problem. Uh, I'll use this analogy again, despite every, everybody getting all like, eh, it doesn't work that way. It, it, hydrogen leaks. It leaks. And the part, the, the, the tail surface mast umbilical is a new design. It's based off of the shuttle, but it is a new design. It's this piece right here, right at the tip of my finger. It's the fuel lines. They are based off of the shuttle, but they're not the exact same parts. Now, hydrogen lines, with that being said, they always leak. I do not leak. You leak. Uh, hydrogen always leaks. It's just, a it's just a product of flowing hydrogen. Hydrogen likes to evaporate. It really does. It's, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, saying uh, a hydrogen line won't leak within the application of talking about like rocket science and propellants and stuff is like saying water won't be wet in once again i i, I know people are like the ej technically water isn't what i said is enough to get the point across Shh. don't take the analogy so literal it's an analogy it's supposed to be simple Shh. shuttle derived yeah exactly alpha I was about to say it. I swear, Mad Hatter, don't do that to me, man. Don't do that to me. It's hard to come up with this stuff on the fly, all right? Don't do that to me, man. <laughs> Shut it. Zip it. Look, I'm Zippy Longstocking. Um, so, yeah. The, Rain, I get it. New vehicle. It's shuttle derived. The umbilicals aren't exact shuttle replicas they're not they're not the exact same thing so you changed it up it's going to act a little bit different and in that in that regard you're going to get teething problems it happens don't be impatient with this stuff trust me everyone remembers if the rocket blows up nobody remembers if the rocket scrubs a day or two or a month no one remembers that dm2 scrubbed no one no one remembers that everybody remembers bob and doug going up to the space station am i right does hydrogen only leak while flowing or even when it's sitting still in the tanks? It's when you're flowing it, not as... Yeah, when you're flowing. It doesn't It doesn't boil off in the tanks if you can keep it at a high enough pressure. Yeah. Yeah, the big cryospheres that they have here, uh, the, 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 the fuel tanks on the launch pad that aren't the rocket, where they flow the hydrogen from... Uh, those are big steel tanks and they can hold them at a lot higher pressure than these things and that that will basically make it so it doesn't boil. I remember SDS-51L scrubbed three times. 
Did it? How we looking? 50-50 right now, Hibbit. They're having trouble flowing the hydrogen again. Yeah, that's right, whoever. PV equals NRT. That's right, Rendezvous. Mm -hmm. You guys got to be patient. It's space flight. We've gotten a little bit spoiled by Falcon 9, haven't we? But remember, when Falcon, when SpaceX was first trying to figure out, you know, densified propellants, the basically the key with getting Falcon 9 to land correctly every time, that uh, Orbcom 2 in 2015, that mission scrubbed like six or seven times or something ridiculous. I, I was there. I remember. I, I planned to spend a weekend in Florida. I ended up spending like a week and a half in Florida because it scrubbed so many times. And then it finally launched. Yeah, Smokin, that's, that's very true. Everyone remembers the time STS-51L did not scrub. Yes, that's what I mean. You take your time. Take your time. It's taken 10 years to get to this point. We can wait a week. That's fine. That's why, you know, people are like, oh, I got a bad feeling. Don't freak out. It's fine. It's fine. As long as it doesn't pop. We don't want it to pop. And it won't pop if you're patient. Not you guys. I'm talking about the people controlling it. But they, they know that. Just be patient. Trust me. Discovery, go at throttle up. I don't know how you could possibly know that, Forge. Uh, I'm going to write that off as junk. Junk news. But once you pop, the fun don't stop. Well, that's right, Top Hat. You're absolutely right. But ideally, unlike a Pringles can, you want the rocket to pop down in this area. So we'll go weatherman. We'll go weatherman mode here for a second. See, like, this area, like right here, like right in this area here, and then a little bit over there, and then also over there. This is the part that you want to pop. See this stuff up here? You do not want this stuff to pop. Bad idea. D down here, though, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we want this down here. We want that to pop down in this direction. And now I know what you're wondering. You're wondering, hey, EJ, how do I get back on the right track? Well, la de freaking da! Is that Bill Shakespeare over there? <clears throat> Some of my favorite comedy sketches of all time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably do that, or else you'll find yourself living in a launch pad down by the Banana River. It's my hero, more shots. Now, chat, what do you want to do with your life? You want to live in a van down by the river? Well, you could probably do that, or you'd find yourself living in a van down by the river. <clears throat> Hi, Noswolf. How's the weather, Ollie? It's going to rain! Thanks, Ollie. A lot of freaking done. <laughs> Were you to scale against the nozzle? No, not at all. No, that engine's way bigger than me. Please get a compressed mic. Yeah, they said I just moved in. I'm working on it. You know what I what I really don't need is people reminding me that I need to fix it. I kind of ran out of time because you know, working on it though, buddy. <clears throat> I bet if we had some of the old Saturn V engineers right now, things would get done. Things would be done a lot easier. Uh, except they had a bunch of hydrogen leaks on the Saturn V. But I get the gist of what you're saying. <laughs> no, Forlorn. You need a better mic. Oh, man, that timeout button, Forlorn, sure is looking really nice. Here, what? I wonder what happens if I press it. Let's be scientific. I pressed it. What happened? You tell me. Oh, wait, you can't. Because you're timed out. Whammy. Sorry. You're not timed out. It was just a zap. Is that Bill Shakespeare over there? <laughs> Apologies, I fell asleep. They fixed the hydrogen leak. No, they're discussing where they should go. Yeah, for, it was scientific crosshairs. I mean, scientific, that's all. 
Gentle reminder that the strut angle has changed. It has, Baz. Good job on remembering it. It's because it is cold. There is some hydrogen in there. Yeah, Cairo. Yeah. I, I've decided I'm not... I decided literally yesterday I'm not going to have that annoy me anymore. Whatever. Say whatever you want. You know what I'll do instead, fellas? I'll give him the rope. Here you go. <laughs> I'm not saying nothing. Yeah, Dan, nah, not really. Discovery, go at Technically not wrong till it launched. Corey, you're giving that man way too much credit. Yeah, Phil, they're still working on the leak. That the the seal on the tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate is not seating correctly. Yes, Kyron, sure. Did they say when they'd give an update? They'll be pot West Panda Daryl will be back here in a moment, uh, with some uh This is Artemis Launch see? Control, the Told you. Uh, engineering team is updating the NASA test director about the situation with the hydrogen leak. We should have a update oh, nice, shortly. Cantab. That's great. I don't know, Smuck. Daryl, talk to me. Give it a second, Manazi. It'll, it'll work. Gotta be patient. Guys, the last time NASA just decided to just launch it because they were impatient, it didn't end well. Be patient. Trust me. Daryl, talk to me, Goose. That was incredible. You like that? Yeah, I'm hoping, Rocket, they can't get the uh, tail service mass carrier umbilical on the hydrogen side to seat correctly. It's leaking at an unacceptable flow rate. Now, once again, I'll say it once, I'll say it again, guys. It's supposed to leak. It's designed to leak a little bit. Why? Hydrogen's going to leak whether you like it or not. You don't really have a choice there. Doesn't matter what rocket it is. It will always leak. It's just leaking at an acceptable rate. Now, I, if you guys really want to get technical about this, you know, oh, why is it leaking this, that? They can flow the hydrogen and it can leak. I, somebody asked, Dan, you asked something like that, Dan, man, in, in chat. You asked something like that. Could they just flow it anyway? Yeah, sure. Of course you could. Uh, you would leak too much hydrogen out of the system, though, where you wouldn't have enough fuel in case you scrubbed for another attempt. And they NASA doesn't. It's a it's a balancing act, right? Dude, we could they could send it if if they deem that as an acceptable risk, you could send it right now, no problem. You could tank it. It would leak, as long as you understand the problems that spring up or the associated things that spring up from fast filling. Namely, if you fast fill, you're not going to have enough fuel to recycle for Monday, if you don't. If it doesn't work, if something else goes wrong. So, fellas, that's probably, if I had to guess, that's probably what they're talking about right now. That's They're probably talking about, you know, how much are we rolling the dice and what are our odds of getting a seven, so to speak, if we decide to just fill it and not have enough fuel to, to go on Monday. Because they got to get trucks from the LOX plant and they got to get trucks from hydrogen, from liquid hydrogen providers uh, to get out to the pad, refill the tanks, and that's going to take a lot of trucks. And it's not, there's not, there's, you can't do that in 48 hours. They don't, they do make liquid oxygen on site at the Cape. There is a LOX plant that's like four or five miles that way. Uh, it's south, uh, southwest of here, near, near Kennedy Space Center. There is a LOX plant. 
so they can make it and they can bring it over here. It, they can bring the hydrogen too. I'm not sure where the hydrogen is made. Uh, I forget. Um, Discovery, but go at throttle up. the point is, is that, that that's not something that can get done in a 48 hour turnaround. So that's the reason why they're they're really like eh, with the liquid fuel flow rates. It is, Kyron. Yeah. It, it we got Monday Historia and then that's it. Hey popsicle, what's going on? Super, what's going on? Uh, Alpha, there's no possible way that that guy can know that. I I don't. I I disregarded that. Do you know a spaceship? Yeah, hidden. There's one right there. Discovery. They extract H2 from methane. Oh, good to know. Yeah, Guju, there's no possible way to confirm whether that's junk information or not, so I'm just going to disregard it. Patch fans threatening to raid the track if Max doesn't win tomorrow. Orange people bad. I'm a Ferrari fan. Red people are better. In the context of Formula One, Jesus. Hey, Shaw, 86 month resub. Beep boop, orange rocket, go burr. I hope so. Orange Rocket, good though. Yeah, there you go. Any idea how much liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen they go through on scrub in terms of cost? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Joe Bob. I can tell you the, the cost of fueling proportional to the vehicle is inconsequential. So think about it. Gas prices are a little high right now and that does kind of suck. But think about how much it costs to fill up the car or truck that you drive around. Or what your utility bill is going to be like if you charge your EV, for instance. I mean, whatever. Energy is energy. Uh, comparatively to the cost of said vehicle. Right? So you go buy a car, a brand new car that's well equipped, like 40 grand. And it costs like 50 bucks to fill it up. The proportion of cost from cars to rockets does scale. It's about the same. It costs way more to develop and build the rocket than it does to fuel it. The fueling is like almost to the point where it's inconsequential. They're not worried about how much the fuel costs. They're worried about having enough fuel in case the rocket scrubs. So it's not a lot in the scheme of things for the rocket. Now, not a lot for scheme of things of the rocket. It could be a lot of money to you and me, but it's not a money. It's not a lot of money for the program. You know what I'm saying? Hey, KRO, that's a tier one sub. Thanks, buddy. Welcome to Mission Control. Go with Throttle Up. Forty gave her a new car. What century are you in? I don't know. I have no idea. Time is a construct, Darius. I can be wherever I want to. It's 2022. I can think what I want. Boom. Roasted. Now how do you feel? Hey, AP. What's going on, brother? I was talking about the six West Dress rehearsal comment. Yeah, Gujar, he really that guy really is a wiener, isn't he? A little it's a wiener. Elon Muskrat, twelve month resub. One year, man. Thank you. Oh, control. here we go, we got an update. The launch team has Yeah, that's not bad, Victory. Excuse me, the launch team has um, presented uh, Discovery. a go recommendation of no go for launch to uh, the NASA test director and launch director. Next time. We are currently waiting a decision by launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson. Stand by for that. All right. Well, we're, launching is not off the table just yet, fellas, but uh, we'll see. How can the rocket be real if our eyes aren't real? Yeah, me too, Darius. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At least you get a nap. Yeah. Discovery, go at throttle up. Guys, you got to be patient with it. You got to be patient. Look, it just scrubbed. I've been looking forward to this rocket for a decade. It just scrubbed. It, 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 well, not it just scrubbed. It potentially. Discovery, go at throttle hey, up. thanks for all the subs, guys. I do appreciate it. Do I do I look annoyed? Nope. You don't look annoyed to me. What's wrong with it this time? It, it, there's not anything wrong. It's just behavior that it's behavior that needs to be understood, Park. That's really it. Like, I know that sounds like that sounds like horse horse patootie, right? Like, really behavior that needs to be understood no you it's a test flight you want to improve odds of success of the vehicle as much as you can and any variables that get introduced like if the hydrogen leaks at a rate that you didn't plan for is deviant behavior from the vehicle 
Engin you, when you're testing stuff in the applications of engineering, you got to understand what you made. The more you understand what the vehicle's going to do in certain scenarios, and the more you understand what you freaking built, the more likely that you're going to be successful when it actually gets to operational missions, right? Does that make sense? Long story short, they could prop NASA could probably try to force the issue. Uh, they could probably try to force fill it and it could probably leak hydrogen everywhere. It probably wouldn't be an issue, but probably wouldn't be an issue is not how, not what you, not a good way to look at things when you have a multi-billion dollar launch vehicle sitting on the pad. That's not a good, that is not a good way to look at that. I will tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, they recommended it should scrub snackless. I know. Yeah, I made the correction. That's not, remember, it's testing criteria. You want to improve odds of success as much as humanly possible so you get good baseline, a good baseline data set for how the vehicle performs. And part of that is not introducing variables into, the, in, into it, right? Think about it like, like cooking food, right? Say you're making ramen and say you like cooking the noodles at, at 200 or 100 C for exactly three minutes. What happens if you cook it for four minutes? right? The noodles are going to get really, really soggy, right? They're going to get soggy. Anybody who cooks ramen knows what I'm talking about. They're going to get soggy. It's going to be no good. That's not, and then that's not, that's not what, if you're trying to write a recipe and you ideally want it at three minutes and you cook them and it goes to four minutes because you were texting on your phone or something. And then you write that down in the recipe book. Well, it's going to be bad every time. Don't you think? See what I mean? There's a recipe for doing this. And if you add a little bit too much pepper, you know what I mean? It could screw things up. They're, NASA's trying not trying to not do that. But then again, maybe if you cook the noodles for like uh, four minutes, it's not going to be that big of a deal. I a uh, no-go condition you know? for uh, launch today to no, uh, Launch Director Charlie Blackwell-Thompson. She is uh, conferring with Mike Serafin from the mission management team, expecting a decision shortly. Yeah, how do you like your grits, chat? Do you like them regular, creamy, or al dente? Silly man, there's no such thing as too much pepper. You, you, you know what, Jersey? You're absolutely right. That was just a, it was just an analogy. It's just speaking. It. I mean, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Pepper is great. I mean, put that on everything. Your spontaneous examples are no go. Yeah, well, your chatting is, your tie looks stupid. Yeah, boom, facial chat, total facial. How long do you cook a grit? Maybe the laws of physics cease to exist on your stove. Got him with that one. How do you know they're wearing a tie? Because G Chief is a very well-respected professional. Of course he would wear a tie. Uh, screw it. They're having problems with the hydrogen fill line again. Hmm. Yeah, Camino. Thanks for the resub, dude. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Grits. Mm. It's not even noon. Jeez. It's uh, oh, it's time to wake up. See last. Squish, you, you're going to have to give... There's going to have to get, help, they help me out here. Were these hydrogen fuel seals properly all functioning through the green run in the Westchester rehearsal? Yes and no. Complex modeling is often very hard to make and even harder to make with accurate results, but thankfully the real world is the best modeling tool we know. Shotch, very well said. Very well said, dude. So if you're saying it's not a design issue, what could be the cause of the unacceptable leak rate? Um... The valve's not seating correctly because the hydrogen, they, they haven't figured out the right rate to load it at, 1D. Now, don't get me wrong. That would have, a more robust testing regime would have definitely helped you there. But, uh, you know, there's people that say that NASA, you know, SLS should get less money. And then, then that actually happens. And then you don't have a robust testing regime. Yeah, Guju, that's a good way to say that. Yep, yep. If there was a leak in the connector plate, wouldn't we see vapors from the connector plate? No, security. No, 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 no. Uh, once again, this is what I mean when I say everything leaks. Everything with hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, when you're moving it around, it leaks all the time. You don't have a choice in the matter. It doesn't matter how you design the seal, guys. That's just physics, dude. Uh, hy liquid hydrogen and hydrogen in order to exist as a liquid is extremely cold. 420 minus 420 F. That's really cold. Like, really freaking cold. Like, I don't I don't even know what to compare it to because that's about as coldest as you can get in Fahrenheit without really weird physics happening. <laughs> uh, so it's always going to leak. But security, the reason why we don't see vapors going around is because they have a catch can system. 
because NASA knows it's going to leak. Remember, the thing here is that it's leaking too much. It's always going to leak, but it's leaking too much. There's too much gas going out, and that behavior needs to be understood. They need to understand why it's doing that. It's not so much the design. It's, under, it's understanding why that thing keeps not keeps uh, not seating correctly. This could be something as simple as not having the torque spec right on the tail surface mass carrier umbilical plate. It could be something that simple. How do you not leak hydrogen? Yeah, there you go, Brink. Hydrogen will evaporate because in order for it to exist as a liquid, it has to be really cold. And when you think cold, you usually don't think of Florida. Am I right? Except if you live in Florida, then like 60 degrees is cold. Go and, throttle up. and you guys need you guys need to learn how to cold better. Right? It's really warm in Florida. So all that hydrogen that you're flowing through the pipes is going to exchange heat with the pipe to cool it down, and it's going to leak. It's going to turn to hydrogen gas. Hydrogen's a very, very small molecule. Lowest atomic mass out of any element that we found. It leaks everywhere. It goes everywhere you don't want it to go. I hate hydrogen. It's small, odorless, and it leaks everywhere. Requires pants. That is cold. That's not cold at all. That's a hoodie in shorts weather for me, man. It's 60 degrees up here right now, WD-40. I was out in shorts and a t-shirt. I'm like, ah, oh, oh, it's a nice morning. I don't know anything about space, but it's interesting. Is this going to be orbiting or landing? It's going to be orbiting the moon, Castro. The whole the whole point is to send the capsule out on a test mission to the moon. It's an explode. Yeah, it'll Hindenburg. Exactly, Historia. Yep. And in the case of flammable gases leaking, leaking, you can generally include a purge system with an inert gas to keep the gas mix in the safe range. But if the rate is bad, then well, you know, yeah, yeah. Shot SN4 comes to mind. Our communication. Hey, man. Welcome to Mission Control, you're going throttle up. There's a planned hold in the countdown window, Andre. That's why, I'd add 20 minutes to that and that gets you the right time. Because there is a planned hold at T minus 40 minutes and that planned hold is for 20 minutes. I know that sounds, that sounds strange saying it like that. Add 20 minutes to that, it'll give you the time that you're looking for. Joseph Ash... Ashbacher is saying the Artemis 1 launch is scrubbed today due to the LH2 leak during core stage tank fill. It reminds everyone how complex this is. Interesting that he would tweet that. Your hydrogen. <laughs> Ow. The end of the launch window, 417. Thank you. Fantastic stream. Very informative. I try to, I try to do what I do, man. I cover most, pretty much every American rocket launch and European stuff and some Russian stuff too. Uh, yeah. If you want to learn about rockets, I got you. I'm not, a, don't get me wrong. Your boy ain't an expert by any means. I'm just, just a very big Finkel fan. <laughs> this is my Graceland, sir. Collier County, there ain't nothing in Collier County, all right? If you get the reference, you get it, you know what I mean? Discovery, go and throttle up. When is the lunar lander going to be tested? 2023 and 2024, Stroker. Lace is out, Dan. I made some refreshments, Dan. You're a fan of her like I am. Uh, Forlorn, I would say you're more than a fan. Okay. This is Artemis Launch Control. Oh, yeah, I'm under there. Charlie you go. Charlie Blackwell Thompson addressing uh, her team. There you go, Just uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, says she has received their no-go recommendation but wants to hold off. Um, some additional thoughts and conversations are are being developed about the situation and where the rocket stands Ooh. and uh, said she will revisit it momentarily. Currently, we're in acceptable condition to hold. The launch team uh, has uh, the Ooh. liquid oxygen in a stop configuration. Hey, George. Uh, safe at this time. And just awaiting um, hmm. a final... I want uh, to believe! From, uh, <laughs> ...the launch director. What a twist! ...at this time. So you're saying there's a chance. This is Artemis Launch Control. <laughs> yes! All right, Charlie! I knew I liked her for a reason. She's a beast! Discovery, go and throttle up. Z-Buff, welcome to Mission Control. You're going throttle up. Thank you very much for the sub. I appreciate it. Hold on to your butts. 
Fast, well, she got some stones. She got some stones telling the Anomaly team to go frick themselves. <laughs> That's not what happened, but figuratively. The Anomaly team's like, yeah, we shouldn't do that. And she's like, mm, yeah, I hear what you're saying right now, but also, let's figure out another solution. <laughs> yes, of course, Jordan. Uh, I forget, Kyron, I think 2020... Yeah, Infinite Tape, you, you, you're probably right, but yeah. Yeah, Dish, that's a good point. But I was premature sub with the scrub? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I hear you, but have you considered space? Yeah, maybe. We need this emote. <laughs> There's totally a chance. All the space news people on Twitter are saying it's scrubs. What the heck? Yeah, because... Yeah, because they don't listen. Bro, Handy, this is what I keep trying to tell everybody. I recognize the Anomaly team has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid decision, I've elected to ignore it. Uh, yeah, this is right, Devlin. That's a kind of that's a kind of squirrely thing to do. You don't, you don't really decide to just send it unless you're absolutely sure. I hear what you're saying, but let's light this. Why don't you just go down there and fix your little problem and then light this candle? That's right, Gold Poke, yeah. That's what I, that's what I try to tell people. <laughs> Till I hear it from primary source, I really... People can say whatever they want. They could say that, the, you know, this is a big banana, and bananas have changed color, and now they're orange with boosters strapped to the side, and we're launching that into space. I'd be like, all right. <laughs> all right. Until NASA says that, I think you're wrong. No sleep till... Yeah, right. Already driving back home. As much as I like the optimism of Charlie, the engineer saying it's no good, it's good enough for me to leave. Yep. Yeah, hand banana 3.0. That's a big banana. Yep. Rockland! <laughs> yes. You know, if we turn this banana to a lime and turn a lime to a lemon, we will sip the deaf ale with all the fine women. A wise man once said that. You called early? No. No, I. somebody asked me a question and the answer to the question was 2020. People are angry at the Port of Canaveral. Some people drove hours to see it. <laughs> All right. That's really good. I'm really... I'm sorry. That's... Sorry. That's... You know, you're upset. That's not really NASA's problem. What if you put a lime in the coconut? Also good. Also good. Is it scrubbed? No, not yet, Squabblin. The Anomaly team went to Charlie Blackwell Thompson, the launch director for this mission, and said they recommend not going because they can't get the hydrogen to seat correctly. However, Charlie Blackwell Thompson said, eh, okay, I hear what you're saying, but let's wait. See if we can figure out something else. If they go for it and it runs, how long until we get another SLS on the pad? Ugh. Uh, it, uh, it, could probably, it could probably take six months if you really... If, Engine Uber, if you put foot to tail, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Caveman, maybe. Well, once again, guys, you remember, the Anomaly, the anomaly team is just giving you a recommendation. It's not, they're not saying you should do this. They said we recommend you should scrub. But you got to remember, they're always going to give you the worst case scenario. That's what the Anomaly team's supposed to do. They're supposed to give you the worst case scenario. That's, that's why they have their jobs. Wayne's, what is Wayne saying? There's something sublimely American about trying difficult things in public where everyone can see the good and the bad together. Operating in secret and only announcing success is the Soviet way, based. The overtime alone is going to be a nightmare. I ain't turning around until it's confirmed no go. Discovery it's Charlie's no call, up. Faulty. If she says no, it's no. If she And she didn't say no. So you're saying there's a chance? Yep. Yeah, caveman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey, Casper. 76-month resale. What's up, brother? That's awesome, Caro. Hell yeah. Space Coast is where it's at, man. It's so fun down there, dude. I love it. 
Yeah, Chief. But see, Charlie Blackwell Thompson knows that. Charlie knows that. She knows that she knows about Go Fever and normalization of deviance. She won't let it fly unless she's absolutely sure. Trust me on that one. Being 100% transparent is how people are okay with you spending billions. They know there's a return on investment. Yeah, SKS, and some people still complain. That's what I don't like. But I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. I'd rather... Dude, ever, yeah. This is why NASA is so damn special. And this is why NASA needs their own program, dude. So we can see this. It's great. I thought they have a contract with SpaceX. They do. They have a bunch of contracts with SpaceX, Dino Flipper. Which one are you referring to? There's a lot of those. Hey, Acton, what's up? Charlie ain't gonna let it fly unless she's sure, but it is her decision. Charlie Blackwell Thompson is uh, not just, she didn't just, you know, roll in from like university or something. She's, she's directed multiple shuttle launch campaigns in the past. Go look this up. Yeah, no, she, she, she won't let it fly unless she's sure. Trust me on that one. That's right aside, Fox. Yep. Normalization of deviance is something that's taken into account. Also, go fever. She ain't gonna let it go unless she's sure. But she has to be sure, and I trust her judgment. She knows way more about this than I do. Why keep the lights 9 in around the rocket? It's a beautiful sunny day. Uh, because someone didn't set the timers right, Nick, obviously. Yeah, Razamin, no, they're still having some problems with hydrogen. A bunch of there's a bunch of different companies, Rooster. Flex tape it. <laughs> Blues, you're not the first person to suggest that. <laughs> Being 100% transparent is not only an American tradition, it's required to enable another American tradition. Armchair quarterbacking. Yeah, Engine Uber, I don't care. I'd rather be transparent so I can take the opportunity to learn while the other people go and quarterback and spout their stupid opinions. This is why I, did, I literally decided yesterday that I'm not going to let reporter questions piss me off anymore. I don't care. I flipped that switch off. I'm going to sit here and learn and you guys can go and everybody else can go and complain and report bad news. I'd take the risk and walk out there with a mallet. I wouldn't. Eukerman, I think that's probably what they're discussing. That's the gist of it. It's probably a lot more complicated than that. But then again, I, I'll tell you that the LH2 commodity thing that I said they might be discussing right now, that's just EJ's opinion, okay? That's my opinion. I, I think that's what they'd be talking about, but I don't have the comm loop on. I wish I did. If I had the communications loop, I'd be able to pick it apart and I'd be able to tell you pretty much like 90% of things that are going on. But we don't have that. We have Daryl who communicates it to us, which is fine. Daryl does a fine job. He's, he's a great commentator, actually. Cool Frisch. What's up, man? 49 months. I'm curious, how many space deniers letters did you get here in chat? Eh, at least once a stream, MK. Most of them are just trolls or screwing with me and stuff. I, I guess I've had some pretty good conversations with those folks. If they're serious, they want to have a discussion. That's fine. But I won't, I won't discuss anything with people that with, I don't discuss anything with people that don't want to change their minds about things. That's my big one. That's why, that's what I mean. Most of them are just trolls, but I have had some pretty good stuff. I've been able to change a couple people's minds. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, you know, I run into skeptics all the time, dude. And you know what? I don't blame people for being skeptic. You know, anybody that's not familiar with space flight is going to, Notice that we went to the moon multiple times and made it look easy 50 years ago, and then we haven't been back since. What the hell? Discovery, go at throttle up. Uh, yeah, that looks sus to people that don't know about the space program. I totally get it. Yeah, I, that's what I mean. You know, like I, I, I understand that, but I can explain the reason. The reason is why we got complacent. That's the reason, and that's something that everybody can understand. Hey, Funky Strobs, what's up, man? Th thanks for the sub, dude. Now, you, I, uh, you asked me, what about you? What's your favorite? You like Starship or SLS? Yo, Mick, what's good, man? 20-month resub. Exactly, Gilgalin. Yep, mm -hmm. you got it. Anybody that wants to come in here and have an honest conversation with me, I will talk to you. Sure, absolutely. It's the people that want to be right. You know what I mean? They want to be right all the time. I don't deal with those people. So those people, <laughs> whatever. You go blow hot air somewhere else. 
Starship Mayo? There you go. SLS exists. <laughs> you're, you're not wrong. Chimp, this stuff happens. This, this Saturn V looks weird. Yeah, they added boosters to it. That's 80% more booster per booster. So it has more boost, and they use the boost to get through. Yeah, see? That's that. That technically wasn't wrong. Man, Ford is always right. Mick, I, uh, I, I just agree with you. Hmm. I don't know why. I could, couldn't tell you why. It's got the boosters! <laughs> Jeez, man. Racing Kid, thanks. Wow. Big help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for giving me the time of day, dude. I really appreciate it. That was very nice of you. Wait, where's the shuttle that's normally on the side? It, uh, Omega, this is the uh, stealth shuttle. That's why you can't s see it or d something. NASA's just a subsidiary of Hayes Gray. <laughs> yeah, MMK, dude, I, I get skeptics in here a lot. Most of, the, most of them are just trying to, trying to screw with me. You know, uh, how can I piss the streamer off? And sometimes I rip into him, but most of the time I'm just like, all right. See that? That's bait. With that being said, dude, some people get under your skin from time to time. This you know is what I mean? Oh, launch update. Control. Here we go. Launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson just called uh, a scrub ah. for the launch attempt today. The second launch attempt. Damn. Again, uh, launch director... Charlie Blackwell Thompson calling a scrub for the day here at the Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39B. Not Pog. Sag feels bad, man. The team now going into the cutoff procedure after uh, being unable to resolve a hydrogen leak. All right, guys. The vehicle is safe. NASA test director... Jeff Spaulding now putting the team into Safe and configure. a configuration to drain the propellants. Yep. No problem, the tank. Simba. It's my pleasure. Liquid oxygen reached a That's right, ben. 100% state. And so the priority will be given yeah, to uh, drop, draining I, that I, tank. I understand what you mean. I'm a big shuttle fan, so, yeah. And currently they are underway. Again, we have a, uh, a scrub for the day, a cutoff. Um of the launch attempt of uh, Artis Artemis 1. Shame, Chief. Shuttle's been moved from the side to the top. Yeah. yeah it's a We're really working weird on space uh, shuttle. An, a post scrub interview. Herb. So please stand by for that. Okay. This is Artemis Launch Control. We'll go through we'll go we'll go through to the to the scrub press conference, guys. Yeah, so I'll be, I'll be sticking around, but yeah, it did scrub burb. Burb, 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 burb. burb. Um, drone? No, shh. Burbs don't drone. D shh. Uh. Yeah, watching. Yeah, the, you do. Yeah, you don't want to roll the dice, man, unless you're absolutely sure, right? Like that's the thing. The Charlie Blackwell Thompson, the launch director for this flight, has decided to call scrub. Something's going awry with that damn valve. Uh, that not valve. That dang seal. Something's going weird with it. Bird flying around. Bird in the range, guys. Bird in the range. Uh, so something's going weird with the valve. It didn't seat correctly. That's very anomalous behavior. Um, considering nothing has changed, s the configuration of the vehicle, with the exception of deep retorquing the bolts, has not black screen has not changed. Oh, okay. Since Monday, uh, that's mm, that the situation just got a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna lie to you. Awry, yeah, sure. Worth noting, Apollo 4, first Saturn V launch, took lots of tries to get off the ground before the first time. With that being said, I'm glad I didn't get out of bed this morning. <laughs> yeah. Long story short, why scrub? Hydrogen, the hydrogen fill line Moguni is not cooperating. 
Yeah, guys, it, you know, it's it. <laughs> Scrub launch Saturday. Oh, no. How many more times can they tank it? Uh, like 10 more times? At least? Easily. Okay, man. It, uh, actually, I think we're down to single digits, but it's like 8 or 7, something like that. Fault, I guess you head home. Yeah, it happens. What happens if they can't tank it again? Uh, Jack, well... They'll find a way to do it. They'll find a way to do it. Um, I don't I don't think not being able to tank the vehicle again is, is a thing here. Uh, there's still a lot of contingency things that you could do to get that thing to work correctly. They could revert back to the green run configuration. That would take. You might need to roll back to the VAB to do that, though. But yeah, there's still a lot of contingencies. That not not being able to tank the vehicle again is not an option, dude. If they miss Monday too, when will they get a window again? Um, well, the moon basically has to go around uh, Demono. It has to do an orbit around Earth, uh, so it'd be about a month. I know, I know. Okay, that's not what no people want to hear. <laughs> Trust me, I don't want to hear it any more than anybody else here. Hey, Agent Smith, six month resub. Yeah, agent. I said most of them. Most of them are. Most of them are just trolls. Not. 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 Not what you said. No. 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so, yeah. What was the green run configuration? The green run configuration had a different fill and drain valve smuck, and that fill and drain valve worked. The problem is, is that just shifted the leak to another part. The rocket refuses to launch without a shuttle attached to it. I mean, yeah, Chief, I still think that the shuttle engines down there on the bottom are confused. They're like, wait, why is there four of us? Wait, where's the shuttle? We're attached to this external tank. What's going on? What are you trying to do here? Wait, no, 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 we're not launching. Screw you. <laughs> you know, the green run also didn't need a quick disconnect. Yeah, Yomo, that's important to understand, but their, their catch can and their seal is different than is different than this and that you you're right that might be because of the quick disconnect uh but i'm sure the point that i was trying to get at isn't necessarily that they could just pull the one from stennis right the point that we're trying to get at is that there is plenty of contingent solutions here that they could use to fix the rocket they're they're venting down joe it sucks yeah they scrubbed I, I, we're gonna go until the uh the press conference here uh, so we can try to figure out a little bit more what's going on Yeah, I too enjoy when you can. I enjoy reusable space flight when you can reuse the humans. Yeah, that's the best part, Act, and that's the most that's the most expensive component on the vehicle by far. You definitely want to reuse those. No, I'm, I'm not saying humans are just a component to the vehicle. That is, grossly inappropriate. It's a joke, but yeah, <laughs> you want to reuse those. Conference of massive embarrassment. Eh, it's a test vehicle, solid. What are you gonna do? No one's ever, no one's ever tried to do something like that before. Uh, it, it's, it's gonna take time to get it right. Now is the time to fail, dude. Seriously, if you're gonna scrub a launch, now's the time to do it. You don't want to get into operational missions and then have problems like this, because that means you didn't do your testing good enough. A blade of humans? We, we don't want that. We don't want that. No, no, no. Easy enough to create a new human. I never said it. I never said, I never said it was. E it wasn't easy. It's 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 expensive. It's easy to get a mortgage. <laughs> Does that mean it's not expensive? It scrubbed Astro. Yep. Ew, reused human. How dare you? <laughs> Plenty of spares. You guys are messed up, dude. <laughs> you guys are messed up. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? I agree, RJ. It's going to be sweet. Yeah, we officially scrubbed. Charlie called it off. Hibbit. I'm probably going to take a little bit of a break, Alex, and then maybe we'll come back later. When's the next launch window? Monday. 
Well, the parts are on SLS to have the ESA logo on it. The service module for Orion TRP was this made. This is Artemis launch control. Was made by the Europeans. Again, the launch attempt, the second launch attempt of the space launch system. I don't know, Shadow. And Orion spacecraft has been scrubbed. Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson making the decision a little less than 10 minutes ago. Her team is now working to detank the rocket. Liquid oxygen reached 100% filled. Core stage only made it to roughly 11% before a Same hydrogen spot, uh, leak was detected. Do they know Monday is a Probably holiday? detected at uh, 7.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Orbital Mechanics doesn't care about your silly human construct holidays. The team is How focused dare on you? working diligently Same Same thing, Hokey. They had a leak. The drain conditions. Okay. Since Daryl's going William Shatner right there. Um, Hokey, it's the same thing. It's a problem that actually they fixed on Monday. The, the leak rates on the tail surface mass carrier umbilical seal connection. So that's the, the carrier umbilical plate. The connection between the fuel line and SLS is leaking at an unacceptable rate. Now, don't get me wrong. It leaks. It leaks all the time. Uh, it leaked on Monday. It's the rate at which it leaks at. That's the problem. So... NASA ran into this on Monday, and they tried they tried manually flowing, and that worked, right? And then they yeah, tried it today. It up. didn't work on the automatic fill, and then they tried manually filling, and then it didn't work. That is anomalous behavior. That is deviant engineering, and you that this needs to be understood because you literally did the same thing that you did on Monday, and it didn't work. So now th this is a little, this situation's gotten a little bit more complicated now. Just send in those guys. Nice. Hey, Math Rose, six month resub. Thank you. Someone asked earlier, now I'm wondering if this, if this is something they will have to put back in the building or can they fix it where it sits now? Uh, just, you could, they could, they can get the service gantries out on the TSMU. That's fine. Um, so here's the rocket sitting on the pad. The tail surface mast umbilicals here. It's a part that's actually fairly out in the open. So the catch can is that white box right there. The thing that we're talking about that's leaking. It's this line right here and the seal between this and the plate right there. That's where it's leaking. And the catch can right there, that white box is what's is how they're monitoring the rate of leak. Right? And once again, they don't want it to leak too much. Could could it be fine if it leaks too much? Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You can have it leak. That's fine. It's gonna leak it's gonna leak a lot if you fast flow hydrogen into it. But I don't I mean you might it might make problems somewhere else. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. But the thing is is that once you do that and it leaks beyond what you think it's going to do. Well, once again, deviant, deviant engineering, it's doing what it's not doing what you want it to do. You're rolling the dice. You're in uncharted territory at that point. The thing is that you don't want to get into uncharted territory when there's a multi-billion dollar launch vehicle on the launch pad. Don't do that. Bad idea. You want to give this thing the best odds of success it possibly can have. That's very important to getting a good baseline data set for testing because this is the first test flight. You have to get a good baseline. If they don't get a good baseline then the, and you roll the dice and then it works by chance, that's literally what they did during the shuttle program. How did that end? Don't do that. Uh, are you okay, Phenomenon? Can you play a good baseline? do 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 Sure. If you're rolling the dice, make sure you use loaded dice. Yeah, exactly. How long uh, How long if they had to do it would it take to bring the rocket back inside? It'd take eight hours to roll back to the VAB. Probably take about a day, Sim. But they don't want to do that if they don't have to. They'll exhaust every measure that they possibly can without rolling the dice out here 
before they try to roll it back to the VAB. I guarantee you someone's going to ask that in the press conference. Yeah. Okay, I'm free. Rocket guy. Uh, strange behavior, huh? No, Sakatera, the launch scrubbed. They had some problems with the hydrogen fill line. It's leaking too much. It, don't get me wrong, it, it's supposed to leak by design, but it's leaking too much. That's, see guys, like, okay, putting myself in kind of a, a an engineer's point of view from, from my minimal understanding of it, uh, This is very strange behavior. It's very strange. This behavior manifested itself during the green run. And then they implemented the catch can fix in a bigger vent line for the launch, the mobile launcher. Right? So this thing. They implemented fixes on the pad based off of the behavior that they saw from the green run. And... Those fixes aren't working correctly, but they were working correctly during the green run, but they kind of weren't as well. You're getting very random behavior from the same part when you do the same things. Need another seal ASAP. Nice, dead scum. The NASA stream press conference is scheduled for 45 minutes. All right, AOJ. I'll see you, buddy. Thanks for watching. Um, Go at throttle 16 months. Intermittent troubleshooting is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. That part worked fine on Monday, and it's not working now. And you really, they really didn't change anything. Except re put the TSMU in the, in the same configuration that it was on Monday. You forgot the time of day. You think that would change it, Forlan? I mean, it might. Didn't work fine on Monday, right? They had to do plan A to fix. Yeah, Rocket Guy, the automatic filling didn't work, and then they manually filled it, and it seated correctly. It's very anonymous behavior. That's very strange. Vix, I work ULA wins room DOL. If you have a window and possible path forward, you'll try to diagnose for the entirety of the window. Yep. Yeah, Vix. Cool. Hey, that, that's awesome, man. That's really cool. I'm I'm pumped for Vulcan, man. It's gonna be a good. It's gonna be a good time. What exactly is manual fill? Basically, where you control the flow rate of filling hydrogen rather than let the computer do it. So this issue is persistent. Needs time to address. No normalization of deviance. That's what I was explaining before, Rocket Guy. Yeah, this is deviant behavior, and you have to understand why it's doing that. And it's clear that it's it's a repeatable problem, but it's intermittently repeatable, which on top of that makes it more complicated. AK, it's derived. It's a derived component from the shuttle. It's not exactly the same. It's similar. So, I guarantee you the catch can and the scavenging system is different. In fact, John Honeycutt, an SLS engineer, says that he said that it's different. So, it is slightly different. It's a modified version. Yeah, Creeper, they couldn't get the fuel in. They mistakenly ordered parts from Acme. I'd believe that, Wiley. Name checks out. <laughs> It could be, Cindy. Yeah, I mean, it being 80 degrees and it being 90 degrees in Florida, it, that's a 10 degree difference. I don't think a 10 degree difference is going to be the, the difference between seeding the seal and not seeding the seal. You know what I mean? Feeding the seals, though, you can do that. that they're, they're around. You just got to know where to look.
It's scrubbed, guys. We're waiting on the post-flight presser, or post-lack of flight. Post-scrub presser, I should say. Fuel flow to the to auxiliary. Yeah, they already tried that, Connor. It didn't work. Oldest design, new parts. Yeah, Carbon, right? Exactly. And, and you know what? That, that, that reminds you of something. Guys, just because it's old parts, just because it's old tech doesn't mean it's bad. Tire technology... Tires on cars. Were there tires on cars 40 years ago? They were steel-belted radials just like they are now. Tire technology has not changed much. Does that mean tires are a bad technology? No. 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 Not at all. When is that scheduled for? The recycle? Uh, the presser should be in about 40 minutes. Uh... I wonder if it's moisture from all the rain that's been happening in the area. It's possible. I wouldn't rule it out, bro, Handy. I wouldn't rule it out until you rule it out for sure. I wonder if the seal is fixable or has to be rolled back. Hard to tell. Sliced bread is old tech. We need to replace it. Yeah, exactly. They talked about ambient air temperatures on Monday and how it could affect fueling. And they did fuel at night. That's what Forlorn's saying, Cindy. That's what she's saying. She's saying that, it, you know, because they fueled that one at night, it was, it may, dude, it may have worked. We don't know. Yeah, Chief, exactly. Cryo seals are tough, man. Yeah, Rocket Guy, what I've been sitting here telling people, you know, if you're like, oh, NASA can't design a seal, I'm like, no, it's not that simple. It's just, NASA can't beat the laws of physics. That That's hard to do. Yeah. What company actually assembled the rocket? A company called Jacobs? Jacobs, uh, Jacobs is overseen by NASA EGS, Exploration Ground Systems. We did with sliced bagels, wrecked. Yep. The next open window viscous is on Monday. We'll see what happens. If it scrubs on Monday, Stribben, the next window is in October. It's not sad, guys. It's a test flight. It's a brand new launch vehicle, brand new, brand new launcher, pretty much a brand new pad from the ground up. The only thing that's the same is the concrete. Uh, new flame deflector, new, new flame trench, new flame diverter. There's, dude, this everything is new here. You're testing a lot of new components all at once. You're gonna run into some teething issues. It happens. You know, but uh, I'll say it once. I'll say it again. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but look. No one, in a year from now, no one's going to remember that this thing scrubbed so much. Nobody will remember that. People will remember if it blew up, though. They'll be, in fact, NASA will be ever, never be able to live that one down, just like we still remember Challenger in Columbia to this day, and Apollo 1. Apollo 1 was even further, even longer ago. That was 55 years ago. Everyone still remembers that. Anybody that knows anything about spaceflight knows, knows about that plugs-out test and how stupid of an idea it was. Ruds, people remember. People remember when it blows up. People remember it even better when it's successful. I'd say they remember Ruds more than they remember a successful mission. But people, you don't, scrubs aren't a big deal in the scheme of things. It is annoying in this particular, at this particular day and time, it's a little bit annoying. I really wanted to see this thing fly today. But I'm patient. I've been waiting for this thing 10 years. Another month or another day is not going to be a big deal. NASA has a few more scrubs before they approach ULA levels of scrubs. Well, West Panda, ULA has that same problem with hydrogen. It's like if you choose, it's like when you, it's almost like when you choose to use hydrogen, you're going to get leaks. Leaks are part of the design. You have to. You have to take that into account. Exactly. I'll be in my office. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what it, RUDs, rapid unplanned disassembly. So failures. They, people remember the failures, more if not more than a successful mission, but it's not for the good reasons, right? What I'm trying to tell you is that if it scrubs, it scrubs. No problem. We'll be here. If it scrubs and it takes a month, we'll be here in a month. No problem. If it takes two months, we'll be here. If we ain't going no I ain't going nowhere. I'm patient. I've been waiting 10 years for this, man. It's fine. That's right. Everybody remembers those. Everybody has a very short memory when it comes to this stuff. But you got to be patient. Take your time. You have to understand the vehicle to the best of your ability and get a good baseline data set before you even think about putting people on this thing. This needs to happen. It is a, it is a tedious step, but it is a vital step. 
What I like to say about the launch vehicles is that you should know you should know as much as you possibly can about the launch vehicle before you actually go and put people on it and before you start running operational missions. You want to learn stuff during the test program. You do not want to learn stuff when people are involved or operational missions are involved. Case in point, O-ring failure. Not a good thing. You do not want to learn new things during operational missions. See what I'm talking about? You gotta figure this stuff out. It does take time. Apollo 4, the first Saturn V, scrubbed just as much as this thing is. And then it went on to be the Saturn V. Look at how successful that was. You gotta learn. You have to. Yeah, that's what KSP is for. Yep, indeed. Do we have any news about Jared Isaac's next mission? Uh, so the Polaris missions? Nothing particularly new, West Panda. I mean, except for the fact that the missions are amazing. Can you post the link to the launch windows calendar? Uh, I don't have the link off the top of my head. Somebody, can somebody post the calendar? Sorry, no success of defund NASA. Yeah, Rizik, people are very quick to say that, but once again, the people that say that, I am, I've decided I'm not letting them bother me anymore. Say whatever you want. Look like an idiot. Not my problem. Press conference is at four. Oh, jeez. All right, Blue, I'll see you. Hey, guys, if the presser is at four, I'm going to take a break. Um, I've been going. We've been doing this about six hours straight. Uh, poker, I, I gotta take, I've got to take a break. I'll take a break. If I take a break now, that means I can stream more later. Uh, those that say defund NASA need to give their cell phones and computers. Yeah, I'm watching. Look, man. If you go to those people and call them idiots, that certainly isn't going to change their mind, dude. That's how I look at that. So, you know, I, I do... Sometimes those people get under my skin. But you know what? If it's anything that I've learned from this is that, you know, just like a scrub in the annals of history doesn't really... Doesn't really mean anything. Neither do all these reporters that blow hot air. Say whatever you want. You will be forgotten in the sands of time that is NASA history. You are a crap stain on the history of NASA. And you will be washed away with the expediency that a wedgie would be de-wedged with. Whatever. I don't let him bother me. Let him talk. Whatever. All these tweets lost in time like tears in the rain. <clears throat> anyway. Yeah. Don't let him talk. Whatever. Good man, Rocket Guy. I will be liking that. Alright, get it. Yeah, guys, so once again, the launch did scrub. They had some problems with the hydrogen fill line. It, it's leaking too much. And uh, once again, I'll say it again. Uh, hydrogen lines leak. They leak. They always leak. It's the rate of leak that NASA was wondering about. That means something isn't seating correctly when they try to pressurize that line. And you could get a pinched seal from that. You could get a bad gasket. That can warp flanges. That could do a bunch of bad stuff. You don't want to mess. You don't. That's not something to be. It's not something to be trifled with. You don't want to. I mean, NASA could send it. They could say send it and have it leak everywhere and it's not a problem. All that is doing is decreasing your odds of success. It could work. But you're getting into uncharted territory at that point. That's not what you want to do on a test flight. So they it's not out of oh, an abundance of caution. Oh, must safety. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's all about getting good baseline data for the vehicle. You want to make sure that the vehicle is in the idealist of condition for this test. So you understand what the vehicle needs to, to work correctly. 
And part of that is not hemorrhaging hydrogen all over the pad. I'm pretty sure that's not, that's not a good thing. That's not something that you want the vehicle to do during operational missions, right? That does, that's, it, you don't want to spill fuel everywhere. That's bad. Hydrogen. You remember the Hindenburg? Yeah, you don't want it. You don't want that. You did. Nope. Nope. The only explosion I want in this thing is the explosion that happens right there. Right in this area right here. Out of the two SRBs and the four engines. That's the only explosion we want. Fuel belongs inside of the rocket. Yep. Use more gaff tape. <laughs> Uh, John, Jonathan, I'd piss on a spark plug if I thought it'd do any good. <laughs> Who turned out the lights? Rizala, get some flex seal. That's a lot of that's a lot of damage on that seal. How about a little more? Can you show us on the rocket close up again? Sure. Yeah, can you show us on the rocket? I want the explodey bits to happen right in this area here. Not here. Or here so much, but right, right here, right, right in this area here. I don't hear anything, Jim. Peep OG, mm -hmm. guys. Uh, for the for the people that are newer to the stream, a really you want a really quick and simple way to understand if it's going right. If the rocket is exploding in one direction, you're fine. If it's exploding in multiple directions, then you got a problem. Yeah, that means it's not working right. That means it, that means not that means this is fine. Yeah, that means you got to run. That's right, Harmon. Yeah, rapid unplanned disassembly. Or rapid unscheduled disassembly. Pick your acronym. Yeah, it, it, multiple direction explosion. Not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. Well, Starship landed and then exploded in one direction. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> okay, I guess in that case, you're right. <laughs> All right, that's fair. <laughs> TLDR, do you think they can fix it while SLS is on the pad? Size up, uh, honestly, I can't say for sure. I have no idea. Do I think so? It really depends, dude. I'd have to have that gasket and seal in front of me and take a look at it to be able to conclusively say. But we know that that's never going to happen. So, is the launch scrub for today? Yeah, as a max. Unfortunately. Um... It might constitute a VAB rollback. But like I said, fortunately, the seal and the valve that's... Not valve. I keep saying valve. It's not a valve. It's a seal and a flange. The thing that's giving them so much problems is right here. It's inside of this white plate. And it's where the fuel line connects to the plate. It's the quick disconnect on the tail service mass carrier umbilical plate. The carrier umbilical plate is attached to the tail service mass carrier umbilical and the carrier umbilical is attached to the tail service mast. The tail service mast is connected to the mobile launcher platform. And the mobile launcher platform, the TSMs, and the launch umbilical tower, all in one thing, form the mobile launcher. It's an ML. ML, TSM, TSMU, TSMU CUP. Acronyms. I'm not making, I'm not making those up, that's the names. <laughs> Do we have a time for Monday yet? I'm not sure. Guys, can anybody get a get a uh, an indication of when the post uh, scrub press conference is? If it's a little ways away, I'm going to go take a break. If it's soon, I mean, I, th I thought Daryl said that it would be in 45 minutes, but uh, that's awfully quick. Phil, what's that link? Marie Unicorn says that there will be a press conference at 4 p.m., okay. What makes these fuel connections so difficult to seal? 
That's a good question, Barten. It's hydrogen. Hydrogen is really, really cold. You can make a seal that you think is going to is going to seal correctly and then you flow hydrogen through it and it it gets so damn cold that it contracts and then you leak hydrogen all over the place. Uh it's yeah, the seal it, hydrogen is a very hard commodity to deal with. Commodity in the terms of like launch pad nomenclature means propellants, gases, all the stuff that you need to put into the rocket to make it go. Uh, that could be helium, it could be nitrogen, it could be hydrogen, it could be methane, it could be oxygen, it could be whatever. Those are the commodities. Hydrogen is the hardest commodity to deal with. It's very difficult. Because it's so damn cold. It's near zero Kelvin. It, that is extremely cold. Not like... So like there's Alaska cold, and then there's like Canada cold, and then there's Finland cold, and then there's Russia cold. This is like... Four or five times Russia cold. That's how cold it is. It is really, really freezy. It likes to, and you know, stuff when it gets cold, it contracts. Metals, they contract when, when they get cold. Rubber contracts, same thing. So, remember, it's, it's the, that's what makes it so tricky. Everything changes shape. Heck, even SLS changes shape when they fuel it. I'll show you this GIF again. I showed it on Monday. Here. Who was that? Bly Invader with the four month resub. Tristan posted this uh, the other day. And it's a great freaking picture. It's in here somewhere. funny because space is not cold it is but it isn't it's it's zero kelvin it's nothing it's vacuum i saw cookies yeah i did too here let me let me it's taken a little bit longer to find before let me just just back it out here give me one second I gotta find it. It shows the contractions that SLS has when they fuel it. Here we go. Check this out. This was during the wet dress rehearsal, but Tristan actually did this really awesome gif, and this is this is why I, this is why I showed. I show you guys. Now it looks like it's just flipping through at different times, right? Watch this watch the aft SRB attachment strut. Look at that. See what I'm talking about? The rocket gets so cold, it really only is designed to launch when it's cold, when the when the thing is chilled down. Because that's when it tenses up and that's when everything gets structurally sound. Look at the look at the struts. See what I mean? This kind of stuff happens when you flow hydrogen like this. Bar that's that's why it's tough. It do, once again, it's a physics. It's a physics thing. It isn't the seal. The seal could have. You could design the seal. The, I mean, the seal blatantly worked. They, it, it's worked in the past, but it didn't work today. And that's a really. It, that's a really weird thing to understand. Is it the seal? Did you flow hydrogen different? Is it is is it a problem because you you tried to launch at a different time during the day than you did on Monday? What caused? Why, why is this thing not sealing? It has sealed in the past. And it worked. It worked on Monday. This part didn't work today. Well, it worked on Monday has a little asterisk next to it. it. They had the same leaking problem, and then they tried a manual fill on Monday, and it worked just fine. They were able to top the hydrogen tank. Thermal cycling can cause issues too. Yeah, Hawk, you're absolutely right. But, I, dude, you, you're, it's not that you're wrong. I just refuse to believe that NASA hasn't taken that into account. You know what I mean? They definitely know about this. They have 30 years worth of, worth of this happening with the shuttle as, as a, you know, a specific example, right? Like, there's no way that that hasn't happened. Is the issue the environmental temperature versus lab temperature? Commodity temperature watching, yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe instead of a seal, they should use a walrus. Well, what if they used a hippo? Nobody screws with hippos. 
Yeah, see, look at all the contractions the vehicle has. See, it, 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 the whole thing moves up. Crazy, right? Yeah, so Bart, that's the kind of stuff you have to deal with. It's tough, man. It's rocket science, dude. I always say it. I can sit here and I can tell you guys how that seal works and what it's doing and why it's leaking, etc., etc. And then everybody and their mother has a solution for it, right? <laughs> There's this thing about rocket science that's really important to understand, especially if you really want to understand this stuff. And one of the most important things to understand is that rocket science is easy to talk about. It's easy to teach. I can teach anybody rocket science. I can teach anybody the fundamentals. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Doing rocket science is the hard part. That's very difficult. Doing rocket science is the hard part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody can learn it. Oh, yeah. I've taught it to everybody. I've taught it to kids. I've taught it to kids, high school students, college students, adults. I teach it to anybody. It's really, it's really straightforward stuff. The physics is not too incredibly complicated. In theory. Application, when you go to do it in real life, the difficulty level goes up. You know what I'm saying? What about EDL? Entry, descent, and landing? What about it, Astro? As Michael Reeves would say, it works flawlessly 35% of the time. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, I might be playing bed simulator, Panta, to be honest with you. Metal contracting like that boggles my mind. Yeah, Semi. This is, this is part of the reason why I like rocket science so much. You're going to see stuff you've never seen anywhere else. Shep, Bobby. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's correct, Pythos. The SRBs are holding the core stage up. And the SRBs held the external tank and space shuttle up as well. Yep, that's your primary structural ves vessel there. Yep. Vasya, she scrubbed. Hydrogen. Hydrogen's being the little suka today. It is what it is. This behavior needs to be understood, and we need to under we we need to know why it's doing that and what caused the seal to not work correctly. You got to take that whole thing apart. They could do that. They could do that on the pad if they need to. Do you have a good way to te Do you have a good way to teach a great intro to that, or a good resource to learn it? Intro to what, Astro? Oh, that's good, Gujar. Nice. They retorqued the bolts yesterday, Hellfish. Entry, descent, and landing? Oh, I got the perfect thing for you. Atmospheric penetration. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Astro, click on this. This will teach you the basics about entry, descent, and landing. <laughs> reentry, it's cool. You know why reentry is cool? Because it's got a lot of fire! Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Fire! 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 Uh, <laughs> What's that, Phil? A thing coming from Jeff Faust. What's Jeff up to? Expecting... Discovery, go at throttle up. Expecting NASA Administrator Nelson to be on NASA TV shortly for comments about today's scrub. Blood fam, greetings from Italia. Whoa. The pudding man is coming on. Well, that's really good to hear. Are you sleep deprived? No. How many times did the shuttle have to go through this? STS-1 scrubbed, scrubbed, the uh, scrubbed, I think, twice? No, once. One, once, T-Man. Shuttle scrubs that. Shuttle scrubs are a thing all the time. It's very routine. Hydrogen, man. Pain in the butt. Fire. <laughs> Andy, I agree. Beavis and fire. Yes, Beavis. I am fire. I want you to clean up the alleyway. Ah, uh, fire? Why did, why did you have me do all that? 
Because I do not want the alleyways to be dirty. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> I guess that's cool. <laughs> yeah, Teddy. Yeah. Estimated time to launch. It's scrubbed, midget. Problems with the hydrogen line. The shuttle engines right now. Are you threatening me? Are you threatening me? <laughs> Sounds like you have seen Beavis and Butthead do the universe. Of course I did, Zyzep. It had a shuttle in it. Duh. Sweet, thanks. Trying to learn so I can... So that I can do an intelligent control simulation for the moon for my PhD topic. But I need to learn the fundamentals first. Wow. All right. Yeah, the atmospheric video, yeah, that's great. Dr. Peter Parameter. So stationeer's time. No, no. Uh, no. Do you know why they decided to go with hydrogen instead of a different, instead of a different propellant? Hydrogen's the most efficient, Gujar. That's why, that's why they use it. It's the most efficient. It is the most efficient propellant. That it, the most efficient chemical propellant, I should say. Um, you get the best miles per gallon with it. So the difficulties that you have with fueling it pay off with a rocket that's smaller that performs better. More efficient. I am TP. The principal, he will give me TP. God, I love that show. It's kind of messed up. Any reason why we don't use LH2 boosters? Not powerful enough. I mean, we, we could, but SRBs are the best bang for your buck and they have like two moving parts. Check the KSP Twitter account. SP2 gameplay. Lox is an oxidizer, not a fuel midget. Dat plume dough. You guys mind if I play that again? That's Kerbal Space Program too. Also, dual runways and a taxiway and landing pads, dudes. Landing pads. Sorry to side, Fox. Pretty good. That plume, though, dudes, that plume is mint. Could you do spin launching KSP? Sure. Hmm. Well, that doesn't suck. Yeah, right, Link Arc? It's pretty sweet, isn't it? From what I understand, Firework, it's still the, um... It's still the same planet, same size. Anyway. 
Guys, uh, I think I'm going to take a break. It, it, whenever that press conference comes around, I'll I'll tell you. I might be back a little bit later in the day, but my uh, yeah, we got to be very careful with the sleep schedule and stuff. So, um, yeah. I'll be yeah, you know what? I'll probably be back a little later in the day. I don't want to fall asleep too early cuz then I screw up my sleep schedule permanently <laughs> for a little while. So, yeah. I'm going to take a break for a little bit. Um, I'll give you updates as soon as I hear them. You know what I mean? We'll catch you later. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the coverage. It. Oh yeah, we also had another, another tip from Geese in here. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, as soon as I hear anything, I'll let you know. Uh, thank you for thank you for getting up with me. And thank you for uh, choosing this. Thank you for choosing Eric Johnson Airline. No, thank, th thanks for choosing. Thanks for thanks for coming with me. It's special, and I, I'm I'm happy that we could share it. I'm serious about that. This stuff is my that's my this is my life, man. You know. Um, so yeah, I'll give you guys an update as I'll give you guys an update uh, as soon as I get one, and I'll will leave you with a little tidbit little tidbit of information here. SLS did scrub today. It was a launch attempt. They'll try to launch another day. So technically, SLS is reusable. And on that bombshell, I'll see you a little bit later in the day. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching.